If we could get started, please. you want to start by using the handphone mic here? No, cool. Perhaps I'll just start with a few housekeeping points. First of all, can you hear me at the back? I don't have the strongest voice. Uh, but but please, please wave uh, if the sound for any of the speakers drops uh, and we'll bring you forward a microphone. Yeah. Uh, just on housekeeping, there's name tags at the back. So for speakers, folks, please feel free to uh, pick up your name tag. Uh, for emergency exits in this building, should we have to leave the building quickly? There's two exits on either side of the room leading out of the patio, as well as two uh, doors on this side that lead back through the hotel. And I think we're, we're ready to go. Also for the speakers, you'll probably find it easier to walk down this side of the aisle if you're speaking, that there's a lot of uh, cables and, and other uh, you know, hidden obstacles are on the other side. So welcome everyone. I'm Peter Goodwin. I have the honor of uh, serving as chair of this uh, National Academies Ad Hoc Committee that's looking at the long-term operations of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. I'm going to give a very brief introduction. I would also invite the National Academy senior staff that are with us today and on Zoom. If I miss anything, please feel free to jump in. We would like to start with a land acknowledgement for this area and we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, the land has been the home of the Patwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes, the Kakil Dihi tribe of Wintan Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, the Kletzel Dihi Wintan nation, and the Yoka Dihi Wintan nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries, it has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. So this committee has been asked to look at the old and middle river management, the Shasta Coldwater Pool, Summerfall Delta Smelt Habitat. And in the first session will be getting some elaboration and further discussion on the charge. And the second part of our charge is to provide recommendations on how modeling and monitoring strategies and decision-making can be changed, improved uh, for the future of CVP operations. Our goal in this meeting, for those of you who were able to participate in meeting one, we're still very much in the exploratory phase gaining background information, hearing from the various agencies and interested parties on how this committee can be most useful and effective to the entire science enterprise. We'll be hearing from the action agencies giving presentations, but we will welcome throughout the meeting comments from other participants that are with us today. And really our goal here is to try and elicit discussion on where this committee can provide the most value and guidance to enhance the long-term operations of water management here. And this meeting will also be used to inform the structure of our future committee meetings. So very briefly, uh, we're going to be starting with an elaboration of the statement of task, giving reclamation and the Department of Water Resources uh, the opportunity to expand on the written charge. This morning, we'll be looking at the long-term operations monitoring and modeling. And then following that with the summer fall habitat actions, monitoring and biological modeling. 
and there'll also be an opportunity this afternoon for interested party input. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the regulatory framework for the old and middle river management uh, flow management. And that will be followed by the management, what's actually being done, the monitoring and the modeling. And as with all of our meetings, we will conclude with an open mic session. So who we are, the committee members, uh, we don't have too much time. I just wanted to remind everyone, please go to the webpage to see who we are uh, and the breadth of expertise which we collectively cover. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Ellers and Dr. Karras from the National Academies that are working closely with Reclamation and other agencies to put the, this study together. And in this meeting, we're also joined by Susan Roberts, uh, who heads the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academy is one of the most um, uh, ma major programs within the entire Academy. So thank you, Susan, for being with us over the next few days. And on behalf of the committee, we welcome input during the breaks uh, and the sessions. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So it's daunting to try and pull together a recap uh, of meeting one. This was the topics which we covered in meeting one. I know many of you were here. I won't go through that, but we learned just how complex the Delta ecology is, the emerging role and important role of climate change, as well as an overview of background of both the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. And we also really appreciated the open mic session. And based on this meeting, you'll see there's a lot more time and opportunity for interaction questions from the committee. Uh, as well as opportunities to engage with the speakers and people that have taken the effort to participate in the meeting. So what did we learn? Uh, in that first meeting, it was the first of the three meetings which we're using to explore what we're going to undertake. We're very appreciative of the more than 20 presenters and panelists that uh, informed the committee's work last time and there were also 18 comments in the open mic session. We also received extensive post-meeting written comments to the National Academies, and we'd like to thank you for that. And we'd also like to thank everyone for following the rules which were outlined of how the National Academy has done this, putting it through the staff people with the information that ensures that your information goes into the record and will get full uh, consideration by the committee. We also learned just how dynamic and complex this system is. And this is truly a socio-environmental system from my uh, university. NSF ran a whole system on this, and this has to be the poster child. There's also a distributed science community working on the knowledge base, and there's pros and cons to that. The pros, of course, is it's very open for innovation compared with the other systems around the US. But the challenge is, is how do you coalesce that science into a common knowledge base upon which decisions can be made. We also learned that much is now understood by the system, but there's still some important gaps to inform the decision-making that occurs. We've also learned, and we appreciate the feedback that we've got, that there's considerable scientific research completed and many documents were added to our bibliography. But there's also some significant efforts uh, in progress and under review by various entities. And we also heard that traditional knowledge has much to offer in this state and that tribal input is just beginning to be integrated in decision making processes. So on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank everyone for their engagement and to emphasize that we welcome all input through our public meetings. Uh, if you wish to present to the committee in the open mic, if you could please sign up either through uh, contacting Maya or filling out the form at the back of the room, it would help us allocate time to the various speakers so everyone gets a chance to talk. So if we know by 10 o'clock, we can get back to the speakers to say what time window they'll have. Please remember, if you're here in person, please sign in as well as a second sign-in sheet at the back just so we can have a record of the various contributors. 
And so with that, I'll stop there. I don't know if Laura or Susan or Stacey has, did I miss anything? No, that was wonderful, Peter. So Susan, you're, you're okay? I'll just mention that there are copies of our statement of task on the table in the back, if you would like to refer to it as we go through the presentations today. There are no copies of the public agenda because it was just in a, so much flux. So if you need that, um, you can get it off of the committee's website. There is an updated version on, on the website. Right. And so we'll now go into the uh, first session and we appreciate both Dr. Mooney and Dr. Grimaldo coming to talk uh, and elaborating a little on the, the written charge. And so I'll introduce both speakers together. Uh, Dr. Mooney is really the architect of this whole uh, initiative, so we're very appreciative of that. He currently serves as the area manager of the Bay Delta office in the California Great Basin region of the reclamation. Prior to being appointed as the area manager, he served as the deputy area manager. He's also served as the chief of program management branch, the administrator of CVPIA that we heard so much about in meeting one. And uh, going back to our time, he also served as the lead engineer for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. He received his PhD from Colorado State University in engineering. Lenny Gramado serves as the State Water Project Environmental Director for the Department of Water Resources. Lenny oversees environmental planning, permitting, compliance activities associated with the long-term operations of the State Water Project. He currently leads DWR's Endangered Species Consultation on both the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project operations. Prior to his policy position, Lenny has spent more than 25 years as a researcher in the San Francisco estuary, where his research is highly regarded in food web dynamics, fish entrainment, ecology of listed species, with Reclamation, Department of Water Resources, and ICF. Then he received his PhD in ecology from UC Davis. So welcome and thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Watch your step as you guys come around. Because, um, well, I'm not sure this is your courts. <laughs> would you like to set the table? If you could sit at the table, that would be wonderful. And we're going to, if it's okay with you, um, we're going to have a um, table of all of the LTO core activities behind you. Okay. Sure. As a reference for people to kind of put the three things that are in the statement of task into the larger perspective. Thanks for reminding me that I was a researcher once. <laughs> I miss being on the boat. <laughs> I'll say a lot of my uh, doctorate program was uh, doing surveys of many streams in north central Mississippi. So I also share that it's nice to be out in the field every now and then and see real water. Would you like me to, to start? I don't know that we yes, need a particular that's table. Fine. Yeah, it's, uh, and our, our impetus here is to better understand uh, because this is planned to be a multi cycle activity. Uh, why these three particular actions rose to the surface and are the subject of cycle one. Excellent. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you all for agreeing to serve on this panel and to help us out uh, with the operation of the Central Valley Project and the, the State Water Project. Um, I'm also excited for the opportunity for my staff to get a chance to talk to you all, uh, both today and on the tours. I think I've had a, a handful of opportunities to just meet with experts from different areas in my career. Each one has been super valuable in sharing different perspectives and uh, helping me see and understand how different folks think about problems and problem solve. And um, each one has been just a wonderful experience. So I'm, I'm super grateful for your time and expertise and uh, interactions with my folks. So I think uh, when we started this panel, my overarching interest is to learn how we can use these panels to better our operation. So as Laura mentioned, we're planning on doing it at least two. So we have an opportunity for some feedback on what went well for us sharing information with you, what went well for you sharing information with us and where we can do better in the future uh, to get the most out of it. Uh, I think we've worked pretty closely with the Delta Science Program 
on how to structure reviews and they've been just super instrumental in helping us formulate our thoughts on how to proceed forward. So uh, maybe getting into the three topics, uh, we have our old and middle river reverse flow management, our summer and fall Delta smelt habitat action, and then our activities up in Shasta. Uh, we picked these three topics because we think uh, that there's so much going on, there's a need to make the scope manageable. Uh, but we also think that these topics are uh, ones that have high value, both for species and for water supply. And then each one of these is in a slightly different state of development in terms of the state of the science. And so we'll have the opportunity to look at uh, how we interact with uh, a different state of the research going forward. So it should be fun. So if we dive more into uh, Old and Middle River reverse flow management, uh, from my perspective, that's an area that just has a tremendous body of uh, literature, data sets, and models. There's just an awful lot of information out there. That's not true for the other topics. Uh, I think there are, are certain actions like first flush and some of the basic protections of no more negative than minus 5,000 CFS. Hopefully that number will uh, be very familiar to folks, if not today, then soon, uh, that I think have a whole lot of support and over time, shifting through the, the new biological opinions for us in 2008 and 2009, uh, my impression is it's been super effective uh, in limiting entrainment. So it's an action that we think worked. So now we're in a state of refinement. Uh, we're looking at how do we tweak those different numbers? Uh, where's the, the right level of actions? What information do we have? What tools do we have? And uh, from my perspective, we're perfecting it. You can all tell me I'm wrong and I'm on the wrong track and we go a different path and, and that would be helpful input. Uh, well, I'm just giving you my impression there. So I think uh, within OMR, uh, it's important for water supply. The water costs are substantial. So as we look at our models, we can take a conservative approach and be protective. That comes at a cost. And so it's reasonable to, for a water supply agency to try to refine that, uh, to fully understand that water cost. And then as I step back, um, I think we as agencies dedicate a whole lot of people to managing that in any given year. So from reclamation, there's like five to 10 staff people who spend about half a year uh, real-time managing old and middle river flow management. That's roughly mirrored within our federal fish agencies and the combined federal effort is probably um, about the same for the state. So I think of uh, 20 to 40 people for half a year working on uh, OMR flow management in real time. That seems like a, a ripe area to help us develop science and, and make that a, an easier action to take place. And if I start to get philosophical, uh, at a certain point, I think the operation of the projects will no longer be the driving force behind species and, and populations. Don't know that we're there yet, probably not. Um, but having the, a panel help us pull this information together, understand where have we done enough for the operation of the projects and where can we take our 20 to 40 people and focus their efforts elsewhere, I think would have very high value, um, but that's perhaps more of a decadal viewpoint. So then shifting over to the summer fall Delta smelt habitat, uh, from my perspective, and you'll hear from the scientists, that's on the other end of the spectrum. We don't have a, a huge body of literature that really ties to the mechanistic uh, behavior of Delta smelt and how we get them from one year to the next. Uh, we do know that we have a, the Delta smelt don't make it over the summer. We think we have a pretty extensive monitoring data set. We have some great statistical models that help us correlate with various environmental parameters. But I don't know that we have specific mechanisms and actions that we've dialed into a high degree of detail. And so I think the, having the panel help us think through that will, would be very helpful. And then I have the operation of Shasta as something that's kind of in the middle. We have some great tools for estimating the effects of temperature and doing some predictions there. I think we understand the uncertainty of those fairly well, uh, but at the same time, our, our knob that we turn in order to achieve those temperatures is to reduce flows. And in most watersheds, most systems, we know that flows are a big driver for fish populations. And I don't think we have uh, good tools for integrating that temperature management and the consequences of, of reducing flows. Um, I think we have some great literature that we're starting to work into the mix and how to make the how to guide our research, how to guide our integration and, and where to do our investments, I think could be very, very helpful. 
So kind of stepping back um, overall, I think uh, I see the, the CVP as unique and special in the sophistication of our, our water customers, our NGOs, our tribes. And so we're, I may not always feel like it's a great advantage, but I, I love the engagement uh, of folks and the expertise. And so when we have a panel, there's an opportunity for folks to share their interests and their experience so that helps uh, me out with just getting that type of engagement and support for the types of actions going forward. And so I, I think the, the this panel could play a critical role there. Uh, my other perspective is I think we have an incredible number of talented staff within the, within the agencies who've done great work uh, pulling together information. Um, they don't have infinite time, they don't have infinite budgets, they don't have a completely free hand, and they're really just navigating all of the constraints and challenges in just a phenomenal um, way, and they're coming up with great results. So my ask for the panel is I, I think as we look at that, uh, we look at the work that they're doing, there's a, a recognition of just the expertise in the room from the agencies, and I'd really like uh, your all viewpoint on how do I empower them and equip them and help us invest uh, to take it for the next level and really a, a forward-looking viewpoint to keep the science progressing. I think with that, turn it over to Lenny. Thanks, Dave. And I knew I couldn't beat prepared comments from Dave here. He's really good at those. But I just want to second thank you to the panel for diving into this very complex system. I know some of you have been working in this system for a long time. Um, and there's a lot being thrown at you. So hopefully we could provide some ideas on the scope that we want you to focus in on, and I'll cover a couple of those topics. Big picture for us at DWR, we're looking at climate change and where we're at with tools for both looking at weather, forecasting, species responses, not just management for today, but management over the next 20, 30, 40 years. So any insight, thoughts, comments that you could help provide to just not narrow in on those three topics, but expand out and think about how we could use different tools, different approaches for dealing with climate change will be very important. And that's a driving force for what the Department of Water Resources is focused in on now. We have something called weather whip whiplash. We have these dry years, you know, four years of drought, followed by wet years. We just don't it's, it's, we just, we're in climate change. And right now we're responding to what we're seeing and we need to not, we need to stop responding. We need a better way of approaching climate change and our management actions. Um, this year's a great example where out of the blue, we're seeing steelhead <laughs> um, coming down in big numbers. We've never had a steelhead action. This year we exceeded our 100% threshold on steelhead. And folks are, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, honestly, we, we have no idea. But I think these are the things where we need to think about how weather and hydrology and how the claim, a changing climate may be affecting some of the patterns that we're already seeing different over the last few years. So I, hopefully you all could provide some, some comments on the climate change aspect. For Olden River, Old and Middle River Management. I think last time I pleaded to this group, please take a look at the last report that the, the, the NAS panel did. A lot of work has been done over the last 15 years. And I know I have an assignment, Laura, to <laughs> provide some additional information there. I think what we, what we wanna do is sort of tailor that into a narrative that helps you all focus on, this is what we did, this is the scope, but now we need some additional items um, looked at. So one good example, and I'm hoping that the panel picks up on this, is we need a better understanding of the population impacts that we have through our Old and Middle River management and not be as focused on salvage, um, just the numbers of salvage. We want to be able to put that in context as what does this mean for cohort replacement? What does this mean for impacting population growth rates? I'm not saying that we haven't done that. We've actually done quite a bit of work there, um, including for Delta Smelt, and we can send you some of those references. Um, but I don't know if we have a complete package for all the species there. So if you all could focus in on providing some feedback there, I think that would be extremely helpful. Um, and I think Dave sort of touched on this. So 
thinking about the salmon life cycle, their exposure to the projects is pretty small in terms of direct entrainment. I'm not talking about, you know, there's other exposures from the dams all the way, but in terms of how we operate for OMR management, that's a limited window for their lifespan, right? So then they got to go to the bay. How are they using restoration? Then, you know, they got to go to the ocean. How are they surviving in the ocean? Then they need to come back. How are they de dealing with thiamine deficiencies? There's a whole life cycle here. So under trying to understand the importance of that life stage and that loss of that life stage, the full life cycle is really important. And that's not to say that we don't need to provide those protections right through a regulatory framework because the fish agencies as our partners, you know, they're on the hook for the protection of these species. And in some cases, the recovery outside the permits. Um, I think that's all we're, we're all striving for recovery of these populations. So putting your thoughts on paper about how we could do that better would be extremely helpful including looking at it, the existing life cycle models and maybe maybe there's something in there that we missed or you know maybe we need some additional modeling there so i would appreciate some some feedback into the the salmon component of this um long fin smelts new to the federal government their petition for listing um that listings on the horizon the decision um the state we've been dealing with long fin for since 2009 um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I think we're a little bit behind on the long fin smelt side of things compared to Delta smelt, as you know, from the 2009, or maybe you don't know, I should say, going back to the 2009, 2008 opinions that were highly controversial, controversial played out in federal court that really drove a lot of the science for Delta smelt. So for long fin smelt, I think we're a little bit behind there. And I think there's new 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 tools that we're developing. We're developing a life cycle model with the help of the Fish and Wildlife Service. But I think any insights that you can provide on long fin smelt, while, while we still have good numbers, could be helpful there. Because we definitely see them um, at our project facilities, probably in higher abundance than any other fish that we salvage of the listed species at the moment. Um, now, there has been new science that that talks about the population effects of those early life histories, but I think we just need some additional work there to, um, to close the loop on what we need to be doing next. Um, finally, I don't want us to be so focused on the OMR management that we're just looking at the losses at the facilities. I think Louise Conrad touched on this last time. There's a lot, and Matt and Steve Lindley, there are a lot of other actions that we're doing that help bolster abundance of the fish in the estuary. And I think we have to think about that in context of our OMR management. If we're doing restoration and that's improving fish numbers, that's great. So now how do we respond and how, how we dial in the exports in response to those increasing numbers? Um, things like that could be helpful or where we restore habitat or how we restore habitat. It's not entirely out of scope to think about how these pieces all may be connected. So. I encourage some investigation into these other activities that we're doing, including, including things like our non-physical barrier um, that prevent salmon from, or we hope prevent salmon from entering the interior delta. And then lastly, for the summer fall habitat action, I think Dave covered a lot of that. That's gonna be talked about a lot today. So I think I'll defer a lot of that to the, the great technical folks that have been working on this a long time. Um, for me, the, the main uncertainty there is that action was developed for wild delta smelt, and now we're moving to a phase where it looks like we're relying on supplemental cultured releases of delta smelt. And I, I think for me, I want to understand, you know, what sort of tools, what sort of information should we be, should we be looking at to help inform whether those cultured delta smelt respond the same way as wild delta smelt for this action in the summer and fall. So I'll leave it at that for the summer fall habitat action. And I won't comment on Shasta because DWR, <laughs> it's not our project. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, well, thank you very much. Thank well, thanks for those clarifying remarks. And I'll just open it to the committee as uh, any follow-up from what you've heard. And I think, well, it's worth 
spending an extra five minutes or so while we have both Dave and Lenny here. Yeah, Pat. Hang on one second. We're going to get the mic to you. We're going to be walking around with the mic. I think it's going to turn it off right now. This whole point is going to be turned off. Also, um, during Q&As, please turn your cameras on on Zoom for the committee. Thank you. Because the host has stopped it. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, my question is, um, um, I've been thinking about the modeling elements, and we hear a lot about the life cycle model, for example. So I'm curious how the models are being used, in particular, how the life cycle model is being used. Which species? Any species. Um, well, I think we could start with delta smell. So for delta smell, and Matt Nobriga, who's here, could speak to this, and I'll put him on the, on the hook for that. Um, but we use it, I think, in two different ways. One, for planning, thinking about how when we're, for example, going through the consultation, these different effects that these physical and biological conditions may have on Delta smell. And then thinking about how our project may affect those different physical and biological factors. I think that's a very important aspect of the life cycle model. Um, but two, I think for me, what the life cycle model did was contextualize the importance of different factors that we argued about for years, including OMR management and maybe FOLIX2 management. Maybe there's something new. I think Matt said last time, summer, summer management may be important. So I think it's providing a good framework for how we should be thinking about things in the future, especially under climate change. And I think that's where, because we get so focused on the consultation and what we're doing now, we don't think about that big picture um, piece as well. And I'm guilty of that, right? Cause I'm, we gotta manage what's in front of us now. Um, but I think about that quite a bit. For, for long fin smelt, there's been a couple life cycle models that have been developed. We're working on another one. I think ultimately we want to use that life cycle model to better understand the, the direct project effects on long fin, but we also want to use that maybe for habitat planning. I think there might be some useful, useful information that come out of that model that informs habitat, which I don't think the previous two life cycle models did. A, um, a really good job at no indictment on those papers that just I don't think we thought about it in the same way because at the time that those life cycles were developed we didn't know that long fin smelt were using all these restored habitats and where they were using them so now we have new papers that show that long fin are spawning in areas outside the the upper estuary they're in south bay they're in napa river petaluma river um they can occupy salinities much higher than we thought so there's a lot of new information and they occupy actual marshes like Tule Red, I don't know if that's still on the field trip. Within three months of that area being breached, it was full of longfin. And I was out there, you know, we were collecting them. It was amazing. We, you know, we had one of those woohoo moments. We're seeing longfin within three months of that being breached. So I think as that science is coming along and, and we can build that into the life cycle model, I think that could be quite helpful for some of our restoration planning as well. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think uh, everything Lenny said, and then we also have some very specific tools for very specific mechanisms, very specific stressors. And so having our life cycle models help us stitch that all together into a bigger picture is, is one of the, the big uses that we have for reclamation. I think we'll go to Steve and uh, then we'll probably have to cut this discussion off. I'll give it to me that time to the weeds a little bit, but. When you talk about the life cycle models, um, what are the performance measures you're looking at to success for these critters? And I presume the life cycle model comes into that. Is it uh, abundance level, density, growth, reproductive success? And I know it's going to be all of those about, but I mean, um, clearly you're trying to find out what is really happening. Which ones, what part of the life cycle model do you use to test it? So I'm going to do the easy thing and punt that to the technical folks. They're going to come 
since we only have a couple minutes, but they could probably spend a lot more time answering that question. And now that it's been teed up for them, they should have a really good response. <laughs> I like Lenny's answer. But, uh, maybe the, the the part I'd add to it is, is we have um, multiple hats that we wear within reclamation. So one of it is consultation on the operation of the projects. Then we have this whole suite of other authorities and directives to, to do good things for fish. And so I think it depends on, on how it's being applied. So for operations, we're looking at what is the effect of the project on these species and can we parse that out? And then from the broader goal, it's what's the best investment of resources to, to help protect and support the environment and our listed species. Yeah, and I, I understand that you're trying to protect the species or, or perhaps aid us recovery, but um, is that popular, you know, delta-wide population number? Is that your T factor? Or is it, uh, is it how many are training a particular operation a day? That's a converse that. I think the summer fall habitat, when you hear those talks, yeah. that provides a really good example where there's certain metrics from that life cycle model that they're measuring and it ties into the monitoring. You're gonna hear about that in just a bit, but it, I think there's big picture and narrow scope. And today you're gonna to hear a little bit about the narrow scope pieces related to OMR management and the summer fall habitat action for sure. Okay, well, thank you. And I was like to just remind the committee members, I should have done this earlier. If you do have a question, if you can just turn your name card on an angle and it helps us manage the time just a little bit better. So with that, seeing no more immediate questions, uh, just one thing I might add, uh, both Dave and Nanny, thanks for being here. And both of you just touched on the emerging technologies and ideas. And I know you've got a whole group of PhDs in your shops that are probably tracking these, but is there particular things that you're looking at um, you, you, uh, you, please, please let us know because we, we've got ideas, but I know a lot of things have been tried already and we don't want to, to uh, re reinvent the wheel or make recommendations that you simply have not worked in the system. So with that, perhaps we'll give a quick round of applause to both Lenny and Sarah. And that elucidation was, was very helpful. Please be careful. Yeah. You got a prize for managing the obstacle course. So our first technical session this morning is an introduction or a preamble to the monitoring of the long-term uh, operations and the actions. And we have two speakers, I'll introduce them both. Uh, welcome back to Dr. Josh Israel from Reclamation. Uh, Josh serves as the Science Division Manager in Reclamation's Bay Delta office. Prior to this position, Josh worked as a fish biologist for 10 years studying salmon survival in the San Joaquin and Delta. Uh, he's also worked on drought impacts of winter run Chinook salmon, the yellow bypass fish habitat and fish passage modeling. More recently, Josh has focused on leading staff to incorporate decision analysis tools into Central Valley project real time and long-term planning exercises, designing a comprehensive acoustic telemetry program in the Central Valley and Bay Delta and establishing biological objectives to inform the effectiveness of monitoring. Uh, Josh, for those of you who don't know him, received his PhD in ecology from UC Davis. Uh, also, we have Dr. Louise Conrad from the Department of Water Resources. Uh, she serves as the California Department of Water Resources lead scientist. Louise works within the DWR executive team to guide the advancement of applied scientists to inform water resources management and facilities. The application of best practices for conducting and communicating sciences at DWR. And again, I think it just is indicative of this system that directors have the scientists in, deeply embedded with their leadership teams. Prior to taking on the lead scientist roles, Louise served as the Deputy Executive Officer for Science at the Delta Stewardship Council, where she guided science funding processes, public workshops, and served on the editorial board for the 2022 issue of the State of Bay Delta Science. She also received her PhD from UC Davis in Animal Behavior. So welcome, Josh, and welcome, Louise. I don't know who's going to go first. I'm going to go first. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.
Two. I can do that. Maybe for Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, just sit there and finish for me. All right. Good morning. Um, good to see you all again. Thank you for your service on this panel. Um, I am going to cover a few slides by way of introduction and then hand it over to Josh. So we're going to be tag teaming um, a little bit here. So um, this, again, is intended to be an overview of our monitoring enterprise in the Delta or, or for the projects generally. Um, good context, I think, for some of the uh, questions you're already asking about how we use the, the data and our models for, um, for informing decisions. And I think the next item on the agenda is about the models specifically. So this is really the data collection aspect. Okay. Trying to, there we go. Okay. So first, before diving into any of the more, more of the specifics, we wanted to cover what the what we see the general purposes of our monitoring to be. And so this is breaks those purposes down into three general categories. The first being real-time operations. And for reclamation and DWR, we need information to inform our day-to-day -day operations um, decisions that um, are, are required. Uh, for example, for the State Water Board's decision 1641, um, our biological opinions and the incidental take permits require that we meet certain conditions. And um, OMR is an example of that. We need real-time information in order to determine whether we're meeting um, uh, specific conditions or um, encountering a number of fish that meets uh, it at the salvage facilities, which you got to see firsthand at your last month's field trip. Um, see if we're getting to a level at which our permits indicate we need to change our operations. Um, the next category here is the status and trends. So these are surveys and they cover uh, everything from primary production to abundance indices for, for fishes. And in the case of Delta smelt, there's a um, survey, Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Survey that provides population estimates. These are uh, really important for just understanding. I'm going to show you a slide in a second on um, the longevity of some of these surveys. But they are important for us to be able to just have baseline knowledge of the system and then use that in many different ways. Those data can be purposed for many different types of applications and analyses to understand generally how actions we're taking may or may not have any impact on uh, the, the long-term metrics that we have, which again may not be population estimates in all cases, but uh, abundance est estimates and species assemblages, um, the, the composition of our communities and um, in general abundances. And then we're putting uh, as a third category here, special studies. This isn't the same thing as status and trend monitoring this is more of a targeted study to address a very specific hypothesis-based question, um, often based on conceptual models and might be targeted around the efficacy of certain management actions. So you're gonna hear more uh, this afternoon about the summer fall habitat action. Um, some of our staff are gonna speak to that and learn more about some of the special studies that may, um, that, that inform these specific actions. So um, I am gonna move on here, I'm gonna skip this next slide, sorry. I wanted to go to this one first, just to give you an idea of how long-term these some of these monitoring programs are. So this is a slide from a presentation that Dr. Rosemary Hartman and I gave at an annual workshop in 2020. And um, this was a fun sort of voluntary exercise that we did just out of curiosity, which was to look at the San Francisco estuary, our, our system, alongside the monitoring enterprises of different other systems within the 
within the US. So we looked at Chesapeake Bay, Massachusetts Bay, Galveston Bay, and Puget Sound. And again, this was just um, out of curiosity, and we were really interested in the longevity of our, our monitoring enterprise compared to some others. And so we looked at all these different parameters that are, we collect in our system, zooplankton, water quality fish, contaminants, phytoplankton, and benthics, um, and then looked at those same categories across other systems. And so you have here on the x-axis the decades, and you can see those very thin lines. Those are really just zeros um, for no sampling. But uh, Chesapeake is standing out here as the longest running programs going back to the 50s. And the estuary, our estuary is not far behind, starting up mostly in the 60s. And the thickness of the line indicates the intensity of sampling. So um, this was just a fun thing that we wanted to, to show you, um, that many of these are very longstanding and, and, and comparable to some of the longer standing ecological monitoring programs in the country. Um, so going back to this slide, uh, I also wanted to note before handing it over to Josh that you're probably not going to be surprised to hear that there's been a lot of attention on the monitoring enterprise and reviews of it. And one of the ones that I want to point out is a pretty recent one from the Delta Independent Science Board, and two of the panel members here are authors of this report. Um, where this was a really ambitious um, monitoring review that um, that that took on a huge task of inventorying and examining the full monitoring enterprise. This is not a technical review, um, but recommended, among other things, the need for more routine monitoring program evaluations to identify gaps, redundancies, and ensure relevance. And I think I, the other examples here are other ones that are either ongoing or, or past monitoring review exercises. This middle one um, is science advancements for increasing management value of life stage monitoring networks for winter run that is um, really examined the full network of monitoring for, for winter run and made several recommendations, many of which have been implemented. And over the years, there's, there's just been a number of of reviews, including one of the Delta Juvenile Fish Monitoring Program, the Environmental Monitoring Program, um, among other efforts, including one current one that is looking at the five uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife monitoring surveys um, that are that are listed here. I won't, just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into detail, but are really looking at the spatial balance of the this these five surveys and, and how they, can be better balanced and, um, and and really represent the system for the species they're intended to monitor. Um, so I wanted to mention, and re with respect to the this independent science board review, that we are still in the process of standing up a real specific program um, for regular review, which was one of the recommendations of the ISB report. Um, and I think that is is in the works, it's happening. And I think that it's gonna be really helpful from this panel to hear how the monitoring efforts that really specifically support the actions that are in your charge, how those might be helpful to enhance in order to serve the objectives of those, those actions, those management actions that we have. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh to finish the presentation and then maybe there's time for questions after. So I think that's your first slide, Josh. Okay, thanks, Louise. Thanks to the committee for joining us for another few days. So I'm going to quickly walk through uh, sort of the different types of monitoring that are happening in the system related to um, sort of long-term operations. Uh, we could spend a couple of weeks talking about this, so please let Laura know if any of these things um, pique your interest. We can get you study plans, annual reports, links to websites, and of course, I'm sure people would love to come in and talk with you about specifics. So, you know, to sort of start with the environmental drivers, thinking about flow and water quality, uh, you know, there is a lot of gauges and water quality songs around the Bay Delta, uh, continuously monitoring uh, flow and water quality um, constituents. Uh, a lot of this goes on to our CDEC and USGS's NWIS pages. 
There also is discrete sampling that happens on a monthly basis uh, by the Environmental Monitoring Program, which is a compliance program for D1641. And then many of the fish surveys also collect uh, flow and water quality data associated with their discrete samples. So uh, primary productivity is sort of the next level, right? Trying to understand the al algal, algal communities, you know, and trying to characterize uh, what's going on with desirable, uh, less desirable, or even harmful algal blooms. You know, our interest here really and what we aspire to have is a monitoring program that will help us measure the biomass and composition across uh, what we say re regions and seasons. Um, so uh, we have quite a bit of this data collected again um, through continuous programs uh, as well as uh, discrete programs, grab samples. And then um, what's not on this slide is a, a USGS a project, which I think was included in your handouts in the first meeting where uh, they're also looking at primary productivity in different regions of the Delta. So then we're interested in the bugs, right? What, what eats the algae? So the secondary productivity and the environmental monitoring programs uh, goes out on a monthly basis and samples uh, various regions of the Delta. Uh, and also many of the fish surveys uh, in uh, the mid 2000s uh, started to collect data and what the diet was and, and basically collecting zooplankton information to try to look at the diet of fish. And you can see we have a pretty broad array of sites that get sampled. Um, all the different colored dots that you see are sort of different monitoring programs that happen uh, in sort of different months, depending on seasonality, obviously happen in different regions. So then the fish monitoring, we've got a lot of fish monitoring that happens. Uh, I believe the red dots here are what's called the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program, which is a, a randomized sampling. So they're not doing all those sites every week. Uh, but you can also see that there are some um, studies that go all the way down into the South Bay uh, and go as well. There's beach sanding that goes up into the lower Sacramento there and into the lower San Joaquin River. And then the salvage sites of course would be on the very um, end of the Delta uh, uh, as well. So quite a lot of fish monitoring that's occurred. And then finally, uh, we can talk more about tributary monitoring when we go up to Redding. Uh, this just wanted to give you an idea for sort of the status and trend monitoring that occurs across the tributaries. So we do a lot of, when I say we, I mean the science enterprise, a lot of it's Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Pacific States Marine uh, Fisheries um, count, um, Committee or Council folks. Um, so we do a lot of red surveys. There's also weirs and fishways that are using uh, passive uh, sonar and video cameras uh, to collect adult escapement data on these tributaries. There are also a lot of rotary screw traps along the main stem, the main site being downstream of the, you can't see my cursor, the, uh, sort of at the top of the Sacramento River Red Bluff Diversion Dam. We may go visit there. And then as you move downstream, uh, we have a Delta entry rotary screw trap site, and then a number of trawl sites uh, that help us with operating the Delta cross channel gates and also helping us try to estimate uh, production entering and exiting the Delta. There's a lot of new monitoring going on as well, special studies associated with trying to estimate juvenile production of steelhead and spring on Chinook salmon that isn't on this map. And then you can see like, uh, in that uh, science advancements for salmon. We actually have a couple acoustic telemetry sites that we now are using regularly. We have about 10 years worth of pretty regular acoustic telemetry survival uh, information now on the Sacramento River and, and for three Delta survival. So, you know, monitoring is really happening very broadly across many regions in the Bay Delta and the tributaries being supported by many different agencies. It happens really at different scales, depending on the objective, whether it's real time um, monitoring or a status and trend monitoring. Uh, it can focus on many different performance measures. Uh, and I think Stephen asked a really good question about, you know, are we, uh, for instance, using life cycle models to measure specific things, which maybe then are predictions to compare to some of our observations. And it's a great question. I think we'll get into that over the next two days, hopefully. Uh, we're working to really document when we take actions in our seasonal and annual reports and our knowledge base papers. So we have a series of seasonal and annual reports 
uh, focus topically on things like old and middle river management or cold water pool management, summer fall habitat action. And then, like I said, we're really aiming to try to um, focus our monitoring to be able to test model predictions and uh, support uh, doing decision analysis on our activities. So um, I think that that is it. And I just really appreciate all of the folks who are constantly in the field uh, collecting data for us. Uh, you can see it's a really large network. Uh, I love the word distributed I heard earlier. Uh, group of folks. So really appreciative of the effort of hundreds of folks out there. Well, thank you, Josh. And uh, it's the front and we'll go around with the questions. Uh, perhaps show, we'll start with you. I'm in the middle of the cell, so. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, sorry, Denise. I... It's okay. Go, go, go ahead. Can wait for the microphone? Yes, please do. So I had a, a couple of questions. Um, um, kind of reflecting on what I heard, might not have been exactly what you said. Any you talk about earlier was was to to try to think about um, OMR, for instance, in the context of all the other things that are happening to, to the fish, right? That this lot, the potential loss, needs to be in the context of the overall population. Um, you said, and so one way of thinking about that is to think about that stressor in the context of other stressors. And um, uh, for years, we've been talking about um, contaminants and pathogens and, and toxics and things like that. And your presentations were silent on that today, um, even though that might not be something which you pay for. It may be information that you use, and so or should be using, or could be supplementing, or whatever. So I would like to hear something about that. The other thing is that a lot of the um, a lot of things that you talked about were um, kind of uh, grab sampling, or, or sometimes time series of, of what was going on at a point in terms of uh, like tracking a water quality parameter. We might be going out and catching fish, or or taking a zooplankton sample, but do we actually understand what's going on? Are we measuring any process, biological processes, as opposed to just what is, you know, the, I'm not a biologist, as you know, standing stock of product, right? Or how many fish there are. Do we know how much are they, are they growing in this environment versus mm -hmm. the environment? Mm -hmm. You know, do we know something about productivity as opposed to just biomass? Those kinds of things. So could you talk about one or both of those questions, Beth? Yeah, you're talking a lot about vital rates. So yeah, do yeah, we that's the word. That's yeah. the word. And I, I think that falls in the category of those special studies that we talked about. So no, I didn't I yeah, that's a, I could add that to my um talking points for that slide that the special studies would be the ones that would take on those vital rates because that's not captured in our monitoring programs per se. Not should in it be? should it be, could it be? So, uh, I, can I jump in, or you want to uh, Yeah, well, just I think I think getting to say reproduction rates of zooplankton might be hard in a long, in a monitoring program that goes yeah, out definitely. every month or so. And so that's where in terms of and and there are examples with the fish once you catch it, what you could tell about yeah. where it had recently been or whatever. So yeah, we have we can send you studies that have been funded by DWR, Reclamation, others that um, We're that about do monitoring here, Louise. We're not talking about special studies. I do understand the difference in that categorization. Okay. I'm saying, should you be advancing your routine monitoring hmm. to be capturing some vital rate measurements on a routine basis, as opposed to we'll do a study here, then and then we'll do a study there. I think that whether it's part of monitoring or special studies, we have to be clear about what question we're, what are we, what are we trying to evaluate? Well, what question are you trying to evaluate with the, with the, with the data that you showed us? It, it wasn't exactly clear what questions we were answering with those data. You were collecting a lot of information. I'm, sorry, I'm not so, trying to be argumentative, but I mean, I, I think that if you, if you're saying you need to have a question to measure a vital rate in the field, then 
you need to have questions. I mean, you did say the EMP was compliance monitoring for 1641, right? The get compliance monitoring. If any of that other monitoring that you showed us is not required compliance monitoring, then what is the question that you're trying to answer with it? So I, I think, you know, your, uh, your point is a good one. And I think it is uh, potentially important for us to be measuring vital rates. However, I don't think we've necessarily developed the models to say that vital rates are still important. And so I think these things go hand in hand is as we're moving more towards using this idea of having models that make predictions which where there's an equation that has a vital rate in it that's somehow linked to hydrodynamics or temperatures or, you know, uh, environmental drivers around biogeochemical constituents. And then we start to say, well, how do those look in nature and how are those impacted by our actions? Then it becomes more important to monitor it. And so I think it's, a, for me, it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg. Do we do the model first or do we do the monitoring first? And I think places like measuring vital rates, a good place to start is in the laboratory. And I think there have been studies over the last few years, I, looking over your shoulder at Brian Bergamoski, who's going to join the summer fall habitat mm -hmm. action monitoring and modeling discussion. And I know USGS and DWR and Reclamation have worked on some of these questions, but we have not incorporated them into our models for things like habitat actions surrounding how to create a better food web to grow fish better. And I think that's something that, um, that perhaps would then require some modification or redesign to a monitoring program to see what's going on with those things in nature. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll the mic to somebody. Yeah, so perhaps we'll go to Joe. We, I don't think we're going to get to all of the questions in here, but we'll get to as many as we can before the break. And yes, Joe. So I'll have to be very quick. Thanks for the, for the nice summary. So the real time monitoring. Oh, Joe, can you, can you hit the switch on the other side? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the real time monitoring quite quite useful for your decision making and all these things. But the second and third items you had, it was status monitoring as well as the, the trends monitoring, special trends monitoring. That's kind of tied into this adaptive management mm -hmm. issue. Uh, and, and that's a really a recipe for, for adaptive management because you do some hypothesis. How much adaptive management you bring in in this part of monitoring enterprise? Adaptive management of the monitoring enterprise? And yes. So that's what that's what I was getting at with the review slide that that there's there there have been a number of reviews that are on that slide and even other ones that and and like the winter run science advancements paper and that made a couple of recommendations those have been largely implemented I would say that's adaptive management of a monitoring enterprise the larger Delta Independent Science Board review has a whole recommendation for how you can approach this in adaptive management, as you know. Um, and that's where I think we still have some work to do to um, advance that, um, getting that into a more routinized look at our monitoring programs, evaluating whether they're achieving what is needed for their, their purpose, the metrics that they're trying to assess, and, and, and then change them as, as would be appropriate for management relevance. Um, and I think the the monitoring review also points to there's sometimes a, a gap between what the monitoring program has been doing that has been set up and in place for many decades and what the current questions are. There, you know, the Sassoon Marsh Salinity Control Gate action didn't exist until 2018. So, you know, we, and I think that's an example where we plugged in a lot of existing monitoring and put it to good use so that, and Rosie will talk about this. Sorry, Rosemary Hartman, you don't all know her. Um, but but she'll talk about that and how then we plugged in a, additional monitoring, additional work to specifically look at that action. So I would say that's an example of real-time adaptive management of monitoring programs where you can use what's there, um, but enhance if needed. So I, to curious. address specific hypotheses, which is a hypothesis-based monitoring program, but in terms of status and trends, how we are evaluating our monitoring programs, that is what needs some work. And that report from the Independent Science Board, I would say already 
does a good job of making that recommendation. And I think what's helpful for this panel is more specific looks at the, the programs that are gonna be informing those, those management actions that are in your charge. And, and what, are, what are tweaks that, that's a high level review. What are, what are technical advancements we, that might be achievable? For, we, we for those to specific to actions. And always it has to be considered yeah. uh, part of the death Okay, right, thanks. Well, thanks, Chairman. Can I add one thing, please? Well, so please do. So, uh, I, thank you. So just um, on this issue of sort of adaptive management suggests that like you're measuring performance of something. And I think a lot of times that's changed through time. And I think, you know, our aspiration to be able to look across regions and seasons and use status and trend monitoring to measure the biomass and the composition of these different trophic levels is not fully implemented at this point. And I don't know if those that vision of trying to measure across regions and seasons, the biomass and composition of phytoplankton up to the fish community are the right performance measures. And I think by identifying performance measures for status and trend monitoring, I think it can lead to important uh, redesigns and modifications because what's important to status and trends are what you're measuring, not the methods that you're using. And too often we get caught in methods uh, being what we're trying to maintain. And that can be a problem when you're trying to use the most science-based approach because innovation in technology is always advancing counting methods and classification methods and enumeration methods that are important for getting to vital rates or fit better fish production estimates or better estimates of biomass. So. Hang on. So, is there a quick question? I think so. Okay. And then Steve, if you don't mind, we'll uh, you know, take the break and you could follow up in the... Just answered my question. Oh, he did. Pat. Good anticipation, Josh. So Pat. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for all the work your your team, you and your teams do. Um, so we're all sort of dancing around the same uh, idea. I think Joe was asking about adaptive relative to the monitoring program. I'm thinking about using the monitoring program to adapt to other things. And so uh, it would help me if you could give a couple of concrete examples as to how the monitoring might have affected an action. So I think obviously how we uh, estimate salvage has been historically important for understanding losses at the facilities. But one of the examples I would look to is, you know, as less and less wild smelt were available, we moved to thinking about using turbidity as an environmental surrogate. And we've continually refined sort of our environmental monitoring around turbidity in the South Central in North Delta to better understand what's going on with the turbidity fields. And now we continue to refine our operations for old and middle river management around the stations that we use for measuring turbidity. The, you know, we haven't really played much with like the value of that turbidity being high or moderate or the magnitude of turbidity, but where that turbidity is matters to fish migration and delta smelt migration. And that's been an advancement that sort of happened since 2009 because of a lot of efforts of the folks in the back of the room. It's more like context as opposed to trigger or something. Well, it's used it's as a trigger. So if yeah. we see turbidity uh, outside of the South Delta, like further north and then at the salvage facilities starting to be high, uh, okay. we actually will take Preempt, well, the preemptive actions to try to reduce entrainment risk uh, for that season. And we'll go to, instead of having reversing flows of minus 5,000, or if it happens early in the season, you may actually have reversing flows that are even greater than minus 5,000. We'll step down to have reversing flows of minus 3,500 or minus 2,000, depending on the duration and the specific timing and life stages that we're trying to avoid entrainment risk of. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That helps a lot. Luis, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think those are all great examples. The other point, I'd just at a broad scale, some of the, the floodplain monitoring work that has started up in the 2000s really led to floodplain actions um, and the requirement for floodplain restoration. So that, that's just zoomed out okay. another so example of that. Yep. Great, thank you. Great. Well, perhaps if we could thank Dr. Conrad and Dr. Israel. Thank you.
And we will uh, come back at 10.35. So we'll take a 15 minute break.
up again. If I can get through this. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this session, we are going to uh, go through a preamble on the modeling for the LTO operations and actions. And we have two speakers, uh, Dr. Israel is going to come back, and also D Daria Summer. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, she's the modeling division manager for US Bureau of Reclamation. She oversees the water resources modeling program and her responsibilities include, and this is quite a list, uh, the development and application of system operations, hydrologic models, climate change models, groundwater, surface water interactions, temperature, and water generation, many of the things we're looking at. Prior to becoming the division manager, she was the branch chief for water supply and operations, and also headed the operations analysis at Reclamation. She received her PhD and master's from the University of Arizona. So Dr. Summer, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's, it's way better than the one that the AI wrote for me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for having me today. I believe I'm the only presenter on this one, Josh, if you weren't. Okay, cool. Um, so I am told, and I have 15 minutes to talk about Oops, okay. anything and everything about modeling on that team. <laughs> and so this is going to be um, a really high level overview of what do we do, how do we do things, really trying to um, trigger questions from you all. So if you're having questions, please ask away. Uh, this is by no means, is, is not even going to scratch the surface of what kind of modeling we do. But I'll try to give give you kind of the overview, the processes and everything. Hopefully, um, hopefully we can have a discussion, further discussion in other presentations. Um, so model, model everywhere. What do we do? <laughs> Models are imperfect uh, reflections of real life. And depending on what purpose you're using the model for, you pick different models. Even if you run the same model, you interpret it differently. It's, it gets quite complex quite, quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of talk through these common purposes, at least my. It's a general list. It's, it also applies to LTO. Um, so the first box is the, the most fun part of it. Like This is the high point of my career, I'd love to be in that box because that's where you <laughs> explore what ifs. Um, so, you know, like, where you can get creative. Um, we, we look at new or modified facilities. If we're doing a project, let's say a storage program or a, or a conveyance program, you change things around and see how you operate them. Or you could be looking at operational strategies or re regulations, which is the case in LTO. We're looking at, you know, how should we be operating this whole system? Um, incorporate climate change and sea level rise. How do you do that? Um, everything that happens in this box depends on you know what the question is. You know, it's, if it's a question coming from from my higher up management, it may be confidential. But for LTO, this is the part that we did a lot of outreach for all the interested parties. Um, we had monthly meetings. Um, where we were developing actions. And just to give a couple of examples, um, Shasta action, for example. Okay, how should the Shasta action be is a totally different, there's a different suite of modeling that went on. We did what we call a position analysis, what you would know is more, more like a Monte Carlo type analysis under various conditions. If I operate it this way, you'll get this result of temperature and you know the biological effects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we kind of kept everybody up in the same loop and tried to form an action that was acceptable for all the participating agencies. That's one. Um, on the OMR, we used that, you know, data hydrodynamics model, DSM2. 
article tracking models about effects of different levels of OMAR and how they, you know, they may relate, right? So that is a playing box. Once we went through those individual actions, then we came up with initial alternatives. Then you start putting pieces together, okay? For any IS, any pre-analysis, you have to have a wide range of those actions, alternatives. Um, again, we continue to work with all the interested parties. We work with NGOs, we work with the water users, with the you know, agencies, and we develop these alternatives based on the data, model data that we generated, come up with those alternatives that we're gonna analyze. Okay, now we have a number of alternatives. We kind of step outside of our um, toolbox and toy box, and now we're running alternatives and looking at effects, looking at impacts on all of the resource areas, which means operated. Now I'm looking at what are the effects, you know, of operating in that scenario on species, groundwater, economics, whatever else you may be analyzing. That is a totally different suite of models. Then this process, when it ends, let's say we have the biological assessment, then we get the biological opinion, we put our NEPA out, we get record of decision, we have a decision on how we're gonna move forward operating the system. And everybody goes home except for modelers <laughs> and the scientists, <laughs> because now we're gonna start implementing those actions, right? Now we're talking about data collection, monitoring, and real-time operations and modeling related to that. Now we're looking at specific things, salinity, entrainment, red dewatering. You may be using the same model that you used in the planning phase, but in a different way. I'm, it, I know this may get confusing, but for example, I'm gonna give DSM-2 as an example. The DSM-2 that we use for planning is different than the DSM-2 that we use for operations. Why? Because the one that we use for operations gets real-time data. DSM-2 is physically based, one D hydrodynamic model, and gives you, you know, effects for the next three days, for the next week. The one that I use for planning is totally different. It gets model data from the operations model and looks at over a hundred year, you know, what the changes may be. So that's sort of different ways of modeling, the different kinds of modeling that goes into this process. All right, um, as I said, it gets too confusing too quickly. I kind of want to talk about how we go about this between the agencies and specifically between DWR and reclamation, because we're the more, we're, at least on the operational side and the physical side, I'm gonna say we're more or less kind of the keepers of these models, developers and keepers. Um, so we continuously work together. I kind of put a timeline over there. They have their delivery capability report published every two years, which is you know, focused on their water supply liability. Um, we have our consultation, which we don't want to be doing, you know, every other year, but it happens to be so. <laughs> and so they look at, you know, more on the water supply reliability in those studies, at least ITP is different. Um, and then we do more on the, how are we going to operate the system? Every big project goes through this little cycle of improving models. There's a continuous improvement in models. Right? And if a third project, let's say the orange, one of those orange arrows is starting anytime, somebody says, I'm gonna investigate this storage program. They go and pick the latest set of models and then they modify it for their needs. That's sort of just the lay of the land, how we go about these, <clears throat> you know, modeling in general. Um, and the circle, so the model development and maintenance is a, is a continuous process. It's never perfect. It'll always change. It's gonna have to change for the purpose that you're modeling. Right? Then let's say we started with the latest and greatest for the LTO. 
we were told that there was a desire to extend the simulation period to full 100 years. So we did that. We took Calcium, and which was a 96 year simulation period. We extended it by the last five years. And that whole in there is, is model development, a lot of like the hydrology demands. Now. Then you come to analytical tool selection, selection. That is the answering question of what model should I be using? And it depends on what question you're trying to answer. This is where we work with Josh and team and others, depending on what effects they're trying to analyze, we try to pick the most appropriate model. Then exploring potential actions. This is my favorite part I told you, getting creative, analyzing effects, doing the model, you know, real-time actions and collecting data. And that data feeds into your next cycle of model development. Well, we talked, we were gonna model OMR in this way. Did it work out? You look at the data, you're like, okay, we could improve here and there. So that's sort of how it goes. Yeah. All right, so I I will talk just a little bit about calcium. Um, calcium, a lot of, you get a lot of reactions. It's a lower hate. I mean, I'm not sure if not, not many people love it, but um, <laughs> so it's an operations model that we use to evaluate water supply reliability. It's, it just represents CVP and SWP. Um, we'll get through what's in calcium in, in just a bit, but just something to keep in mind that we, we have a projected level of analysis. This model has a consistent level of development and a specific regulatory criteria. And if we're not doing new facilities, all the existing facilities, and then we run these, run this model over 100 series of different hydrological conditions and try to get it, you know, some statistical data about how things may change. So it's not transient. This is it's a misconception that we get all the time. 1977 in the model is not going to be the 1977 you lived because the operations were different then and the demands were different. So it's a bit different. Um, and this is why we need to use it in a comparative manner. You can't use this as a predictive tool because it, it isn't representing what happened in the, in the past necessarily. So, Whenever we run calcium and any other model that relies on calcium, we use them in a comparative manner. We run a baseline scenario. How, you know, how are we operating the system right now? We run that. And then you run your alternative scenario. What if I change you know, Shasta operations like this? And then you, can, you look at the differences and see what happens. Um, a question that comes up often is like, is calcium calibrated? Um, no, because it is not, again, I'm not going to say it's not physically based. It is a hydrologic, there are hydrologic components to it, but the historical conditions evolve and we're doing a projected level analysis, so it is not calibrated. Um, there, was a, there was an attempt to look at it and it did a pretty good job in 2004. Um, we look at it more in the terms of looking at the results and seeing if, if the results make sense. Like, if this, is this how you would be operating? The data that goes into it is totally different. That's a different um, process. Um, there is calibration in, in, in data development, and, you know, the hydrology and the demands and everything. There are closure terms. Um, sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. Um, <laughs> but you gotta be careful about interpreting model results. So. I hope I'm not confusing everybody. So what's in calcium really? Well, well, it has all the project features and the hydrologic input. As I said, 100, 100 um, years worth of monthly data. It's not just 100 years of monthly data. We play with it to incorporate climate change, but I'm gonna save it for another discussion. <laughs> all the, you know, the storage, you know, storage um, reservoirs and, and export facilities canals and flood control curves and everything. It also has in it all of our project ob obligations. You know, 
starting from flood control, as I said, flood control curves, capacities, water rights, um, regulatory criteria. We have this, we still operate to D1641, and then we operate to biological opinions on top of it, everything. All the rules are in there. Um, and then it also has uh, logic for coordinated operations between the state and the federal project um, that we share responsibilities for Delta operations. And then it has our contractual obligations of providing water supply. The figure on the right is kind of showing the CVP split of um, contractual obligations. You'll see most more than half of it is um, senior water rights um, based on Shasta inflow which we don't have a lot of discretion. So I just picked that as an example. Um, well, this is my best map, but I'm not a GIS user by any means. So bear with me. It just <laughs> trying to show that we have a lot of um, flow and temperature requirements. This is only showing Sacramento to Delta and water quality requirements in the Delta and the big red dot is other regulatory requirements, including OMR, data cross channel, and everything else in Delta. Um, all of those are in calcium too. So the idea is it's, it's quite complex. And CVP side, especially, we operate reservoirs in tandem, trying to meet our objectives. Right? You're not operating one reservoir and deciding on one flow. There's flow, temperature, operating the reservoirs in tandem, meeting data. Uh, water quality, um, there's the, this, the sea coming in with the sea level rise and all kinds of um, complexities. So closer look at the Delta, um, kind of the points that I just made, the blue with the red line over there is all the middle river flows. That is the most fun to model, I'll tell you that. Because <laughs> we do pretty good with physical things, physics, right, the flow, the temperature is another degree. There's you know storage and flow component. But when it comes to the effect of flow and temperature on species and the biology, the biology comes in, it becomes um, even more complicated. OK. Um, this is how a typical planning analysis framework is. We just talked about calcium which is the surface water operations right there. Um, and then we use, <clears throat> we usually use DSM-2 for data conditions for flow and water quality. Um, we use SCISM, which is a 3D model for habitat questions. And I can expand on that just a bit. Um, so basically whenever you need to, you need a deeper dive, um, you go find the appropriate model. Um, and then surface water quality, water temperature, HTC5Q is what we've been using. Reclamation is just about to finish a new platform, uh, improved water um, temperature modeling platform um, that's going to use um, SQL W2 and RISM for, <clears throat> for temperature. And then we have the aquatic resources, which I'm going to just kind of flash on the last slide just a bit. And anything else that you may be looking at, you may be looking at hydropower generation, you may be looking at flood control, anything. So you go through that with, with and without project conditions or with and without your action, and you look at the change metrics. This figure was from a, a presentation that I put together for water storage investment program. If you're planning new facilities, then you try and monetize those changes, right? So you can do your cost benefit ratio. But that's not the case for LTO. So we stop at the physical change metrics. Now we do our impact analysis, right? We decide, you know, what does that mean for the rest of the resource areas? All right. This is a framework for LTO. Does look like a spaghetti. Um, let's see, what do we have? We have calcium. There's there's hydrologic input here we, or with climate change, assume everything climate change, everything at a projected level, all that. Then we have temperature models, then we have some temperature dependent mortality, all kinds of fun biological models, um, econ, 
power. What am I not seeing here? Oh, the DSM2 series is here for, for delta hydrodynamics and particle tracking, um, routing survival. So the question is, how do you decide which model to use? And how, how, how do we come up with all of this? It's a process. It's the process that Josh and team led through knowledge-based papers, looking at what is the latest and greatest science, looking at the stressors, looking at what we're going to analyze. And it's the work between our divisions about how you connect each of those to the operations that you're intending to change. Each one of those arrows is actually a lot of communication, a lot of <laughs> meetings and back and forth about like, oh, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to take calcium result and run a STARS model? So there's a lot of um, collaboration that goes on within reclamation, with reclamation and other agencies, DWR and the fisheries agencies. That's my overview. I'm going to stop there and see if we have any questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. This is probably a dumb question, but you said CalSim is used to evaluate water supply reliability. Um, so what exactly is water supply reliability? Is it just water delivered? Through the OMRs to the southern part of the state, or is it to meet all of those obligations that you showed in that slide? I mean, what do you mean by water supply reliability? Yes, it's it's mostly our both state and federal projects, even as with these contractual um, obligations. We we have different contracts, as you've seen, some of them are senior water rights. We have to provide that much water to them and then we have some that we have our service contracts where we have a little more discretion on how much we can deliver and everything on the hydrology facility and regulatory side is a constraint and then we run the model and trying to operate to the best we can to deliver water under those constraints if that helps thanks uh, so we'll work our way around the room uh, Jay and then Steve. Sorry, when I uh, two. Two on this, side. this is a problem for a long time. Like these, these, these problems of the Delta, they're, they're eternal. So they will last here longer than us. Even the young people. Are and it takes a long time to develop modeling and data for modeling. Um, it takes Careers, you know, get spent developing these models. The, the calcium modeling and all the modeling is for the careers where the people. So it's a long term issue. The questions that we have, some of them are eternal and some of them are fashionable. Well, right. So, and, and you've got a dozen or so agencies and this several dozen consulting firms that get involved in these. What kind of coordination? Is done to sorry get these models ready in time. I'm mean, looking at the list, and, and uh -huh. the names are the, are the same, but they, they models as you as you mentioned they change over time. Uh, in, in a particular, the the hydrodynamic model DSM two has turned out to be a wonderful model, very very useful for all kinds of operations. But a lot of the questions we're concerned with now are more two and three D questions, and and we. We, you, everybody struggles to answer 3D dynamic questions with 1D models. And there are 3D models around, but I still, you know, how, how do you see and coordinate the development of, of this new technology? So you, you see, you've seen it with temperature modeling and how do we yeah. do it as well? So, yeah, great. work when it's also complex. Well, I could go off on like, we need more time, <laughs> but I'm not gonna do that today. Um, 
you're right. There's a lot of coordination that, that happens, that actually happens. DSM2 has a users group, for example, DWR runs that, they meet monthly, they look at you know updates. Um, we started one for Calcium, and but Calcium people get overbooked very easily and it's really hard to keep it going. But we have a process with DWR at least after each big push, either DCR on their side or LTO on our side, we come together and we work on a benchmark model. And anytime one of us does anything with, with those models, we go to the other one and make sure that they're okay with the representation of their operations, right? We make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, temperature has been interesting. There was no necessarily one platform that kept everybody together. And this is what we're trying to attempt. We're attempting with this new platform. What happened in the past is um, you would, I spent 13 years as a consultant, so I would go to reclamation most of the time because reclamation is the agency that operates the temperature um, and get the latest model from them, work on it, go back to them, you know, we you know, share versions. That's how it, how the, the private sector kind of can come and contribute um, with the water, with the new um, water temperature modeling platform. We're looking into developing a users group and, you know, so to something similar to what ESM2 does. So everybody is on the same page we've done. The whole development has been um, transparent and in a collaborative way. We had it participants from, you know, fisheries agencies, public, you know, uh, DWR reclamation. So we're trying, it, it is huge though, as you can appreciate, there's a, a many models. Um, and they're like, I'm sure Josh can speak to what happens on the fisheries side, but if they go mostly on the publications, right? Whoever published latest and whatever, you know, that, you know, they go through review and decide on what needs to be used. So that's how we do it. We, unfortunately, there's no one umbrella of like, here we do all the coordination kind of thing. Um, I guess when I, when I listen to this talk, it's, it's but if someone from DWR gives the same talk, there will there'll be some overlap in the models, but you know, there'll be different models inside. And the different agencies, they all have a lot of models. Many of them are very different. You, you're right. I mean, it makes, it makes people outside feel confused. Yes, you're you're absolutely right, and I don't know an easy way to to help that. This is this is exactly why we did what we did for the LTO, and thanks to Dave, it was his idea. So I'm, I have to be very careful what I say here, but it was a lot of work. <laughs> so it was more more like I uh, use the analogy of like open kitchen restaurant. It's just like you're cooking with everybody in there watching you, all of them. Um, with different perspectives and different levels of understanding. It takes an extra effort to, bring, first of all, bring everybody to the same level and sort of then start understanding what their perspectives and sensitivities are. Um, yeah, I, I agree that we're, and we're very supportive of any kind of community of modelers that can be developed in the future. We're working on it. Um, but I, I'm gonna say there's no easy way. And yes, it's gonna be different for different projects because again, you're trying to answer different questions. Like whatever question you're trying to answer, that is gonna be your model selection. This is really heavy on, on the biological side because we're doing an ESA. If, I, if, if a project is not doing an ESA, it's only doing a NEPA, they don't necessarily dive this deep into the biology side. Anyway, you, Steve, could we come to Mo as a lot of this is uh, his field? Mo, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So in your spaghetti diagram in the top of calcium, there are a lot of inputs uh, from climate change projections from models. And for this particular area, climate models are particularly notorious, you know, for lack of consensus for presentation projections. So how do you deal with that uncertainty, especially that it propagates all the way down to other parts of the model? So that's the first question. Uh, the second question is, how do you explore the use of data-driven models 
you know, in hydrology, it's kind of like a big thing now using machine learning, deep learning models. Well, <laughs> I'm going to take the second one first. Well, you saw how the AI did on my bio. It was really, you didn't see it. It was very short. Um, yes, we do. <laughs> um, it is, there is no operator in this room. Good. So our operators get really, really tense when you talk about replacing them with some kind of a model. The <laughs> there's, a, there's a human aspect to it. And, and the way we do calcium modeling is you basically model what should be your full obligations and everything in real life. When you don't have water, those things change. People talk and people you know, walk back from 100% um, cellular contractor um, delivery, for example, even uh, in one case down to 18, which was really disastrous for them, but it was, it was a really bad year. Those things are not going to be captured in the modeling. So yes and no. The way we use um, kind of a machine learning is we have the AMN in with, you know, uh, artificial neural networks within calcium. Calcium knows flow storage it doesn't know what the salinity is going to be in the delta. And the way we inform it is training a neural network. Um, and we plug that as a DLL in calcium. So it gets a good idea. Do we base all of our analysis on the outcome of that neural network? No. Um, calcium runs, then we run DSM2, and we use DSM2 results. Look at the effects. Um, the first question was climate change modeling. Uh -huh. <laughs> I kind of had this in the back pocket. It, it, is, <laughs> it is a lot of, um, I, I, I don't want to kind of go through, but that top box over there is kind of going through what we have done this in climate models. We went through, we probably spent close to a year with the WR before we started the LTO process on what should be the next methodology for, uh, you know, modeling under climate change. And you're right, they don't necessarily agree. They agree more in the short term. And we're here in the lucky space because we're doing an ESA, we're not looking too far out as if it was a, you know, storage program, but we're looking more like near term. So we do get more uh, kind of concurrence between the models, but there's still difference. And the way we kind of go about it is we run sensitivity analyses, looking at, you know, trying to capture that uncertainty space. You're absolutely right. There's always going to be uncertainty. Um, DWR is actually doing another, the way we work is every time we go back to it, we kind of go through what's been done and what can be done next. So for their DCR, they're actually taking another step, one step further, looking at the decision scale kind of analysis to determine how to pick those sensitivity analysis. And next time we do LTO, we're gonna probably put on top of that and kind of move forward. So that's how, so how, how it goes. Um, but yeah. Great, thanks. Okay. Okay, just squeeze one more quick question. We go to Renee, and then we'll come back to the other questions at the just before lunch. Thanks. Thanks for the... Uh... A great presentation. So I think I come at things from the salmon world um, where maybe you all are not the keepers of the models to the extent that you are with the Delta Stone circumstance. But I would say every model related process I've been part of for the last decade has expressed at some point that love hate relationship with calcium. You named that it, it's enabled by calcium to have a hydrologic component, but also that the, the time step, the overcommittedness of the developers, the cost of running it makes the extent to which the hydrologic component can be evaluated as, you know, in the context of everything else really constrained. And it's also, I've heard it said multiple times by people who will remain nameless that calcium is in expression of its use over the course of its evolution, and that if it were to be redeveloped today, it might look differently in the context of what, you know, the changes in technology that have happened since it was first developed. 
And I'm wondering if you all contemplate making a new version that may be mm -hmm. is applicable to a wider range of things. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Carlson is continuously being maintained. DWR has a whole division that works on it. The, the underlying software, the programming language has changed over the years um, and it continues to change. The difficulty is when I get these questions, let me try to understand if I'm not getting it right, uh, correctly. Why can't I click on, on a user interface here and there and run Calcium? You could do that. But we tried that too, actually, the first version of Calli. However, the complexity is not actually with the model itself. The model has, you know, if you have any experience of coding, you can open it up and read it. It's not that bad. The complexity comes from the system. Everything that I just kind of flashed and we didn't talk about the details and I have slides if you want to, all those operational criteria are quite complex. And every time you change them, like this consultation, anything, you have to know what you're doing and you have to go in there and change it and make sure that piece that you change works with the rest of the system. And that is why Unfortunately, we can't have a, a more user-friendly um, model. Unfortunately, our system is too complex to do that. Um, the user-friendly ones, that I, I, there are ones that I still struggle with, like finding my way through, looking through formally, and trying to understand you know, who did what, version control. That gets really, really difficult. Um, on the fisheries side, this is long time kind of an issue. You have a lot of uncertainty on other things on your end, and you want at least this one piece to be predictive and tell you, like, this is how it's going to be. But unfortunately, it is not, right? This model is not, cannot be predictive. There are so many other things that, that comes into it. As painful as it is, and I don't really know a way to really help on that side, um, we just need to kind of take it with what it is and try and do our, you know, our best to interpret the results. It will, it will never give you the exact conditions that would have happened in this drought, for example. It'll give you something, and then we're going to have to come together and decide, okay, what can I glean from this result? That's really helpful. I guess the one thing I would, I would say is, I think it's less, my, my, at least, there's many different interests in it potentially changing. My own that I've run into is, the facility to simplify it, like it gets simplified. It's 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 uh, information it produces gets simplified all the time in different ways. But there is a limited scope for the ways that it is simplified based on who is operating it and what their interests are. And I think that there is an in, a broader interest in being able to think about simplifying it in different ways. And to your, to your exact point about the complexity coming from the system, that's like the lens that we bring on that complexity affects what we learn from the simplification of the system that is the model. So that was more what I was thinking about in terms of yeah. looking ahead. On, on the decision-making side, on the operational decisions, we're doing a monthly time step. It's really, it's not even explained. I don't know how you would do, there's an effort to do daily, but like, how would you do a daily operation model? How would you decide on how people would make decisions? Given that there are several agencies working together on a daily basis. But I want to say something, I want to point out, um, USRDOM is Upper Sacramento River Daily Operations Model. It's specifically developed to take calcium results on a monthly basis. It kind of maps to whatever year and month you're in, it looks at similar hydrologies and kind of maps it whatever it can find the closest in history to make it a daily, kind of dailyfying, right? Um, trying to do a good job, never perfect. But then that's used for all the other like red dewatering, water, uh, wetted usable area, fish stranding, where you need that detail, we try and put that detail in to the best we can. Um, but 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 should we run council on a daily time step? Mm. You gotta be very careful with the operational decisions on how you would how you would 
would you be in, uh, inserting more uncertainty to the results by trying to do it on a daily basis than the benefit that you're getting for, you know on the on the um the fisheries end if, if that makes sense you know yeah it's a good question okay. yeah well, thank you. And as we have the same speakers in the last session before lunch and afterwards, uh, what I'm going to do, Steve, uh, while we've got Daria here, would you like to just field your question uh, now? It relates to this slide. It seems that uh, the top two figures there, top two figures there, which connects calcium to uh, smelt life cycle, it seems like you solved the problem of relating fish close to fish. And uh, if you have an air on there, any uh, <laughs> mechanistic connection at all to flows to fish? Do you have any connection of calcium mechanistic way to anything related to fish? We do provide calcium data, but I'm going to look to Matt about the inputs, and then we can talk about how we do the, the connection. But like there are certain inputs that they take from calcium or the acid. So Matt, did you want to do a quick synopsis? I don't know. If you want to come up and use the mic, would be helpful. So so the people joining us online, this is Matt Debriga from US Fish and Wildlife. That's definitely the safer mic to use. Is it yeah. <laughs> okay. Um I'll start with saying it depends on what your tolerance for a mechanism is, because I can see on the slide that there are some, some relationships like serial Michelle's flow survival relationship. It's empirical, it's done with tagging data, so it's real. It's not just a correlation out of the air. Um, I'm sure that Cyril could explain if he was here what the implied mechanisms are. So definitely there is. Um, at that kind of level, and we can do it as well. Um, so then if you mean, can you piece it apart into something even more mechanistic than that? The answer is yes. Kenny Rose has a version of his individual base model for Delta smelt that he built for us in the last five -ish years that syncs with calcium and will tell you that if something is wetter than contemporary, Delta smelt are going to be better over an 82-year time frame. Um, we have not pieced that apart to see exactly how the model says it works. But yes, in theory, all of that can be done. I, I want to add, um, I'm not very familiar with the, life, the smelt life cycle model, but for example, for Delta Passage model, just to give you an idea of how the linkage is done, they take the SM2 results, right? With the flow on a 15 minute basis, downscale from calcium, obviously. Um, they also look at the delta cross channel operations that are depicted in calcium. They look at export levels that are depicted in calcium. So that's sort of each model is going to have the critical information that it needs from calcium, but it's going it's to have its own complexity within itself uh, about the, the, the physics of it, right? Thank you. Well, perhaps we could thank Dr. Summer for a really good overview. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's yeah. great. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. So we're now moving to a, an in-depth presentation on the summer fall habitat actions. And uh, we have two speakers to uh, cover this. Uh, Christy Arendt from uh, Reclamation. She's a freshwater aquatic ecologist with experience in the Great Lakes. Uh, she's worked in coastal and wetland ecosystems, inland reservoirs, and tidal rivers. More recently, she's worked on water management and endangered species in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And her areas of expertise include fish community surveys, food web dynamics, water quality, and weather monitoring. She received her PhD in aquatic ecology from Cornell. 
the second speaker will be uh, Brittany Davis with the Department of Water Resources. She serves as the Environmental Program Manager at the California Department of Water Resources. She has numerous publications, many on smelt, and has worked on monitoring and evaluation of the North Delta food subsidies, North Delta flow action, yellow bypass, uh, and other food web dynamics within the system. Uh, she's also worked on the physiological and behavioral effects of domestication of Delta smelt, which we've heard of so much about today. So thank you both for being with us. And I don't know who's going first. Is it Christy? Oh, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, I think we'll fill up the rest of the time before lunch, but um, basically over the next three talks, um, my colleagues, Dr. Brittany Davis and Dr. Rosemary Hartman and I will be talking about um, basically how um, Delta smelt summer and fall habitat. So basically the um, availability and the quality of habitat and prey, how we think that that is, um, really important in terms of their growth, survival, and recruitment at the population level. Um, so we'll be just providing a kind of an overview of some of the conceptual framework underlying these ideas, and then we'll provide some information on the different management actions that are either being taken or being developed to try to um, improve the habitat and prey conditions. And um, then what, uh, Rosemary will kind of focus in on later in the afternoon is the monitoring and the modeling that we use to um, plan these actions and also evaluate them. So if I can get it to apparently I don't know how to use PowerPoint. So just an up and down arrow. Oh yeah, that didn't work for me. But anyway, <laughs> now we're here. Um, so, so for this first talk, then we're really going to focus, um, kind of review the conceptual model that we've developed some of these management actions under, um, some of our management objectives and the performance metrics that we're using, and then provide sort of an overview of the actions and their associated operations, um, and also identify some of the issues that we're grappling with in terms of adaptive management, uncertainties, and some of the, um, data gaps, knowledge gaps that we have, and that, that we've kind of discovered along the way. Um, and then finally, just a quick review of sort of what our planning and evaluation process is. All right, now I've got it. So just a quick, 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 quick primer on uh, Delta smelt basic biology. Um, they're a small pelagic fish species that's endemic to the Bay Delta. They are thought to have a fairly weak swimming ability and um, shoaling behavior and they have an annual life cycle. And so during that time, they migrate within the Bay Delta, and that's shown over here on the right, um, we'll kind of start where we are right now seasonally. So in the winter, the adults migrate upstream in response to what we refer to as first flush, which is basically um, really high flows and turbidity that result from one of the first storms of the winter. Um, after that, then they spawn in, um, fresh water. So right, right around now, we think that they've completed their upstream migration due to some storms we had earlier this winter, and the water temperatures are suitable for spawning, so they're probably spawning around now. Um, then the larvae and the juveniles migrate to, um, to, to low salinity habitat, so brackish water, um, during the summer, and then um, remain there in the fall, kind of as their nursery habitat as they mature. And so this is really the time period that we're focusing on this, the time when, when they have um, these different life history stages in the brackish low salinity water. Okay, so they primarily consume um, zooplankton and other microinvertebrates, copepods, cladocerans, amphipods, um, and they prefer cool water, more turbid water, and then again, this low salinity to fresh water that I already mentioned. They're threatened, federally endangered in California. So really the um, management actions that, I'll be, that we'll be talking about are really focused on this transition 
from the juvenile through sub-adult to adult life stages. So this is operating again, kind of June to December time period. And we think that this is represents a bottleneck in their population growth. Some of the key drivers are the size and location of low salinity habitat, um, quality of habitat and the availability of prey. So we developed a lot of this uh, based on a conceptual model that was um, developed by the Interagency Ecological Programs Management Analysis and Synthesis Team. And so within that broader conceptual model for Delta smelt um, is the premise that if we have um, an increase in low salinity habitat that should maximize the area of suitable habitat for delta smelt and result in higher growth and survival. Um, the way we think about this from a management perspective is that if we can augment flow in the summer and fall, um, that should increase uh, low salinity habitat and then decrease salinity in particular areas that we think provide really good habitat for smelt and pray for smelt. So this would be in Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh. Um, and then that has a couple different effects. One is that um, we should see some increases in zooplankton production, maybe improvements in species composition to the prey that they prefer. And that, that enhancement of food availability quality should um, lead to greater growth. Also, um, this area is thought of as as good habitat, it provides access to um, more turbid water. So that should reduce predation risk. And it also provides um, access to have habitat that has somewhat cooler water just due to um, what's coming up, kind of atmospheric air temperature um, forcing from the, from the ocean. And so again, those should lead to greater survival growth um, and ultimately recruitment. So I talked about this low salinity habitat. I just want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, so we refer to this low salinity habitat as the low salinity zone. And that's really where depth average salinity is between about 0.5 and 6 practical salinity units. This is what is thought to be kind of this range of salinities that um, delta smelt prefer. And you know what I was just talking about is that we kind of want to see that in this red area of this map. So what this is just showing is it's just plotting salinity kind of over space from the western saltier side um, of the estuary, you know, up, up to the, the fresh water. And so we have this low salinity area here. We have a lot of area in that more turbid, cooler water habitat that they can occupy. Um, obviously, this isn't something that's stable or static. Um, so if we have a lot more flow coming in through the system, we're going to expect that low salinity habitat to move to the west. And if we have less flow, like during a drought year, we'll expect that low salinity habitat to move um, up more into the, the delta, the lower part of the river, um, due to that greater intrusion of salt water. So we can gauge kind of where this low salinity zone is by using X2. I think um, you heard about this a little bit in the first meeting, but basically X2 is um, refers to the distance from the Golden Gate Bridge and river kilometers where daily average bottom salinity is about two practical salinity units. So we can estimate where this is and that can give us an idea, you know, then we can relate that to how much low salinity habitat, you know, we think is available, what that zone looks like. So in this um, figure right here, we're seeing an X2 at, uh, right here at 74 kilometers. And then the blue colors are showing you where that low salinity zone habitat is. We can also look at what would happen if we have an X2 at um, 80 kilometers. You can see you know, somewhat of a shift in where that low salinity habitat is upstream a little bit, and then you know, some reduction in low salinity habitat in this bay area. So the other thing that we mentioned as being important is food availability. Just want to really quickly go through a couple ideas for that. So there is evidence for food limitation during this time period. Some of that could be due to uh, grazing by invasive clams. Um, also, the, the uh, low salinity zone seems to rely on subsidies from freshwater. So subsidies of copepods and, and other zooplankton from freshwater. And so we can see that. Um, operating again. There we go. 
Um, so we can see that here. So the left-hand graph is just showing zooplankton um, catch per cubic meter in freshwater zone for a number of different taxonomic groups. And then on the right, it's showing it for the low salinity zone. I've circled this um, zooplankton right here, Pseudodiaptimus forbici. That's kind of one of the preferred prey items for delta smelt. So you can see much higher um, relative abundance in the freshwater area and lower in the low salinity zone. But we think that with, with flows, um, those flows can, can basically subsidize the zooplankton that are in that low salinity zone from those fresher waters, fresher water areas, the adjacent areas. So the goal and objectives really of the management actions are to improve habitat conditions and food supply, um, maintain, more specifically, maintain low salinity habitat in this Sassoon Marsh and Grizzly Bay area when water temperatures are suitable, manage the low salinity zone to overlap with turbid water and available food supplies, and establish contiguous low salinity habitat from the Cache Slough complex all the way down to um, Sassoon Marsh. Really what, you know, ultimately what we wanna see is an increase in individual delta growth, uh, delta smelt survival, growth and condition so that we have you know, improved recruitment. Um, we have an interagency group that has worked together um, through the process of structured decision-making to identify the performance metrics that we're using to evaluate how these different actions perform given kind of these objectives, these fundamental objectives. So some of the ones that are related to Delta smelt include um, increasing the area of suitable abiotic habitat, increasing prey biomass and composition, decreasing contaminant exposure. So we are thinking about contaminants here um, and then increasing Delta smelt growth, which we, um, and Rosemary will be talking about these measures more specifically later on. So I'm just kind of listing them here. We will go into detail later today. Um, we also think about other things like minimizing negative effects to other native species. Um, if possible, minimizing resource costs in terms of water and funds, and then how we can learn from this adaptive management framework. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Brittany and she'll talk about the actions and operations. Great, thanks. Okay, this does or doesn't work? It does. Okay, uh, thanks Christy, thanks panel uh, for joining us. And I'm gonna whip through these actions pretty quickly and operations. And I just wanna remind you that you know, the three of us will be on all the panels today and Christy and I will also be on the field trip Friday and you can pick our brains uh, then. So in total, uh, I'm going to describe six summer fall habitat actions or strategies that we use to implement um, or are currently experimenting with in hopes to improve uh, the habitat for Delta smelt. So the first three actions are all focused on these abiotic habitat conditions or expansion of that low salinity zone. Um, these actions include uh, fall X2, reoperation of the Sassoon Marsh Salinity Control Gates, shown here in Montezuma Slough with that yellow star. And then a requirement to uh, provide an additional 100,000 acre feet of water. The second three actions um, are either experimental or sort of concept um, feasibility stages right now. And these are all focused on really stimulating and subsidizing uh, food. So primary and secondary production. These food subsidy actions include first, the North Delta Food Subsidy Study. Um, this is located here in purple near the uh, Ridge Cut Slough, Yolo Bypass area. Uh, trying to move food into uh, accessible smelt habitat in the cash slew complex. Second, highlighted in yellow here, is the managed wetland study um, in Sassoon Marsh. And then the last uh, food subsidy action uh, is the Sacramento Deepwater Ship Channel, um, highlighted here in green, sort of parallel to the bypass. Um, Right now, uh, the North Delta Food Subsidy Studies is the only one that is actually feasible. Um, and I'll, I'll go into detail about what are your types and when it can be implemented. Um, they vary.
So the first, uh, I'm going to go walk through the first three habitat actions first. The first one is fall X2. So this is maintaining that bottom salinity um, at 2 PSU um, at 80 kilometers. Um, X2 is maintained through coordinated operations via reservoir releases or reduced exports. Um, X2 at 80 is to be maintained during September and October months in above normal and wet years. So fall X2 has been implemented uh, several times now. First uh, was in 2017 and then 2019 and X2 here was managed to 74 kilometers under previous uh, biological opinions. And then most recently this last year, it was implemented uh, and X2 was maintained at 80 kilometers um, with our current permit requirements. And so some of the conclusions from at least the 2017 uh, study highlighted here, uh, we did see changes in water quality, such as increases in turbid turbidity, um, also decreases in water temperature. Um, in terms of food, there were no uh, significant observations in, in zooplankton changes. And then for the smelt themselves, uh, there were observations of similar or uh, less uh, smelt than in other regions, but like I said, given the status of the species, it's hard to really use delta smelt detections to uh, evaluate the actions, which could change in the future with, um, you know, supplementation of fish. So really, it's it's a challenge to tease apart uh, the effects of specific actions and given water year types because the hydrologic conditions, um, you know, can vary from year to year. Okay, second action. Second habitat action is the reoperation of the Sassoon Marsh Salini control gates. Um, here we're trying to uh, operate the gates to maintain that low salinity habitat in the marsh. Um, so here we're conveying fresh water into the marsh. So uh, essentially the picture here is showing you this, the uh, salinity gates. We're gonna visit them Friday, I believe. Um, the gates can essentially be held open. So when water is flowing out of the Delta, um, it uh, went, it could push fresh water out to freshen the marsh, and then the gates can be closed to prevent seawater intrusion. So right now, um, operations of the gates for the summer fall habitat action specifically are focused in June uh, through October, um, operations for 60 days. Um, there is potentially some flexibility with this, whether you're operating for 60 days continuously or you have some other schedule. Um, a lot of this discussion happens through this interagency Delta coordination group that Christy talked about, and I think Rosie's going to allude to more, um, sort of taking a structured decision approach and using modeling to figure out what the best scheduling is to improve habitat. So the gates uh, are implemented in below normal, above normal, some dry, and some wet years. So the Gates action has been implemented. I think Louise alluded to this earlier, first in 2018, and then most recently last year. Um, conclusions from 2018, we did see increase, and I say we, but there I'm citing these studies here. Um, we did see increases of low salinity habitat. Um, we also saw um, you know, beneficial changes uh, in water quality. So increase, um, or there was higher turbidity in chlorophyll A, in the marsh as compared to the lower Sacramento River region. Um, in terms of food, again, we didn't see significant uh, increases in zooplankton abundance. Um, there were though in 2018, small numbers of Delta smelt uh, detected in the marsh during the action. And again, similar to uh, fall X2, you know, anticipated effects can vary based on year to year conditions. Um, we're still working off the 2023 report. We'd be happy to discuss those results um, Friday or later, but there might be some differences already that we're detecting in the 2023 action compared to the 2018 action. Okay, the third habitat action is this requirement of DWR to provide an additional 100,000 acre feet. Um, the decision to use this uh, is at the discretion of CDFW. The intent is to increase uh, freshwater habitat in the marsh and Grizzly Bay. Uh, the Hunter Taff can be uh, operationally impl implemented via uh, extra outflow 
or use through additional operations of the Sassoon Marsh Salini control gates, as was done in this last year, 2023. So there is also flexibility in the timing of this action. The hunter tack can be used uh, in the above normal and wet year that it is provided by DWR um, in June through October. Or there is the option to defer uh, that hundred tapped the, the next year and redeploy uh, sometime during March or October to supplement outflow. If it were in the spring, the benefits might be more targeted towards long fin smelt. If they were in the deferred and using the following smelt, the folk, or following smelt, the following summer, it would be uh, intended benefits for delta smelt. So, for example, in a wet year, conditions are already wet, so you might choose to defer it to use uh, next year in the summer when conditions could be very dry. We talked about California's whiplash, wet and dry years. And so having that water available in drier conditions might provide more benefits. And again, uh, that decision is at the discretion of CDFW, but we discussed this in that Delta coordination group. So uh, we have implemented this uh, for the first time this last year, though we implemented it not as outflow, but through use of additional Sassoon Marsh Salini control gates, um, August through October. Um, and so in conclusions that we're seeing uh, is it did provide greater area of freshwater habitat. Um, there is a risk that has to be assessed in using this water. Um, if you use it in the during, uh, in the current wet year, you may not have as significant benefits as you would using that water under drier conditions, but um, there's a risk of deferring. If you have two wet years in a row, then um, that water may not be available if it is spilled from reservoirs that following spring. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into the three uh, food subsidy actions. So the first is the North Delta food subsidy study. Um, this is an experimental action. Uh, it essentially creates net positive flow um, in the Yolo bypass region um, and attempts to stimulate and transport primary and secondary production. Um, operations, uh, there's some flexibility here. Um, we can create managed flow pulses by redirecting Sacramento River water through the bypass. Um, this would occur during summer in July, uh, mainly due to um, operation feasibility and some salmonid concerns. Uh, the other managed flow pulse um, can be implemented in fall, um, utilizing agricultural return drainage in the Calusa Basin drain and diverting that through the bypass to create a net positive flow. Um, the agricultural drainage is, is mostly rice field drainage. Um, let's see, anything else I wanna say there? No. Um, so the North Delta Food Subsidy Study, if the water is available, it can be implemented across a number of water year types, dry, below normal, and above normal, though there could be some water quality concerns in drier years, um, for example, dissolved oxygen. So uh, it's a mouthful, the North Delta Food Subsidy Study. Uh, it has been, we, we usually just call it NDFS. Um, uh, this action has been previously implemented. Um, so the first, not a classic action, but 2012 was when we really made the first observations and the concept of the experiment. Um, there was construction that needed to occur. And so the water was diverted and we saw a big pulse and some productivity and hey, the light bulbs went off. Um, and then there were two subsequent agricultural pulses in 2018 and 2019. Um, we were able to uh, work with reclamation closely uh, to generate a managed flow pulse action using Sacramento River water in 2016. So the conclusions for NDFS, uh, really variable. Um, there's been phytoplankton responses in some years and not others. Uh, we have relatively low statistical power to detect zooplankton responses. Um, and then there could be some potential consequences of moving pulses through these habitats. There uh, 
We've detected relatively high contaminant concentrations that could lead to potential and negative effects on smelt or, or other species. And then, um, you know, in this northern delta region, uh, particularly the Yolo Bypass, temperatures in summer or fall are really warm. And so temperatures can, uh, um, you know, reach sublethal and, and even exceed tolerance levels of smelt in some cases. So it's really about moving food to more accessible habitat. Okay, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> the second food subsidy action, um, this is more uh, conceptual at this stage, um, the managed wetlands food subsidy study. Um, the objective here is, again, to increase that primary and secondary production in, in the marsh. And so um, seasonal operations of sort of draining wetlands in the summer and filling uh, wetlands and doing this cycle can potentially poses a really useful tool to create food for fish. Um, these are more restricted habitats, so they're free of clams um, and might have higher residency time for food production versus um, you know, tidal wetlands that are unrestricted uh, and have more of these pulse flow effects and low residency times. So uh, recently in 2022, uh, UC Davis began uh, a study really evaluating uh, these seasonally flooded wetlands um, compared to perennial, uh, more long-term flooded wetlands uh, compared to uh, tidally restored, unrestricted wetlands. And so you can see here in the marsh, I think we're going to Thule Red, um, this tidally restored habitat um, in the blue here on Friday. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure if Rose is going to go over it or not, but some of the preliminary findings, I don't have a slide on it, but um, I've seen some of the data. And I think the hypotheses thus far are being partially supported where seasonally flooded wetlands, you know, are, are promoting higher plankton production. The per perennial flooded wetlands are sort of creating this, this moderate production. And then the tidal uh, unrestricted wetlands um, are providing uh, uh, a lower uh, plankton, and it's probably due to these uh, changes in the uh, wetland features that I mentioned previously. And so the, the last food subsidy action is the Sacramento Deep Water Ship Channel. Um, this is intended to stimulate plankton production um, in the main stem Sacramento River. And so this the ship channel, which is really one of the key habitats that remaining delta smelt are, are often found in supplemented smelt. Um, it's a dead end uh, terminal cha channel. Um, it has similar characteristics to other terminal channels where uh, there are hydrodynamics um, zones that really drive gradients in uh, nutrients, light, uh, turbidity. Um, and so the operations here would be uh, creating some uh, enriched nutrients in the upper channel of the SAC ship channel and then creating some sort of managed flow poles to export that production uh, downstream to the lower Sacramento River. And uh, reclamation is the lead of uh, this study. So the timing of this would, would likely be in the summer. So similar to wetlands, uh, experiments are ongoing, investigations determining the feasibility of these actions. Um, there was a pilot study in 2018 uh, through 2019 uh, where fertilizer was essentially applied to a segment of the ship channel. Does the cursor work here? In the first panel here, uh, you can see there's low nitrate concentrations throughout the ship channel. And then we're moving over to post-fertilization and just one day you really see a rapid increase in nitrate concentrations. And then across that week, um, that concentration really expands spatially across the ship channel. And so some of the conclusions from this pilot study, uh, the fertilizer application um, increased nitrate concentrations. Um, this resulted in short-lived but really substantial increases in chlorophyll. Um, the chlorophyll concentrations that were observed were higher when the water column was thermally stratified. Um, the study did highlight uh, nitrogen limitation in that upper channel, um, and this is likely due to those uh, hydrodynamic gradients. So greater light penetration and longer residency times um, occurring in that upper channel. And then lastly, um, 
you know, implementation of this action to stimulate and export uh, phytoplankton production, it will require both likely, uh, you know, enhanced nutrient supply via application or some of the method and, um, you know, then altering the flow dynamics there via flow pulse to export that. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it back to Christy for all the adaptive management issues. In seven minutes. All right, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to speed through this. So yeah, we're gonna go through some of the science issues related to adaptive management uh, uncertainties and our knowledge gaps. So starting with adaptive management and just focusing on that North Delta food subsidies study. Um, like Brittany mentioned, we really have um, actually had a power analysis conducted and have very low statistical power to actually detect a food web effect. So it's hard for us to use those field monitoring data to say, oh yes, we have stimulated production up to the zooplankton. Um, so what we've started recently is a stabilized isotope pilot study so that we can really track those carbon sources and their movement into the food web um, to see if our concept of how that should work is the way that those, re those nutrients and carbon is actually being uh, transferred through the trophically through the food web. Um, it also has a fairly small footprint, so it is unlikely to increase primary and secondary production, you know, well into the lower Sacramento River, which is kind of one of the targets um, for where we expect, we would like the Delta Smelt to be able to uh, benefit from that. Just as Brittany mentioned, it's, you know, up in the area where this is happening, it's, it's really warm and contaminant levels are higher. Um, and we found that the hydrodynamics aren't quite as they uh, were expected to be, um, not quite as much of a linear flow. And we also anticipate that um, some restoration projects that are being wrapped up and, and ongoing right now um, are expected to change those hydrodynamics as well. So some of the focus has shifted in response to these challenges um, and also in response to these high contaminant and temperature concerns. And so right now we have also another new study that is evaluating the thermal suitability kind of throughout the cash flow complex, recognizing that you know some of the, the if if it's working and we're subsidizing um, the food web and it's not going straight down to the river, but kind of spreading throughout the um, area, you know, what does that look like in terms of um, thermal tolerance for for delta smelt? Uh, we saw, also have some adaptive management issues related to the Fall X2 and salinity control gate actions. Um, there are trade-offs between reservoir releases and then cold water pool management for other native and listed species. So, you know, kind of what we do with our reservoirs, thinking about delta fish might have uh, consequences for, for fish that we care about up in the upper part of the river. Um, and then there's a kind of a thinking about um, how to maximize gate operations, you know, that really can depend on your perspective of whether you want to maximize freshwater habitat over space in that area, or if you want to maximize it over time. So you have that freshwater lasting a little bit longer, but maybe not covering quite as much area. Um, again, we are challenged by limited statistical power to detect a zooplankton response. Fortunately, they are patchy, highly variable, and it's just really hard to do the level of monitoring that's required. Um, and then finally, what Brittany mentioned before and explained before is this relative benefit of using the water, the 100,000 acre feet during that year when it becomes available, the wet or above normal year versus deferring it to, to the next year where that water could be lost and potentially not, not able to be used. In terms of uncertainties, do we know that delta smelt are going to migrate to higher quality habitat if we create it for them? How can we improve our understanding of what's going on in these lower trophic levels? So can we improve our models of phytoplankton and zooplankton transport and subsidization to really have some concrete hypotheses that then we can test and look at in the field? How can we improve the individual based delta smelt model? So this is the model that um, we're using the component of it, the bioenergetics component of it to um, estimate growth in response to these actions, but then we can also use the full model to look at the, the um, consequences at the population level. So one um, area that has been identified for improvement is that the bioenergetics model is based on rainbow smelt, not delta smelt. So can we do some experiments to parameterize it based on delta smelt? And then also how do you best incorporate movement into that model? Again, with these assumptions that ideally smelt are gonna be moving into this better habitat. 
And then really, can these flow actions result in detectable food web effects and population benefit level benefits for delta smelt? All of these have kind of a small footprint hydrologically. So what does that mean at the population level and how, how can we really scale it up or understand if and how it does scale up? And then finally, the kind of wide open question that I think we're hoping um, to get input on is what are other approaches that could be used to facilitate population transition through this bottleneck period? What are we not thinking of? We're, we're thinking a lot about flow pulses. What else could we be thinking about? So some of the information and synthesis needs that have really come up and come to light as we've um, had this group using structured decision making to evaluate and make recommendations regarding these management actions are, you know, what have we learned since that conceptual model was developed that I presented earlier? We've had a lot of publications, a lot of studies come out since then. So we're working right now to kind of update our conceptual model and, and really bring in this newer information. To what extent do some food subsidy, subsidy actions increase contaminants and impact Delta smelt growth and condition? We know it's probably an issue with the North Delta food subsidy. It may also be one with the um, ship channel. Do and if so, how to our act, do our actions impact other native species, particularly um, ESA and CISO listed species? I was going to talk a little bit more about that and how we score that using export elicit elicitation right now. It'd be nice to not rely on just expert opinion to understand these effects. Um, and then what is the relative role of temperature with respect to other habitat conditions now and in the future? Temperature um, Temperatures are warm. They're warm in the summer and fall in kind of these areas. Um, so, you know, what role do they play now in really limiting the, the area of, of physical habitat that, that's really high quality? And then how is that going to change as climate changes? So, you know, the way that we kind of go about this from a bigger picture is through this sort of planning, reporting, and evaluation process. So annually, um, DWR and Reclamation jointly develop an action plan um, based on the recommendations from this interagency Delta um, DCG, why am I blanking out? Delta coordination. coordination group, thank you. Um, and so basically these recommendations come from this structured decision-making. We also have a science and monitoring plan that we update annually that describes the monitoring, the mo modeling activities, and also any directed research that may be going on to um, evaluate these actions. And then a seasonal report, basically our annual report that describes the implementation of the actions and the modeling and monitoring results for that year. Uh, there are also a number of peer reviewed publications that have come out, as I mentioned, um, looking at some of these actions and their effects. And then um, right now, uh, DWR is currently working with the Delta Stewardship Council on a four year independent review of the Summerfall Habitat Action for the uh, California Incidental Take Permit. So um, this should inform how well the science plans and the structured decision-making approach are being integrated into adaptive management for um, summer fall habitat. Uh, recommendations ideally will improve certainty in metrics and confidence in decision-making. So this effort's kind of digging in a little bit more into the weeds and the details than I think what we're asking you to do, um, but that information will be available to you. Um, ideally, uh, we think that it should be completed by June of 2024. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, lunchtime. <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks for finishing on time so we can take a break. As I mentioned earlier, as we had those questions around the modeling, we're going to come back and we'll roll the panel discussion into the session immediately after lunch. So we'll get the presentation and if it's okay with the speakers, um, you'll get the full set rather than splitting it before and after. So if we could just thank the speakers first. Sorry, yeah. giving us so much time. And we'll be back at one o'clock. Okay, what we're going to do this afternoon, if you look at the agenda, is that um, we have two sessions this afternoon, one on the summer fall habitat action monitoring. And the second one is going to actually be on the biological monitoring. What we're going to do is to go through uh, both presentations uh, and then have a, a, a panel discussion at the front, both with the presenters and other folks you may want to, you know, to bring up who might have something to offer. Uh, we're also adding to the uh, original agenda, uh, extend, extending the 
uh, presenters. And it's a pleasure to invite Dr. Uh, Rosemary Hartman again, who is the lead for the Interagency Ecological Program Synthesis at DWR. Uh, her prior experience is with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, that's where you're from. <laughs> and uh, she's well known on fish restoration programs you're across the system. So Dr. Hartman, thanks for being with us. And we'll turn, looks like you're the first speaker. All right, yeah, um, you're gonna be a lot of me, so hopefully I don't bore anyone. Um, I am, as um, Peter said, the lead for the Interagency Ecological Program Synthesis Team, which I like to say means that I know all the data that's being collected. So whenever there's a big question, I can take all the data, put it together, and answer that question. Um, and so for the summer fall habitat action, um, the monitoring framework that I'm going to go over is really taking mostly data that's already being collected adding additional data where we need it and putting it all together to answer these big questions. So I've been uh, the lead on the monitoring for the salinity control gates and working with Britt and Christy kind of putting everything together to evaluate the effectiveness of these actions. Um, come on, buddy. There we go. So as Christy introduced, we have this conceptual model for the summer fall habitat action that smelt are food limited in the fall. And whatever we can do to get them through this kind of crunch period is going to be a good idea. Um, our overall hypothesis was that food and habitat in the fall were better in Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay than upstream of the Sacramento River. But this is a hypothesis. It's not something that we know for sure that it's always going to be better to get smelt into uh, Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay in the fall. Um, and so we really took a hypothesis-based approach to evaluating the effectiveness of these actions and um, putting monitoring in place that would allow us to evaluate our hypotheses. So um, our hypotheses for fall X2, which again, the action says that we need X2 at 80 kilometers in September and October. And we hypothesized that a lower X2 maximizes the overlap of appropriate temperatures, turbidity, and salinity. So that's the uh, abiotic habitat. Low X2 also increases calanoid copepods in the low salinity zone in Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay. Um, and that better habitat and better food will mean better delta smelt growth and survival. For the salinity control gate action, we have a very similar uh, set of hypotheses. Again, we're operating the salinity control gates for 60 days, June through November. This is gonna freshen so soon March. So um, that's gonna maximize the overlap of appropriate temperatures, turbidity, and salinity in Sassoon Marsh. Now our X2 hypothesis focused on Sassoon Bay. This action focuses on Sassoon Marsh. Um, operating those gates is also going to increase copepods, which are smelt's favorite food, in Sassoon Marsh. Um, and uh, operation of the gates can even increase habitat all the way in Grizzly Bay, because Montezuma Slough is you know, a um, flow through system. So uh, we definitely think freshening the marsh is going to be good. And if we can get that fresh water all the way over to Grizzly Bay, it's going to be even better because that area tends to be cooler. So, um, Christy introduced you to this sort of adaptive management wheel that we use to conceptualize the planning and action implementation process. Um, and she went over kind of some of the backgrounds, uh, but we really are taking an adaptive management approach where we evaluate this action every year and uh, change our plans in the next year. And in order to evaluate the actions, monitoring is obviously super important. Fortunately, uh, there's a long history of ecological and environmental monitoring funded by Reclamation and DWR, as well as other groups, um, much of which is coordinated through the Interagency Ecological Program, which is a nine member agency team of researchers that I think you guys were introduced to in the first meeting. Um, and this is just kind of a snapshot of where we have monitoring, um, continuous water quality, discrete water quality, benthic invertebrates, phytoplankton, zooplankton, all kinds of fish surveys really uh, coat the area pretty darn well. Um, 
Because of all of this, we did have to add some additional monitoring uh, to answer spe our specific hypotheses, but a lot of it we could use these existing studies. Now, evaluating this action, I was just talking uh, to one of the panelists at the break here, is difficult because we have sort of a hodgepodge of years where we had one action but not the other, Every year is different in California. Water years change so quickly. Um, and we haven't done these actions very frequently. So um, it's hard to know how to define what the outcome of the action was versus the outcome of it being the year of the tiger. Um, we also, you know, if I'm designing an experiment, I want a control, right? We don't have a control estuary be great if we had another estuary we could not do the action and then uh, clearly evaluate the results. So we based a lot of our analyses on interannual comparisons, um, years with X2 actions, years without X2 actions, um, years with the gates, years without the gates. We have one year, this past year, we had both combined. And then we had dry years with no actions at all. Um, we also are using uh, regional comparisons. So as I said, we think that X2 is gonna improve conditions in Sassoon Bay. We think that salinity control gates are gonna improve conditions in Sassoon Marsh. And then upstream in the Sacramento River, where the low salinity zone would be if we didn't have an action, uh, won't really change with the actions. And it's always gonna be not as good smelt habitat. So <laughs> I made like a little, cartoon of what we think the data could look like. So the y-axis is not important. It's just a example of whatever metric we're looking at. Higher is better. Um, and this is just a, well, every year we're gonna be measuring whatever metric this is, um, starting with 2017. And in the river, like things bounce around a lot, but we don't see any major changes in our metric. Um, when we do a salinity control gate action. Um, in Sassoon Bay, things bounce around a lot, but you don't expect to see a huge effect of a salinity control gate action in Sassoon Bay. However, in Sassoon Marsh, years with a gate action, like 2018 in orange and 2023 in green, you'd expect an improvement. But there's still a lot of noise and it's gonna be really hard to find that signal. If we are expecting an effect of an X2 action, again, we won't really see an effect in the river. So soon Bay will probably see a big benefit to an X2 action um, in those blue years and the green year um, on the graph here. And in Sassoon Marsh, you'll also see an effect of the action, but um, you won't see as big an effect as when you have both the salinity control gates and the um, X2 action combined like we had in 2023. So, um, how are we actually monitoring this? What data are we collecting? Well, to answer our first hypothesis, which is maximizing habitat, we are relying chiefly on our network of continuous water quality stations. We can not only analyze this data directly, it's also an input into our 3D hydrodynamic models. Um, we have a huge network of these continuous songs throughout the Delta. Uh, first year we did a gate action back in 2018, we um, revamped a lot of these to make sure they all included turbidity and chlorophyll, as well as uh, temperature, salinity, um, and you know normal sweet. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, they are inputs into our hydrodynamic models. We can use forecast models to predict the effect of our action and hindcast models to say, okay, these are these discrete points. How much habitat did we get between those points? And so I, I showed you just an example of some fake data that wasn't really data. This is what we actually can get from all of those songs. Uh, this is the number of days that were within smelt habitat parameters for uh, turbidity in pink, temperature in dark purple, salinity in orange, and days with combined appropriate salinity, temperature, and turbidity in green. Um, and one, set of columns for each year. So we can compare, okay, years with X2 actions in the bay at the top, marsh in the middle, river at the bottom. Um, in the bay, years with X2 actions, that green bar was really high all the years. Um, in the marsh, uh, 
a lot of times temperature was sort of a limiting factor. Um, and then the river, we didn't see as much of a correlation between our actions and habitat conditions. Um, our next hypothesis is zooplankton. So we can measure zooplankton biomass and community composition. We really leveraged our existing studies here. Zooplankton sampling is very um, time and labor intensive, uh, but we already do have a good network of zooplankton and we added additional samples to make sure we had samples at all these purple points, at least every two weeks during the action period. Um, and the surveys that helped us out here were CDFW with the Fall Midwater Trawl and Summer Tonet, DWR's Environmental Monitoring Program, and the Directed Outflow Project, which was a special study funded by Reclamation. Now, because these were several studies we had to mesh together, we had slightly different gears, um, slightly different methods of collecting the samples, um, and different laboratories processing the samples. They were all similar, but not exactly the same. It wasn't a matter of like, you just get one Excel file and you can add it together. Uh, especially where, you know, one group identified things to genus and the other one did it to species. There had to be a little bit of magic to get all the data to talk to each other. Um, so this is where I put in a plug for the Interagency Ecological Program Synthesis Team. Um, and Sam Shevkin in particular with the, who is now with the, uh, State Water Resources Control Board headed up a great project to integrate zooplankton data from across the system so we can now use our integrated data set to answer this question as well as many other questions. Uh, so we could get a um, graph by year of Sassoon Bay, Sassoon Marsh, and the river uh, abundance and biomass of calanoid copepods so we can compare did we see an increase in biomass in years with the gate action or not? Um, our next hypothesis was on grizzly bay habitat. Uh, so again, the gates are off the chart over here. Um, and we were hoping to see an effect of the gate action all the way in grizzly bay. This is an extended shallow bay with high turbidity and cool temperatures that has historically been really good for smelt. Um, but we don't have great, or we didn't have great monitoring uh, throughout the bay because it's very shallow and hard to get into. We did, however, put in a couple of new songs, um, GZM, GZB, and Thule Red are all within the last five years that we installed those specifically to try and pick up a signal from this action. We can also use hindcast modeling to fill in the gaps. We don't have songs. But all that stuff on habitat and zooplankton and turbidity is just a proxy. What we really care about is not actually delta smelt habitat, it's delta smelt. Um, so we'd love to be able to monitor improvements to delta smelt growth, survival, population status. As many people have told you over the past few meetings, delta smelt are very hard to catch, they're very rare. Uh, the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program, EDSM, uh, does Kodiak trawls at random sites throughout the estuary on a regular basis. And they're pretty much the only survey regularly catching smelt these days, uh, even though they don't catch a ton. Uh, and when the um, BIOPS and ITP were uh, revised in 2019, 2020, and this whole action started, they were no one was catching any smelt and we were like, how are we ever gonna evaluate this action? Fortunately, the experimental release of Delta smelt over the past few years, um, over almost 200,000 have been released so far, has really increased the number of smelt we're recatching. Um, right now they are taking a you know experimental approach to these releases to try and go to a point of supplementing the population Personally, I would love to be able to get to a point where we have enough smelt that we can specifically release some smelt in Sassoon Marsh during this action. We're not there yet, but uh, they've really helped increase our smelt catch. Uh, so with what smelt we did catch, and this is just a plot of all the smelt that were caught during last year's summer fall habitat period, 10 of them, but you know, one was in the marsh while we were operating the gates, and there were several in Grizzly Bay during the action. So it was, you know, point in the right direction. 
uh, we also not only just catch the smell, but there's a lot of, every smell is precious. Um, and it all goes to um, researchers who analyze diet, um, liver glycogen, health metrics, sometimes things like gill histology, liver histology, uh, lots of information is get, gotten from those smells. Um, so we don't have a lot of information, don't have a lot of wild smelt, but we get as much information from them as we possibly can. Because we don't have a lot of wild smelt, um, and we're not to a point where we can release a bunch of smelts in the marsh during the action, we have a smaller number of smelts raised in the hatchery that we keep, that at least this last year, we kept in enclosures. Uh, last year was the first time we did an enclosure experiment during an action. Um, we had two sites, one in Montezuma Slough, where uh, we expected the gate action to freshen things, one over in Sacramento River, which is our sort of control site. Uh, left them out for six weeks in enclosures, measured growth, survival, liver glycogen, critical thermal maximum, and diets. And we do want to expand this and repeat it in future years. This year, we actually were interested in differences between sites, but our primary goal was to try and figure out a way to reduce biofouling, because uh, previous times we've tried change experiments in the summer, they got so covered in gunk and algae and critters that we felt like the smell weren't really in their natural environment. They were in a box full of algae. Um, so we did some experiments to try and reduce biofouling. Uh, we, this is, if you want to see some gunky cages, you can like barely see the sun through that one. That's the one that we didn't have the biofouling treatment on. This one, we reduced biofouling somewhat. Um, what we found, and this is just some preliminary data, uh, our lab control at the fish culture facility is a smell condition factor on the y-axis. Um, we're definitely doing better than the ones in the field. We didn't see a difference between biofilic treatments. And Rio Vista, the smelt actually grew more than the ones in Sassoon. We're still working through this data, trying to figure out what it means. Could be because Sassoon was actually warmer this year. Um, but we are excited to try this again this year when we're expecting another action. So um, kind of our future directions, things we're working on for the future. Uh, we're gonna be repeating that enclosure study to figure out if there are different ways of doing it, uh, figure out if we see the same effect of you know lower growth in Sassoon and Rio Vista. We're also looking at our phytoplankton data collection. We've been collecting phytoplankton for enumeration, um, but you know, smelt don't eat phytoplankton, eat zooplankton. And can we say enough about the effect of phytoplankton on zooplankton to make it worth our time to collect that? Um, we're also looking at those sons in Grizzly Bay, assessing whether we need all of them uh, because they are pretty difficult to maintain and uh, giving us somewhat similar data. Um, and we're looking at potentially putting new flow monitoring station in the western end of Montezuma Slough. You know, that's the blow actions, um, but Britt also introduced these food subsidy actions, which we are working on. So North Delta food subsidy is the one that we've actually been able to do a couple of times. Um, basic question is, does these augmented flow pulses in the fall transport all of the delicious phytoplankton and zooplankton that grow out in the old bypass down into the cash slough region where it can be available to smelt? Normally during the summer, you actually have net uh, negative flows. Things are moving upstream because of all the agricultural withdrawals. So we can get even just a short term pulse of water downstream that might transport some of that productive zooplankton. Um, and so uh, there's been monitoring both in years when we do a flow pulse and sort of baseline monitoring on water quality, phytoplankton, zooplankton throughout this whole region. Um, all the way up to Calouse Basin before, during, and after the flow pulses in the summer and fall, um, as well as modeling the hydrodynamics to go with this. For the um, managed wetland special study, um, as Britt mentioned, we've contracted with UC Davis to get a better handle on what the current amount of productivity on managed wetlands in Sassoon Marsh is. Uh, Sassoon Marsh, if you're not familiar, is a huge area of wetlands. Most of them are managed wetlands and they're managed for waterfowl specifically. 
duck clubs. Um, and they can be really highly productive in, um, especially the spring and winter when they're flooded up, water is kept on them the whole time. Um, but that productivity is just sitting in the pond. It's not out where the fish can get it. And it's, you know, very seasonal. Um, when the ponds dry down, um, you get a lot of the productivity into the surrounding channels. But what's the timing of that? When uh, is things most productive? And can we suggest management changes and incentivize management changes to get more of the duck club managers to, you know, produce food for spelt? Um, so we are working on monthly zooplankton, phytoplankton, water quality, as well as growth rate incubations to look at um, those vital rates that uh, Dr. Reed was asking about earlier um, and trying to see what the timing and appropriate amount of connectivity is uh, because the initial studies showed that, you know, tidal wetlands um, have lower standing stocks of this productivity, but it's available to fish all the time versus managed wetlands where you have much higher levels of productivity um, and biomass, but it's not available to fish at a consistent rate. For the Sacramento Ship Channel, again, looking at using it as a food subsidy for Delta smelt. This is, um, as Britt talked about, a dead end slew with really high zooplankton rate um, biomass, especially towards the top where things are kind of, I don't want to say stagnant, but high residence time, low exchange get a lot of phytoplankton, zooplankton, and stratification. In the middle, you have um, have really high turbidity. It's actually a sort of second estuarine turbidity maximum. And we catch a lot of smelt there year round. There's a year round population of smelt that lives up here. Um, and there was this fertilization experiment to try and kickstart that productivity even more. But um, this would require transporting productivity out of the ship channel would require modifications to the um, gates at the top end to actually allow things to pulse. Um, so uh, Reclamation has contracted with um, Dr. Sadro's lab to do more um, monitoring of primary and secondary productivity in these low exchange and higher exchange zones to see where that productivity is going, is there any way we could use this to increase downstream productivity, uh, as well as phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, and some of the mm -hmm. roll critters at the base of the food web. So um, next steps for the North Delta food subsidy, uh, we're working on a stable isotope study to see is are things from the wetland really being transported downstream and incorporated into tissues? Uh, and um, using caged enclosures of delta smelt to look at thermal suitability uh, across the landscape. Uh, for the managed wetland study, we're finishing up the special study um, with UC Davis and then thinking about landowner outreach and um, incorporating their feedback in potential changes to management, figure out how to incentivize changes in management. Um, but working on making sure we have enough data first to come to them with um, ideas. On the SHIP channel, uh, we're working with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to um, NUSGS to look at some bioenergetics modeling to try and figure out why this area is such a hotspot for smells. Because in some ways, you wouldn't think of it as a smell hotspot. Uh, there's also you know, work with Port of West Sacramento and the U.S. Army Corps are working on design alternatives for um, the locks at the North End. And I believe I am going to be going over to modeling and then take questions. No. Okay. May need you to. I can change the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Five. Pause. Can I ask you, are the smelt that are in the that you're finding the turbid areas wild? Um, the turbid areas of the ship channel, yeah. Uh, so 
the past, what, two years, three years, we've had the experimental releases. There have been very, so, in terms of, over the past three years, no, they've mostly been um, the hatchery releases or they're the offspring of the hatchery releases. Prior to the experimental releases starting, the ship channel was like the only place we were catching any smelt at all. Um, you know, it was be like 90% of the smelt catch would be in the ship channel. Um, and now that the experimental releases are starting, um, we're still catching a few wild smelt or ones that have at least one wild parent, uh, but it's still pretty hard to catch. Okay. Well, hopefully you're not tired of me because you get a little more of me um, and then we'll have an open discussion with lots more people. So that was all of the monitoring data. But once we have that data, what do we do with it? And um, for this presentation, I was asked to talk about um, how we are using that data to parameterize our models, both um, planning models and real-time models. So most of the modeling that has been done for the summer fall habitat action is planning models. There are some real-time modeling that happens during the action, but mostly um, the modeling is done in a structured decision-making framework to figure out what, uh, exactly how to implement the action. And um, then there is more statistical modeling done afterward to evaluate the effectiveness of the action. So um, we have this suite of actions that are intended to benefit Delta smelt, but we need to figure out what benefits are gonna come from the actions. So we put together all of these models of um, zooplankton, water quality, uh, hydrodynamics um, to give us what type of smelt growth we can expect from um, potential different management actions. And maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works, right? It's exactly how it works. Like, um, you know, a whole bunch of us in a room with this machine and we cram everything down in there and somehow some like numbers come out. It's great. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely not something that was just me with my machine doing. Um, there was a lot of coordination and a lot of players involved. Um, management guidance on what models should we use, what metrics are important, what are our objectives, uh, and then evaluating, okay, which combination of actions will work, um, come mainly from the Delta Coordination Group, uh, which is this interagency team of um, federal state agencies and water contractors to give recommendations. Then the final decision is made by the um, agency leadership from Reclamation, DWR, and uh, CDFW. Um, but that's kind of like a lot of big people who often don't have time to like actually do math. So we also really relied on um, technical sub teams, uh, many of which were pulled from the interagency ecological program, project work teams. Um, and the modeling and research arms of uh, the various participating agencies. So um, going back to our fancy, um, overly complicated uh, adopter management wheel, we talked about monitoring, which was in kind of the center of the wheel, which I personally think that that little arm is too small. It should be bigger. Now we're talking about the planning and the structured decision making where we take all of the monitoring metrics and data and use it to see what we want to do. Um, and in terms of like what we're actually testing, we have these different management actions and each of those management actions has various variations we might want to test. So for the North Delta food subsidy, we could use agricultural uh, drainage water or we could use Sacramento River water. We could do like a really quick high intensity pulse or a longer, uh, lower intensity pulse. Um, and just in terms of timing, Sacramento River water, we do that in the summer. The agricultural water would be later in the year. 
uh, the salinity control gates. We need 60 days, sometimes between June and October, but do we want to do it like all at once starting in June, all at once starting in September, or do we want to do like seven days on, seven days off to stretch that uh, fresh water a little further? Um, Fall X2, we don't really have options for implementation there, but we want to include it in our model so that we know the potential synergistic benefits of having X2 and salinity control gates in various configurations. Um, the additional 100,000 acre feet block of water is one of the ones with the most options. You know, it's not prescribed, you need to do this with this water. It's just, it's a block of water that CDFW gets to decide, you know what, we want more gate actions. We want to defer it to next year. Um, we want it as outflow. Um, and so they have the final call on this block, but the Delta coordination group can discuss different options. We're doing that tomorrow. And then the deep water ship channel and managed wetlands actions, they're not really ready for prime time. So we did not evaluate those in this framework, but they are potential for future years. And in terms of performance measures, someone was asking about performance measures earlier. Um, we have a number of them to see how they get to our ultimate objective of increasing smelt growth. Uh, they are increasing smelt food, which means zooplankton, primarily calanoid copepods, particularly Pseudodiaptimus forbici, um, which say that 10 times fast, Pseudodiaptimus. Uh, but they're smelt's favorite food. Increased delta smelt habitat. And here we use a habitat suitability index made up of turbidity, temperature, um, current speed, and salinity. That's the last one. Um, increased delta smelt growth and survival. And here we are really talking about increasing delta smelt growth. We have very um, short term actions over a small spatial footprint. Uh, so it doesn't work well to try and scale it up to a population level response. Instead, we focus like, okay, if smelts are in this area, how much will they grow over the summer in these different parameters? Minimizing water cost using our hydrodynamic modeling. Minimize contaminant toxicity. Here we used expert opinion. We don't have good models that we can use here. Minimize impacts to other species. Again, relied on expert opinion because we don't have appropriate models. And then increase our abilities to learn in the future. It's always easy to say, well, let's not do anything because we're afraid of messing things up, but then you're never gonna learn what will happen. So once we kind of had our performance measures outlined and our objectives in mind, we started our modeling exercise. And here we started with a conceptual model. So we have our actions on the left-hand side. And we have our end goals, um, the individual uh, performance measures and the final ultimate objective, increasing delta smell recruitment. And we did you know, some box and arrow spaghetti diagramming of, okay, so how do we think each action is going to result in the performance measures we're interested in? Just you know, in words, how do we conceptualize this process? But once we had this conceptual model, we need to figure out like, okay, how do we put numbers on this? Because it's easier to uh, really weigh the cost and benefits when we can quantify it at least roughly. So we do a lot of monitoring um, and I have all of our input data in green over here. That's the things we're actually measuring. But most of the things we measure aren't actually our performance measures. Uh, you know, we can't go out there and measure delta smelt growth. We have to measure something, um, catch of delta smelt or temperature that we can then use to calculate delta smelt growth. Um, so how then, what models do we need to use to get from our, the things we're measuring to our actual performance measures? Well, we have a lot of models, as we heard about this morning. So the Delta Simulation Model 2 uh, will take the water forecast and give us potential water cost of these actions. It'll also give us Delta Flow, which if we combine with um, expert elicitation, which means talking to a bunch of people who know what they're talking about, 
um, to get us impact of salmonids. We can take those delta flow parameters from DSM2 and use them to parameterize um, a three-dimensional hydrodynamic model along with um, observed turbidity and temperature to get a smelt habitat model um, and end up with area of potential delta smelt habitat for different options. Um, we can also use that flow and uh, salinity that comes out of that flow to parameterize some zooplankton models uh, to give us zooplankton abundance. All of those models go into a bioenergetics-based habitat suitability index um, through the individual based delta smelt model in R, IBMR, uh, to get individual delta smelt growth. Contaminants, again, we don't have great models, so this was an expert elicitation. I'm now gonna walk you through each of these models, um, give you a little more information. Uh, if you want a lot more information, we have lots of documentation for all of them. Hydrodynamics, starting with DSM2, you were introduced to this morning. It's a one dimensional model. And probably a little hard to see, but all the little dots on this grid are nodes in this model. So we can calculate flow, water quality, do particle tracking, uh, but they're all based on these nodes. Um, it is a one dimensional model. But we can use that input to parameterize a three dimensional model, the semi-implicit cross-scale hydroscience integrated system model. I'm sure they work very hard on that acronym. Much easier to say schism. Uh, and it'll give you the 3D hydrodynamics um, transport of constituents. And this is what we use to um, calculate salinity and current speed. Uh, we used observed temperature and turbidity and interpolated between those to get us our delta smelt habitat. And this could give us you know, our forecast flows. Um, on the right-hand side, we have flow in the yellow bypass that was used to um, help parameterize our model of the North Delta flow action. And on the left here, we have the salinity at Belden's Landing, which is one of our compliance points for this action. And we can evaluate different combinations of uh, gate actions, like seven days on, seven days off, starting on the spring tide, starting on the neap tide, 10 days on, 10 days off, operating continuously, and do all the things to try and see what is going to give you the best salinity at Belden's Landing. But even more fun, we can uh, use the temperature, turbidity, and salinity to actually see what is the entire landscape like of smelt habitat, not just at single points, but across the entire region. We can calculate total area, um, habitat suitability by area, to see how much boost we get from our different uh, flow actions. So we can use this forecast to try and predict what we might have, but you never really know what the summer is going to bring, especially in terms of temperature. Uh, we can also do a hindcast um, using the observed temperature uh, when we are operating the gate. So this is what we actually saw versus we can use schism to turn the gates off. And with the same conditions that we had last summer, what kind of habitat did we get? And look at the difference. So we can see the benefit of um, our habitat action from this past year. And this is just the number of days that we're in suitable habitat for delta smelt. So that's habitat. The other important thing for smelt is food. Um, biology is always more complicated than hydrology. Um, you know, even predicting temperature, uh, predicting zooplankton is way harder than predicting temperature. Um, the individual based model in R that we use to uh, you model delta smelt growth categorize zooplankton in uh, 12 different categories of things smelt eat at varying rates. Pseudodap is forbicides, is one on the bottom here, smelt's favorite. Um, and most of these have some kind of relationship to salinity. Um, when you're in Sassoon Marsh, you get more pseudodiaptimus at lower salinities versus say uh, Cartiella sort of maximizing mid salinities. So um, with the help of the interagency ecological program, um, flow alteration project work team, uh, especially Sabah Shevgan, who is um, an excellent zooplankton wrangler, uh, calculated a series of generalized additive models, one for each of these taxonomic groups to uh, predict, okay, what will the 
the predicted change in salinity mean in terms of predicted change in zooplankton. And we could, you know, put a bunch of scenarios on our um, x-axis here and calculate how much improvement in zooplankton we would get for each of the scenarios in Sassoon Marsh. So that was all of the bits. But the ultimate goal, again, is delta smelt. Um, and so we needed to take the smelt habitat and the smelt food and scale them up to smelt growth. Uh, after a lot of different, um, we did a review of like all the different smelt models that are out there. There's a lot of smelt models out there. Um, you know, the, the life cycle model has come up a couple of times and um, that is generally referring to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, population model, which is uh, on a longer time step and it's for the whole delta. We were concerned that because our actions are very spatially pretty darn small um, and uh, short in time that we might not have the sensitivity to see a population level effect in our model from just one year of an action. So we used a bioenergetics based model. Um, this is based on the individual model that uh, Dr. Kenneth Rose developed a few years ago and has been expanded on by um, Will Smith and Matt Nelberga uh, to be better. Um, short answer. Uh, and it takes various foraging conditions like water temperature, um, day length, prey density. Just recently they added turbidity as an important factor. Um, whole bunch of bioenergetics processes to look at increase in growth rate of delta smelt over the entire summer. So we could put in all of the input parameters from smelt habitat, zooplankton, uh, into this model and get the potential increase in growth in millimeters for delta smelt over the course of the summer. Contaminants, as I mentioned, we don't have a great model of contaminants. Um, contaminants are always changing. Um, they are expensive to monitor. Uh, it is difficult to even come up with a monitoring plan. You need to choose which ones you're interested in. Are you doing toxicity? Are you doing uh, concentrations? Um, and we also don't have great data on what this huge suite of contaminants out there will actually do to Delta smelt and their prey resources. Um, so, there's been a lot of special studies on contaminants, uh, but not we haven't quite gotten to the point where we can put all of those into a model of what these actions will do. So instead, we um, reached out to the contaminants project work team and got a group of uh, experts to give um, an estimate on a constructed scale of it was negative three to one of the potential impact of um, our actions on the different performance factors in terms of zooplankton survival and quality, delta smelt growth, delta smelt survival, um, et cetera. Our conceptual model was that the North Delta flow action would probably have a bigger effect on contaminants than the salinity control gates because they are uh, mobilizing things in an agricultural area where you tend to get a lot of contaminants. Um, and the source water for that action was gonna also be important. So we got um, experts to kind of weigh in on this constructive scale, how they thought the actions might change contaminants and therefore um, smelt. Similar process for effects to other species. Um, and the other species we were most interested in was salmon and sturgeon. Uh, we knew that these actions might change um, migration patterns. Uh, they might impact contaminants. Uh, they might impact food support. Um, so we got experts from different agencies, four different agencies uh, to weigh in on what they thought. But there was really high uncertainty. We got you know people to put their predicted numbers onto a um, input table that we could analyze. And mostly people thought the effects would be relatively minor. In terms of learning, we had three sort of categories of learning that we rated um, our different options on is one in terms of feasibility, like there's some actions we've never done before. If we decide to do them this year, we'll learn whether or not they're possible. That would be awesome. 
Uh, for a lot of the other ones, it was more in terms of effectiveness. Did our, did we actually see the effect we were looking for? We don't do an action. We're not going to know whether the action is effective. And then um, there's some actions that we'll learn more if we have more special studies associated with that. Once we had all of that modeling done, all those performance measures quantified, we put them in a really fancy table using this um, online tool supported by um, Compass uh, to visualize the outcomes of the alternatives. You know, if you'd go select an alternative and see which ones were better and which ones were worse. Um, and the Delta Coordination Group had a number of in-depth discussions about the trade-offs, the positives, the negatives, potential risks, what the big uncertainties were, what we didn't have enough information, talked a lot about contaminants. Um, and once we kind of got the group to really understand the modeling process, um, the DCG came up with a recommendation. Uh, and we also had to take water year type into consideration, certain things that could only be done on certain water year types. We came up with a recommendation and then it was like, wait till May 15th, May 1st, May 1st, um, when the water year type is officially announced. And then we can decide exactly what we're doing. So that was all the planning modeling that we did. Um, we also have some things that we do using real time modeling. Um, not as much as like the OMR um, management, but one of the major things is the position of X2. Um, we do not, we have a lot of SONs, we have a lot of measurements out there, but we don't have the entire system with salinity measurements on it. So um, X2 is calculated with a basic linear regression between several known points um, and the folks in our operations team do a lot of um, magic to try and coordinate all of the exports, inflows, outflows to keep X2 approximately where it needs to be. Um, the other thing that we were looking at in near real time was water cost. We did also uh, forecast water cost for the different parameters, but um, as Brett explained this past year, we operated the salinity control gates with this extra 100,000 acre foot block of water that CDFW had to do with what they wanted. And they said, okay, operate the control gates. And instead of 60 days, it's 100,000 acre feet. So we're like, okay, how do we tell when we've used 100,000 acre feet? This isn't, this is to me not being into water project operations at first. I'm like, well, you just, turn it on until you've used 100,000 acre feet, right? No, all of the coordinated operations, you know, you're dealing with multiple salinity compliance points, um, multiple flow compliance points, all of the upstream and diversions, and you can't just turn on a switch and then turn it off when you've used 100,000 acre feet. So um, the reason why the salinity control gates costs water at all is that um, when the gates are operating, it's pumping fresh water into the marsh. That fresh water is no longer going out into the bay. And uh, that means that if fresh water is going in here, we need extra fresh water to go out there to keep X2 where it needs to be, or other salinity compliance points if X2 isn't um, a factor in that particular time period. So what our um, operations modelers were doing is once a week, they would um, use DSM-2 to run a bunch of simulations with different levels of outflow to see what um, the change in uh, salinity at Collinsville would be and use that to uh, create a linear regression for the difference in salinity versus outflow uh, to calculate how much water we had used. Um, so this was used to control when we stopped our salinity control gate action last year. In terms of future directions for modeling, um, we could definitely use some work on the zooplankton flow relationships. That's um, an area of active research. As Christy mentioned, improving some of the bioenergetic modeling, that's also a active and continually evolving model. Um, and Will Smith and Matt Nabriga, um, and the folks at Fish and Wildlife Service are great at taking feedback and making additions to that. 
um, adjusting temperature suitability curves. Historically, there was some work that said 25 degrees was the kind of limit for adult smelt, but that's like when they start dying and we'd like them to like do well, not just mm -hmm. not die. So working on um, figuring out what level of temperature is appropriate. Um, the X2 calculations right now, it's a pretty basic uh, linear regression and there has been some recent feedback that we should be uh, using more different um, salinity uh, sons to calculate that. Uh, and then incorporating the results of some of our special studies like our cage experiments, um, some of the uh, physiology studies of delta smell, some of the contaminant studies to um, improve all of our models. And I think that's all of me. And so now we can go to the panel and um, give some other folks a chance to weigh in. Thank you, where's my That was really great. And it's also good just to see the critical central role that IEP play in the system in terms of synthesis, which we've heard so much about. So if we could perhaps uh, invite the um, uh, Christy and Brittany and anyone else you think could be useful. Uh, we've got five seats at the front, please. You asked me several times. Maybe you can come along. In case somebody has a question for you, Matt. And we invite. I think it's awesome that we have all these young scientists. I can answer questions if they want. Actually, why don't you sit up here and see how the questions go? That sounds great. I think Fred needs to come through. Should we have enough seats? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, actually, why don't we just do one panel and we can hit yeah. both the, the, the questions. So, yeah, please yeah. Sit, sit, do sit at the front. Scott? We also have an additional panelist. We have Ben Yvonne from our technical services center in Denver. He's on the line. And he does our screen monitoring. Oh, yeah. If anyone has questions about this, no. You're a young scientist, Fred. Yes. <laughs> well, Fred, no need to be shy. Sorry, Fred. I don't know. Sean, I don't think we're ready. ready. Yeah, that's all I was wondering. Yeah. She, she, they said for me to help you. I was like, no, why am I coming here? No. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Am I here in the right place, Mark? You're in the right place. Where's Fred? I'm not here. Okay, okay our questions on the expert elicitation, Sean. Huh? Maybe we'll put those to you. Sean. Yes, for sure. Anything on the contaminants? <laughs> so part of the goal to the committee's knowledge was to expand the Q&A beyond the two action agencies who we asked to make these lengthy presentations and give us a lot of the details because we want to be as inclusive as possible and we realize that the action agencies aren't the only <laughs> agencies and groups thinking about these two particular things so uh, we'll do the same thing tomorrow with OMR we'll have more than just the people who gave the presentations to help answer questions. Well, thank you. And Pyro, uh, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to start with the questions? Thank you, So this is, I guess, for anybody on the panel who'd like to address it. And it's um, kind of an open-ended question or comment, but it seems like you've got a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing where the bottleneck for these fish is between juveniles to subadults to adults, but none of your performance metrics for your actions are for bottleneck between juveniles to subadults to adults. So it seems like it's really hard to assess when, whether or not these actions would be beneficial. And then I heard some people say, well, maybe the supplemented fish can help us with that, but then we'd only be able to use the progeny of the supplemented fish as a performance metric, or maybe not even that, maybe just the progeny of the progeny of the supplemented yeah, so that was definitely something that there was a lot of discussion about um, getting at Delta smelt recruitment is like an ultimate goal, but taking our uh, individual based model through, you know, the lifespan 
um, would probably lead to uh, reducing the sensitivity to relatively small actions. Um, so we decided, that's why we decided to just use growth and make the assumption that improved growth would lead to improved survival and improved reproduction the next year. Uh, in terms of the supplementation, we have so few wild fish right now. Like, we need something, and right now they're our best proxy. And the work that um, the culture and supplementation of smelts team, inter another interagency team, is doing to try and get to the point where we almost have a situation like we have with salmon, where we're releasing fish on a regular basis to supplement the population. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that hatchery raised fish are going to be a, a cultured fish, as I should call them, are going to be an ongoing part of the, the future of smelt in the estuary. And we need to use them where we can. And saying, oh, we will only now know about cultured fish and not wild fish. It's they're such they're going to be such a huge part that we might as well learn about them is where how I see it. I don't know if Britt, you want to weigh in or anyone else. I think to add, other panelists like to add I think to Rosemary's response. Okay. Actually sure. Yeah. So I think what you're really getting at there is really the way that we have implemented adaptive management in the Delta, um, particularly on some of these specific actions. And um, and I think the 4X2 action is a, is a fairly good one because it's been around for a long time. Um, I, I don't think the objectives for that action were ever clearly specified and then kept changing. I don't think we really set up a monitoring scheme to really, to your point, to really tell if it was working. And I think the general concern is that um, we haven't, I, I, I don't think our conceptual models are right, and I think they need to be reevaluated. Um, from you know, the perspective that my group's been coming from is one of limiting factors to trying to figure out you know, what factors are limiting the recovery of delta smelt when. And that's really hard because those things keep changing. Some years it's warm summer temperatures, other years it's like um, you know, lack of food or whatever. So it's it, when specifying you know, our action, we've got to be thinking about what those limiting factors are and whether or not we can um, develop a monitoring program that's good enough to catch that. The, what we, you've heard a lot about um, abiotic habitat. And I have a very dear friend that says, who happens to be a um, professor and Pew scholar and um, Stanford PhD, so there's no such thing as abiotic habitat, right? There is this, so the way it's been described so far is that, you know, it's that area where we've got satisfactory salinity, turbidity, and temperature. Consistently left out of that is food. If you don't have enough food, it's not habitat. That's really being missed in this whole conversation because the logical question then is, well, how much food do we need? Well, we've, we, we've addressed that in different papers, right? But for, for sake of argument in the fall, let's say it's 4,000 micrograms of carbon uh, per cubic meter, right? So you can have this great action where you move, um, you, you, you move more water into the system, you increase the area of the low salinity zone, but you, and you actually do move some food downstream, but you never move enough food downstream for smelt to survive in Sassoon Bay. So it's not habitat. You actually haven't done anything. You've taken the food from where it was good and you moved it downstream to where it was always inadequate. And Wim Kimmerer can tell you a lot more about that, about the lack of food supply since the clams moved in. And, and Sassoon Bay used to be a really great place for, for Delta smelt before the clams. It, it, that old conceptual model was great, but since the clams moved in, it's decimated the food supply in the fall in Sassoon Bay. So until we start like challenging our thinking about this and reevaluating our conceptual models, I'm not sure we're going to get to the right place. I thought Rosemary's graph, you know, when she showed what was going on in, in Rio Vista, those two graphs, right? 
what was going on in Rio Vista as in, in the cage as first down in Sassoon Bay. And the growth in, in Rio Vista in the upper Sacramento was higher. Well, it's totally consistent with our conceptual model because that's where the food is, right? There was never enough food down in Sassoon Bay. So I just, I, it's, you know, I know it's controversial, but I think we need to be able to set up these forums where we can really have these sort of discussions. Thank you, Scott. I would like to respond to two things there, is that um, the uh, results in 2019 were the opposite, where we found higher growth in Sassoon Marsh than in Sassoon Bay. And um, I forget what my second point was. Oh, the, our other hypothesis for why we saw those differences in growth was that it was warmer in Sassoon Marsh than in Rio Vista. And that flip-flops, like some years it's warmer, some years it's not. So it's me. Yeah, and I, I would add one thing. Um, you know, it's diving deeper into potentially, um, you know, the conceptual model from what IEP 2015, that mass model, that's on the Delta Coordination Group's um, sort of science activities to dive into this next year. And what are we missing? You know, how are things evolving? Um, you know, so, um, you know, I think in general, we're interested in, you know, recommendations or gaps um, that you're seeing that maybe you could uh, recommend some focus on. Or alternative strategies. Yeah. You know, we, we've got a toolbox of six, uh, three, four-ish, which can be implemented. You know, the North Delta, you know, that is highly uh, managed adaptively, um, you know, and we aren't seeing the results that we anticipated in our pivoting to um, see what else we can do for food subsidies but food does seem to be a major driver. Thank you. So come to this side, Albert, and then we'll go to Jared on the other side. Thanks for really interesting presentations. Uh, I understand the need to address the food limitation aspect to increase growth rates. Uh, and I really appreciate the food web perspective uh, on that. Um, but I was wondering about the broader food web effects that that could have. Uh, so, for example, to what extent are we selling the impacts or benefits of these actions to uh, other key members of the food web, like competitors or mainly predators of um, Delta Smell? But do we know anything about that? And then uh, in, this morning we saw some, um, I think, uh, clear evidence about whether increases in food availability would benefit or impact the food web structure. And I think you talked about uh, limited statistical power. Uh, but I was wondering if, if it's not clear that 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 increase in what the weight is benefiting Delta Smell, where do we think that energy is going? Like what's happening? Do you think what do you think is happening in the broader pool? Yeah, um, I love that question. Uh, it's complicated. I mean, I I consider myself a food web ecologist. I love taking the broad view of it. And the broader you get, the more complicated it gets uh, in terms of predators. Um, that has been a topic of hot debate in the community for a very long time. There's been a lot of research on it. And there's never been a real satisfactory, this is the smoking gun. Um, I do know that uh, Matt published a very interesting paper a couple years ago, like hypothesizing that striped bass predation has been a major factor impacting Delta smelt broad scale. Um, and that prior to... 30 years ago, everything else was doing well enough that the impact of striped bass predation wasn't decimating Delta smelt. You know, they weren't doing great, but they were, they were fine. But then other factors have now synergistically um, impacting smelt. Competitors is, competition is a very hard thing to show empirically. Um, we obviously have lots and lots and lots of non-native competitors. Um, I'm pulling this number out of my head, so maybe Fred could correct me if I get it wrong, but something like 95% of the fish in the Delta, both in terms of biomass and numbers is non-native. So like most of the pelagic community are shad, more shad, silver sides, juvenile striped bass, um, gobies, uh, the larval gobies are everywhere. So competitors are definitely an issue in terms of like, where is food going if not to smelt, come to all the rest of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna mention on top of that, there's a, a 
the kind of specific species, uh, Wakasaki, mm -hmm. um, invasive species Wakasaki, very similar. Um, a recent synthesis, you know, suggests really overlap in um, sort of this ecological niche. Um, uh, where smelt are often caught in the ship channel, high, I think Brian Maharsh is here, right? High, high catches of Wakasaki. Um, invasive Mississippi silver sides are a, a big problem as well. So there, there is likely that, um, you know, heavy competitor impact on if we are creating some sort of food subsidy, is it even making an impact on what few smelt might be present? Any other? Comments from committee members. If not, uh, Jared, perhaps we can come over to you and then Stephen will come back to the other side of the room. Yeah, thank you. So, on a different topic, um, and it was, you know, motivated by the discussion about the new <laughs> enrichment this morning in the ship channel uh, and about your monitoring um, and the salinity. So, thinking about estuaries. They stratify, the, you know, does this system stratify? And then with higher production, you know, you have more carbon and potential for low DO. Is there, is, and, and I didn't hear anything about monitoring DO in the system. So is there, is there low DO? Is there potential for low DO? Um, kind of what role is that? I'll, very good question. And as someone who was raised on the Chesapeake Bay and was indoctrinated with the idea that eutrophication nutrients are bad, they cause algal blooms, they cause DO, the delta is a really weird place. We have very little stratification. The ship channel is one of the few places where it does stratify sometimes. Um, we have high turbidity. We seem to have lots of nutrients. Nutrients don't tend to limit algal production. There, it's thought to be light limited in most cases, and we don't have eutrophication. We have not enough production. Most places you want to reduce phytoplankton production. Here we're trying to increase it. Um, we have recently started having some problems with harmful algal blooms in the summer in areas with long residence time, but uh, so far we haven't had major low dissolved oxygen concerns. The only places where there have been low DO concerns is actually in Sassoon Marsh when some of those managed wetlands are draining. Sometimes material that's been sitting on that wetland doing nothing for a long time, you do get super high productivity that causes local low DO. Um, that has mostly been remediated with just minor changes to management um, and sort of staggering releases to stop really low DO water from getting out into Sassoon Marsh. Uh, and the other place where there had historically been a low DO problem was the Stockton ship channel um, in the dead end place where we did get stratification. Um, there had historic, and there's also wastewater treatment plant nearby. And historically there was some problems with low DO, but they installed aerators and um, increased, uh, put in some extra monitoring equipment to you know, test when DO might be coming a problem. But overall, unlike so many estuaries, we don't have a eutrophication problem and we don't have low dissolved oxygen problems. Uh, Brian, did you want to add to that? Uh, um, uh, well, Brian, perhaps you could just introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Brian Bergamoski. I'm with the US Geological uh, Survey. I'm a biogeochemist working on uh, phytoplankton productivity and nutrient, nutrient turnover in the Delta. Um, so we, um, the the issue of of our conceptual models and the carbon production in our system, I think we've confined these uh, conversations solely to the idea that chlorophyll biomass is the representation of both productivity and carbon supply. And we we know from the basic mass balance calculations we do in this estuary that a lot of our estuary is supported by um, uh, detrital material. Um, export of uh, detrital material from tidal wetland systems, export from the river, particularly particulate detrital material. Some estimates are up to 80% of the energetics of the estuary. It's a heterotrophic estuary. We don't have much productivity in our estuary and what productivity we had collapsed. So 
I, I mean, I think we need to readjust our conceptual models to include the idea that that we can get these large pulses of um, allophanous organic material into the estuary that may have, uh, you know, salubrious effects of one point, one kind or another. An example is the the yellow bypass is flooded right now. We see on the recessional phase of the yellow bypass, we um, sometimes, but not always, see a massive transport of material out of that into the estuary. Um, it, but the the you know the modality of interaction with the bypass is important in terms of producing that stuff and exporting it. We also see that uh, we, we don't we we just have no clear idea because we measure chlorophyll and chlorophyll fluorescence only what the phytodetroidal component is that is supplying to the estuary. So I suggest we might consider uh, the basics, the fundamentals of our conceptual models and. We have the data to be able to do some of this stuff. We're just to look at productivity, and um, we're just not doing it right now. To add to that, um, Yolo Bypass is another place where occasionally there have been low DO problems, yeah, yeah. especially when you have a flow pulse in the fall um, on a drier year. Uh, and I would just like to say we're not just doing chlorophyll. We've got a lot of phytoplankton taxonomy. Um, we're, we're now all of our sons that get um, chlorophyll also have um, phycocyanin probes that actually don't work that well. But um, we have a couple of <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of mm -hmm. flora probes which um, have a broader range of fluorescence. They also seem to keep breaking, but we're trying. Um, and then you know all of our discrete grab samples get not only chlorophyll but also phytophyton, which um, get to some of that detrital component, but detritus is definitely understudied. And one of the backgrounds for why tidal wetland restoration is part of the biological opinions, and you know that's not today's focus, but the whole idea is the Delta used to be all wetlands. And so if detritus is important now, it must have been such the lifeblood of the estuary 200 years ago, We've lost a lot of that. So anything we can do to get that back. Well, to, to further riff on that, um, we also need to keep in mind that all phytoplankton are not the same. Nope. You know, and when we have a big series of blooms here in the system, it was a lacosyra. A lacosyra is a large, highly silicious chain forming diatom. Diatoms are great for the system, not this one. It <laughs> could not be consumed by the, I mean, Wim Kimmerer's work. Uh, his crew showed that they don't support zooplankton production. Um, so it's it's complicated. I mean, we, we need to face that. Thank you, Brian. So we go to Stephen and then I'll cross to David on this side. Thanks, everyone. I've, I've got a question on that pivots to the structure of the interagency ecological program itself, actually. I'm kind of curious because this seems to be a group that's working synthetically. And I wonder if you can speak to its structure, how it functions among the different contributing agencies and how the information generated by the group is integrated uh, by the other agencies. Yeah, so unfortunately, I the answer in terms of how it's currently structured may change in a few months that's undergoing some um, potential reorganization that I can't speak to greatly, but um, it was established um, a long time ago in the 70s. <laughs> uh, don't have the history off the top of my head, but um, all the, 74? So. Yeah, sounds right, 74 sounds right. Um, all of the member agencies um, got together, signed a memorandum of understanding, basically to agreeing to collaborative ecological research in the Delta um, with the idea of providing information to help the greater community. Um, a lot of the research is uh, directly funded by the water projects, um, but not all of it. And the way it currently functions, the way I describe it to um, you know, someone in an elevator is that 
Uh, it's the cool kids club. Um, there's no monetary, like you're not applying to IEP for funding. Um, you're coming together because um, you're interested in the system. You want to collaborate with other scientists. Um, each agency sponsors their staff to participate. Um, it's not, there are some, you know, contractual requirements, but a lot of it is voluntary. Um, and we have a uh, group of coordinators, which are higher level managers, um, the agency directors who kind of talk about the broad scale work plan. Uh, this includes all of the major monitoring surveys, as well as a lot of special studies that can be included in the work plan. Um, then there's a lot of uh, smaller teams that are made up of more of the rank and file scientists. We have our science management team that shares information coming out of the um, projects or out of the surveys, um, reviews the special studies coming in, reviews papers, gets together and talks about science. It's really fun. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, specific work teams for particular topics. Uh, and these are open to the public. There'll be a call out like, okay, we're starting a new project work team on tidal wetlands monitoring. Anyone with an interest in tidal wetlands can come. There's presentations on different aspects. Sometimes there'll be work products, like we want to put together a uh, best management practices for tidal wetlands or something like that. Sometimes it's more of just a journal club collaboration. People give presentations and people give feedback. Um, someone says, hey, I'm interested in doing this. Anyone want to work with me? Um, then I run the synthesis team in particular, which uh, focuses on taking disparate data sets and putting them together to answer questions in new ways. Um, so we meet quarterly just to talk broadly. And then um, it's a good place for people to, again, give presentations on this is what I'm trying to do. Has anyone tried this? Um, does anyone want to participate? Uh, and we form these um, ad hoc teams to answer these particular questions. There's been a lot of work over the past five years or so through the data utilization work group as part of IEP and many of these synthesis teams to really start putting our data together, making more of it available online in publicly accessible formats um, with version control and digital object identifiers to make sure that our data is of high quality and usable and findable and used. Um, and that's, you know, individual data sets, but then realizing that we have such a wealth of data that historically had been, well, okay, here's the fall moonwater trawl data and here's the summer tow net data and here's the zooplankton data and the dates on all of them are in different formats. Like, what's out of that? Just an example, I don't actually know if the dates were in different formats, but, probably uh, do. but they probably were. <laughs> they probably um, were. <laughs> so uh, I have now participated in a number of teams of like, okay, let's come up with scripts to go out there and pull down all those separate data sets, make them talk to each other and publish the final integrated data set in a way that people can access it. Um, and so a lot of the inputs to the modeling exercise that we use for making decisions on summer fall habitat action came out of some of those separate, formerly separate data sets that we integrated and you know, made them more than what their original study plan was for. I was just gonna mention that the Interagency Ecological Program actually has a full website with a ton of information, yeah. annual work plan syntheses. There's an IEP newsletter, which is sort of like gray literature for you know, community folks to publish their science findings. All that's available, and I think it was on Delta Stewardship Council website, maybe? But well, IEP is on, it's through, it's like an IEP.ca.gov. It's an official, we got our own thing, uh, but it's through the CBFW is actually okay. on the back end of the, uh, yeah. Thank you. I think that was a great summary and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also a lead scientist and there's engagement with the heads of the agencies. So it's a, a way that the science community, not individual scientists can get information you're up to the directors and vice versa, which I think is a very important function of IEP. So if there's no other comments for the panelists on that topic, uh, David, you're next, and then we'll come across to the knees to over from you.
We're going back. We're jumping around. What? What? We just getting coverage. No. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Oh, thanks. And, and just for the record, it, it's it's Dave. Unless you're looking quite nice. <laughs> so, um, I have a different sort of question, and it, I, this might be a premature question, maybe very premature, but I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of the scale of the potential payoff from these actions that they work. And I think that breaks down both into could you scale them up? Like, is there enough capacity in the system to scale these actions up? Um, and then also, do you have a sense of no reasonable good case scenario of what the payoff for smelt might be. And I'm just trying to get a sense like are these minor demonstration projects that, that, that have to be repeated over and over again, or might we have here a formula for species recovery? I would say these are not a silver bullet. Um, in terms of scalability, it really depends on the action. So like X2 and the salinity control gates, we only have one Sassoon Marsh. We can get it as fresh as you want, but we only have one. Um, can't really scale that or X2. The managed wetlands, North Delta food web actions, there's potentially more room for scale, but still relatively limited. And um, I'll admit that when we did our modeling, putting all of the outputs into the Delta Smell bioenergetics model, we saw that over the course of the entire summer, the difference between not doing an action and doing the best action we could was half a millimeter of growth. And that was a little depressing, but it was also the best we could do. And we do know that all of the model outputs that went into that and the bioenergetics model itself, there's a ton of uncertainty. So, we figured, okay, this doesn't seem like a huge impact, but it is an increase in growth and it's their actions we know we can do. So um, something is better than nothing, but there was definitely a lot of the more um, political discussions on, okay, is that enough to make it worth it? But yeah. So, Peter, if I could, um, so there's been two structured decision-making processes going on, one through the DCG, and there's another one that's being operated by or led by uh, Compass Resource Management. My understanding was that the DCG had a, a more narrow scope. The, the second one, which I participated in, had a much broader scope where we consider a much broader range of management actions. The implementation of those, so, you know, I was talking about the uh, limiting factors before and different um, different problems in different years. So essentially what you needed to do is to put together a suite of actions that would be able to hit essentially in any year, any one of the limiting uh, factors that were going to happen. If you do that, the re population response is enormous. It was like orders of magnitude that we were seeing huge increases in, in Delta smelt numbers. And by far the most critical component there was the summer food supply. So it really meant that you had to you know, and I think we're a little bit limited by our imagination here, right? Because most of Sassoon Marsh is not connected to the estuary, right? Most of it is diked wetlands that does not come into contact with the estuary. If we could just reconnect a lot of that stuff, if we could connect a lot of floodplains upstream, we could restore a lot of the natural functions. And we're really not doing that. But if we could do that, if we could re increase our summer food supply, um, the modeling, and we, we used four different models in our structured decision-making process. One of them was the IBMR model. Um, we had a, another US Fish and Wildlife Service model, the LCME model, um, and then a Monda Dorisa model, and then what we were calling a limited factors model. And surprisingly, they all gave pretty similar results. And when we were able to overcome the summer food problem, they all showed very strong recovery of Delta smell. Publish someplace. Say again. Is this published? No, they're working on the uh, campus is putting a draft. They've got a first draft out now for circulation, and they're not expecting. I think um, Jay a uh, uh, public release one until the end of March. I will say that 
I, you know, both Brittany and I had seen some earlier versions of the, the Compass um, model and we thought that they used a, a unrealistic um, model of zooplankton from the North Delta food subsidy and some other of the zooplankton components. Um, but definitely that's why we are looking at production on these managed wetlands in Sassoon. And it's a big part of the tidal wetland restoration benefit that is being pursued for Delta smelts. Yeah, I was going to say in general, I think that's a great question that, you know, when will there be that payoff? Um, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty, but that's where, you know, this larger adaptive management process comes in. And I don't think we have those thresholds yet of, you know, years down the line, we've done this, we've had enough replication, you know, what are our thresholds to say, okay, this is worth it, or okay, this isn't, you know, the smelter just an annual species. And, you know, you pointed out, you know, this is just part of their life cycle. And, these are probably smaller actions and a lot of uncertainty that Lenny and, and Dave alluded to. We're just sort of fighting off some of these strategies right now that we're going to need to replicate and develop this larger picture, but there is a lot more going on. And uh, the CSAMP, the SDM, it did highlight other, you know, spring actions, summer, fall actions. There's all the OMR management and entrainment. So, you know, this summer, fall, like Rosie mentioned, is, is more narrowly focused. Um, but I think thinking about that larger adaptive management and, and if and when that payoff could come and you know thresholds for that decision are, are something that we need to think about. Could I yeah. just chime in one more time in there? And I don't mean to make an enemy of DWR here. And I love what IEP does. The, the data that IEP generates is hugely important. Um, just a fabulous, fabulous resource. But um, they've been collecting the data for 40 years now. We have seen a huge range of variation through that time in terms of flows, in terms of food production, in terms of fish responses. There is a wealth of information there to harvest, you know, because um, Rosemary was sort of saying, well, we don't have, you know, we, when we're trying to do these small actions, we don't really have enough sort of data points to be really able to come up with conclusive, like um, strong conclusions. But we've got 40 years of data that this actually provides us with a whole lot of insight about what circumstances we're going to see an increase in, in the fish response and when we're not, right? It, it's a rich source of, of data that, that we can harvest and has been harvested. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. Um, try and one comment and then we'll go to the next question. All right. Do you want to wrap this question up? Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I, just to, to comment that um, I, I don't think this is the full range of possible actions. These are just some that we're taking and studying now, and that there are a lot of other possible actions that are perhaps scalable in different ways if we're trying to increase food web supplies, I mean, uh, food supplies to the, to the estuary. In the summertime, there are ones that perhaps come at less water cost. We talk about that a lot in our shop. Um, so it's great that we're testing some, but they're not, you know, we should keep testing them. You know, we should put them on the table and see if they work. Okay, well, thanks, Brian. So we'll go to Aeneas and then Steve. Yes. So he's walking the mic up and down the room. Yes. Hi, thanks. I'm trying to think of a question that Brett could answer. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer everything. I've got one. So, so I actually probably I got want to ask you one about the, about the structure of decision making. Um, uh, because you know the last presentation we talked about how these different things came together in the structure of decision making, and I don't have a lot of direct experience of this, but you obviously did a good job trying out in the one the one that you described, Rosemary, was the the DCG one. Yeah, okay. not the not the not one. the other compass one, one, right? Um, and so um, you obviously did a good job <laughs> trying to get your arms around all of the different factors, right? Even though you had varying levels, some were expert uh, opinions, some were, um, you know, more quantitative, some were 3D hydrodynamic model based, right? And so one thing you, you didn't, you didn't really say much at the end about how the structured decision making informed the decision and what the decision was. Um, but one thing I didn't see in the in the kind of summary graphic that you showed that maybe I'm familiar with Scott from the, from the having seen earlier versions of the other one 
is the idea of uncertainty. And you just started to discuss the idea of uncertainty and we're, we're, we're really good about acknowledging that there is a lot of uncertainty, but could you tell us a little bit more about how that structured decision-making process is being used by the Delta Coordination Group to make these big decisions that use a lot of water? I mean, that was, um, you know, Dave and, uh, this morning said, why are we looking at these three things? There's a lot of water involved in these three things. And, and so we're making decisions about moving a fair amount of water around, you know, on the basis of some expert opinion, um, and combined with 3D models. you see what I mean, what I'm getting at here? Could you say a little bit more about how our confidence or, or lack of confidence that some of you have just expressed independently of this question relative to the different factors that are involved kind of play into that? Um, yes. Um, Does the question make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we had a lot of discussion on uncertainty, lots of discussion. There was a suggestion of trying to quantify that uncertainty somehow, but like other than on a scale of one to five, like it it ended up not being a useful exercise to try and quantify for this group and this particular um, structured decision model. But um, you know what we had was we had our different performance measures. The different scores that either came through the 3D hydrodynamic models or the expert opinion. Um, and, you know, we had some facilitated discussions on, okay, what do we think of this alternative versus that alternative? This alternative versus that alternative. Well, this one is worse for contaminants, but it's better for delta smelt growth. This one is better for delta smelt growth, but worse for salmon. Um, and you know we went around the room and got all of the members feedback inputs their opinions on what counted most <laughs> to them um we also did do a weighting exercise of you know for each agency like would you rather have higher delta smell growth or higher contaminants like took it metric by metric and which is more important to you uh, so we could get a sense of uh, where the different metrics fell in the different agencies' um, minds. Uh, and we did want to come up with a consensus um, recommendation. So there was um, several rounds of polling and finding out, okay, you're not on board with this idea. What would it take? How can we compromise? Um, yeah. Um, anything you want to add? Yeah, I was going to mention um, uh, DWR is is hosting another independent review that's diving deeper into the structured decision making process and the metrics and how we integrated quantitative and qualitative expert elicitation. Um, we've gone through about three iterations now across three years, developed that initial PROACT prototype. Um, the first year, for example, um, we had metrics that Rosie, Rosie kind of gave you a hybrid of a couple iterations there today. Uh, we had water costs um, as a key metric that was discussed. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, the agencies and um, uh, water agencies that were present, um, we really were careful in defining our scope and scope was to benefit smelt. Um, and so in that second year, uh, water cost was removed as a objective knowing that sort of everyone, um, the goal was to benefit smelt and these are mitigation actions in our permits. And so the 100 TAF action is at the discretion of CDFW. Um, fall X2 uh, is required for our permits. The gate actions is required for our permits. And so some agencies um, felt it was inappropriate that we evaluate that. We still included it and have those numbers. And it was particularly helpful for uh, the North Delta food action, seeing using Sacramento River water versus recycled ag water. Um, contaminants, you know, in our, in our second iteration, I think we'll no longer do ag 
pulses. I think, you know, following sort of that adaptive management, we'd pivot, might consider a SAC action just because of what we've learned on contaminants. Um, so through different iterations, some of the objectives have dropped off. Learning was added. We sort of operationalized that in the, uh, the third iteration. If we don't do an action and we don't sort of take a risk of learning, then we'll never know. Um, but each year we define sort of the scope. This year, tomorrow, um, you know, the DCG will be discussing, you know, the suite of actions. It's likely going to be an above normal year. So what does that mean? Fall X2, right? Sassoon Gates, 100, 100 TAF water. And so how are we going to implement all these? What's the scope? Um, you know, will we discuss risk? Will we discuss water costs? Those are sort of defined each year. Um, not all agencies have similar interests. And so the swing waiting uh, approach, that <laughs> right. believe it or not, um, it's it's a good group that we collaborate with though. And, and I think everyone does want the same thing in some capacity. And so we find a way to get there uh, through just real and honest conversations and a lot of math, like Rosie said. Um, um, what was I gonna mention? Uh, I can't remember. That's it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, oh, the swing waiting. Um, this was something we just implemented this last year where anonymously, um, you know, each agency got to add a weight of value to what they wanted. And I think there could have been some anchor bias, you know, given what you got your PhD in contaminants or, you know, smelt physiology. Um, and we were transparent in, you know, that figure of what action you would implement where, and you could see what agency weighted what differently. But in the end, um, you know, we, we came up with a decision uh, based on a, a structured trade-off discussion of the benefits and potentially unintended consequences. And I think, you know, the group had a, a consensus decision. I just, just to add to that, that um, we're still kind of in the early stages of structured decision. Yeah. We still have a lot of work to do and not a big group of people. Yeah. And so prioritizing what we put our efforts in. Do we put our efforts in to do more research to kind of fill in some of the data gaps that we have and the knowledge gaps that we have so we're not relying on expert elicitation? Or do we spend more time on the actual decision making tools that we're implementing for structured decision making? So there are a lot of, you know, just trying to prioritize where we put the, the amount of time that each of us has to put into it and the expertise that we have around the table. So that's that's been a challenge to try to figure out the best way to move forward when we have a lot of different areas that we can tackle with that. And then just to reiterate what Kurt said is that we don't have a ton of decision space because many of these actions are going to happen. It's just kind of flexibility in how we implement them. Um, and so, and they are recommendations. We're not making yeah. big consequential water decisions as a group. We're, we're making recommendations about how some of these be. I just want to add one more thing on the, you know, certainty and, you know, you were saying a bunch of math. I feel like there is sometimes false confidence in a number that we've put math into um, because uh, it's like, oh, we really need to run the bioenergetics model to tell us the answer for what smelt will do. Like, is our smelt really going to do that? No, they're smelt. They're going to do whatever they want. Um, I think it's a very useful tool, but um, especially like knowing you can have a really good bioenergetics model that will give you a really accurate idea of what smelt growth will do. But if you don't have um, the input data that is accurate, and we had these layers and layers of hydrodynamic models that gave us changes in salinity, that gave us changes in zooplankton, that gave us changes in smelt growth, and there was certain there was uncertainty in all of those steps of the modeling, giving us a final answer that was probably a good sense of um, what's possible, but it wasn't necessarily something to um, be a forecasting for the future. It was it was a useful decision tool, but it should not be taken out of proportion to what it was. Denise, if I can take 30 seconds yeah. to so your question from uh, yeah. the group's perspective. Um, 
we essentially found that um, very similar to the un digging to uncertainty didn't really you know resolve anything that there was uncertainty right throughout the whole process. And really the thought there was start to implement their management actions that make sense in an adaptive management framework and resolve that uncertainty as you go through because to Rosie's point, you know, models are imperfect and they're not going to answer that question. On the, um, on the actions that really mattered, they, the, the actions that provided food at critical times were the actions that were the best. The flow actions, the all four models showed no real benefit for a full flow action. Um, and a small benefit for a summer flow action, but hugely expensive in terms of water cost. The 100,000, the, the CSAMP group had decided on a water, the Library Science and Adaptive Management Program had decided on a value for water. So the 100,000 acre foot program is $87 million worth of water. Well, when you think what $87 million could do in other places, right? It's now a question of are we using our resources in the right places? Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think Ben wants to make a comment. Oh, 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 sure. So, I, I, so I, I just wanted quickly to chime in you know, about this um, uncertainty thing, and I'm, I'm sort of more, I'm, I'm a hydrodynamic model, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll do a modeling, and then we'll, we'll come out like with like with one number or you know a solution space, and we, we pass it out. I think. Um, that there, there obviously is. I mean, there, there is uncertainty in what we produce, and the important to sort of convey that uncertainty when we pass the information on, but also understanding um, the sensitivity, <laughs> um, model sensitivity to to whatever we produce. So, uh, for example, we have say a model, and we simulate uh, temperature space, and then we we say, okay. Um, we have this fixed threshold of 25 degrees Celsius, for example. <laughs> um, a point <clears> one <throat> difference in the in the model prediction may make a difference on how much you know suitable acreage <laughs> suitable acreage we have, right? Um, so I actually was, I was you know I was happy when I saw Rosemary's um, when she indicated you know one of the future directions to better understand the uh, temperature suitability curves because that that makes a really big difference. And on you know on implications to smelt. So um, not just uncertainty necessarily, but sensitivity as well is something that we. Oh, what what do they? Sort of nibbling on the shells and stuff. Mm -hmm. They definitely don't seem to bug the tamacorbula, which is the clam that is the big issue yeah. for us. Yeah. Sturgeon eat them. Um, one like biological control that has been documented for Potamocorbula is um, ducks. Like uh, there was like a huge bumper year of scalps, 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 mm -hmm. scalps. in yeah. San Pablo Bay, and they like managed to beat down the Potamocorbula <laughs> population. Um, one of the problems with biological control for them is they also bioaccumulate selenium pretty darn good. So you don't necessarily want to encourage anyone to eat them. Just, yeah, sorry. good thought. Bio Bioaccumulate selenium? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So let's come across the site. Perhaps we'll go to Renee and then Dave, you'll have the last uh, question in this session. Thanks, so I, I agree. This is really a great discussion. I'm curious. I was thinking about Lenny's comments this morning about my paraphrase wanting to kind of move out of the reactive to the proactive. And I feel like in a very basic way, to do that, you need a vision of where, how you want things to be that you're managing for, as opposed to uh, stressors that you're managing against or individual things. That, so, and I, as a salmon guy and not a delta smelt guy, even though I spent a lot of time in a lot of delta smelt heavy rooms over the years. <laughs> I, I'm curious, like, can somebody describe to me just like a rough conceptual model of how, from a process standpoint, we think the system behaved historically, geographically, and how that supported delta smelt? 
like in my mind, what I want to do is, you know, construct a an overlay that's like, here's what the hyperproductive delta smelt habitat looked like, and here's where we are now. And I feel like tons of the things that we're doing now in some very basic sense feel like we're sort of managing away from the processes that probably supported them historically in order to support them right now, which to sort of where Albert's question, I think earlier was going, feels like it, it has tons of unintended consequences and also probably has a limited capacity for success to some of the other things, you know, to a, to Dave's question. I almost said David. Um, but so, yeah, I'm just curious to hear like, how do we think it worked? My knee-jerk reaction is uh, to cite Whipple et al. 2012. <laughs> it's an excellent historical ecology study of the Delta. It was more focused on landscape, not like pelagic productivity. Um, but, you know, we had a flash year system. So we had... Um, really high spring flows, spring phytoplankton blooms. <clears throat> um, what stops me from being able to come up with a really good conceptual model of how things worked historically is that our zooplankton community, as well as our fish community, but our zooplankton community, we don't even know whether some of them are native or not. And the major players uh, in terms of copepods, which shelter smell eat, are all non-native. So Mice were definitely bigger, a bigger component. I don't know, Fred, do you have any ideas? Um, well, I guess I'll start off by introducing myself because I know many of you, but not all of you. So I'm Fred Byra. I'm a research fish biologist at the US Geological Survey's California Water Science Center. And for better or for worse, I'm really the reason why we're here talking about fall X2. <laughs> Um, so I wrote the two original papers describing the X2 issue. And so what we did back in almost 20 years ago now, about 17 years ago, we wrote these papers originally, and people are still debating them now. Um, what we did is we went and we used all of the amazing survey data that Rosemary's been talking about, and we used those data to describe the habitat affinities of Delta smelt. And regardless of what my esteemed colleague to my left here would like <laughs> you to believe, abiotic habitat is really a thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have freshwater and saltwater fish, or we'd be able to colonize the moon. Um, <laughs> but so so we did that. We we described delta smelt habitat based upon the the features that were available to us with the survey data, and then we used those relationships to then quantify the quantity and quality of habitat in the estuary over time. So we looked at the spatio-temporal dynamics of this habitat, delta smelt habitat, during this fall period over time. And when we did this, it was abundantly clear that the amount and the suitability of habitat had gone down over time. And it was very clear that it was in direct response to how the projects were operating in the fall. Okay. Done deal. Okay, that's that is what it was. The question was, and still remains to be, whether or not that's important. Okay, the Fish and Wildlife Service recognized that question, and said, okay, well, what we want to do here is we're going to stop this habitat degradation, but we want you guys to also study it and understand it and try to tell us whether or not it really is important and meaningful. And so that was kind of the origins of these fall um, habitat studies, the, the flow mast work groups and all that. And it's been going on since 2000 and, well, 2008, when the last biological opinion was written. Um, and here we are still um, without an answer, right? Whether or not it is important and how important it is. And so um, I think in order to get there, we're gonna have to re-envision um, just like Scott and others, people and others have been saying, we need to revision how 
re-envisioned how we're looking at the problem um, because it may be important or may not be important with, you know, one can make an argument right now that is absolutely of no importance because there's no Delta smelt right now, right? No wild Delta smelt. So what are we doing? Spending all this money and all this water. Um, but one of the, the challenges, I think, is that the way these studies have been set up is they've been set up to look at uh, responses that are, um, you know, instantaneous responses, and then trying to put that in a context of the life cycle of a fish. And as you've seen with the kind of the uncertainty that's been demonstrated in all of these studies and these results, that's really hard to do. Like, it's really hard to take a bunch of measurements of things that are happened at a given time and place, and then try to put that in the context of uh, such a dynamic system and a, and a complicated fish. And so um, I think rather than scale things up, because I think I think trying to do this in, a, in an observational manner as an observational study in such a big, large dynamic system, it's gotten us where it's gotten us, right? Like it's, there's only so much capacity for what we can really do and what we can learn. So I, I think really to move the needle forward, I think we need to do this experimentally and move beyond just the observational side of things. And I've always been a big proponent of, and this is what I would do if I was in charge, I would do experimental studies in the ship channel. I would use the experimental releases that we're using with um, hatchery rear delta smelt. And I would deploy those fish very carefully in a very thoughtful manner with a very specific experimental design into the ship channel because we know how that system works from the fundamental physics all the way up to the top of the food web. And you saw that earlier today. And if we do this the right way, we can learn a lot about how that system works and how Delta smelt are responding to it and understand why Delta smelt are actually um, persisting in that particular habitat. There's a lot of very key um, habitat features to the ship channel that make it seem to make it uh, useful for smelt. It's got everything smelt need except for salinity. It's basically a freshwater system, but it's got, as Rosemary said, it's got this habitat gradient where you've got this kind of up, upstream kind of isolated zone. And then you've got, you know, downstreams connected to the estuary with a lot of exchange. And then you've got this kind of exchange zone in the middle that really functions as a little mini estuary, a little turbidity maximum. And that is where we see all the action take place. And so I could very easily see an experiment where you deploy these fish in these habitat zones and, and really try to understand what's going on here. And then that can give you a sense for, okay, well, what would happen and what would it look like if we did this on a bigger scale? Like, okay, we see it working on this scale and a scale that we could actually manage and learn something from, right? Um, in an experimental way. And so I really think that's, how we're gonna be able to move the needle forward if we're really gonna get a, if we ever can get a, any kind of definitive answer on this fall X2 issue, I think we're gonna to have to go in, in that direction. Well, thanks for it. We're, oh, uh, actually, we're yeah. out, almost out of time. I wanted to get David's question into the record and if uh, the response could be very brief and then we could carry the discussion over into the break. So okay. David. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was curious if, um, thank, thanks for all the great presentation. Um, the, one of the questions I had was if, um, I really do want to think about it. In terms of, in addition to all the great monitoring that the IP is doing, are you, have you had the, is there much of a potential to actually be doing gross primary production estimates? That's something that's going to be actively done as part of us. Um, North Delta was, was kind of project specific. Yeah. Usually there are special studies. I wouldn't say part of the whole IP, but I don't, yeah. I'm not certain. Uh, special studies, definitely with the wetlands, managed wetlands also, they were, they, they're doing some gross primary productivity, but it's not something that is done like on a broad scale. I think the reason I was asking that question is that the, with the decrease in suspended sediments and then maybe roughly constant chlorophyll, that you would translate that maybe into an increase in growth primary production in places. And I was, and I, I don't know if, it, if you can say that chlorophyll is relatively flat across the years and parts of the Delta, but I just was, I've just been becoming increasingly curious about the 
how well understood the balance is for the yeah. contributions. Um, I would love to have a further conversation with you about that. Um, I'm like trying to mentally graph chlorophyll in my head and it bounces around a lot. In the Delta, it's been relatively a stable, very bouncy curve. Um, the one thing that has increased in the past 10 years is microcystis, which doesn't show up in the regular chlorophyll grab samples that are usually a meter down, they're floating on the top of the scum. Um, and I don't know how much of the that like plays into the change in suspended sediments, but it might. A lot of potential ideas though. So with that, I'd like to call this uh, session to a conclusion. I'd like to thank Brittany and Brian. Rosemary in particular for the long presentation. Uh, we've got Christy up the back, uh, Scott and Fred for being here and uh, Really, I think this has been one of the most engaging discussions we've had. So thank you all. That's it. Oh, good to see you, Rick. So, sorry, I was looking in the wrong direction. That's great. So we are all here. And uh, maybe, Bruce, you'd like to kick us off, just say who you are and who you're with, and then we'll come back for your more detailed presentation in a moment. Sure. Thank you. Um, we're going to manage the last one of the districts. My name is uh, Sean Acuna. I'm a senior resource specialist at the Metropolitan Water District. Um, we're pretty well interested in this uh, review. Uh, we State water uh, projects and uh, we supply um, water to 19 million people with at least 7 million federally dependent on the uh, delivery from the water project for 3 million water services. Uh, we also have to have uh, four islands in the Delta, so we are uh, also a steward as, as well as another. Bruce Lockett, I'm an <laughs> uh, uh, we were creating in 1992, we're a 15 member commission, uh, five county supervisors, five Delta counties, three city council members for the five Delta counties, three reclamation districts, that's the landowners out there okay, in the Delta, and then four state agencies. So we're the only unit uh, that we're a locally controlled uh, state commission. Makes us a little bit. Hi there, uh, my name is Michelle Minotis. I'm with the Regional Water Authority out of the Sacramento Metropolitan Region. Uh, we represent 22 water agencies within the region. Uh, primarily, our concerns are the health of the Lower American River uh, for multiple reasons. Um, however, we also have member agencies as far as in the city, about irrigation district, Lincoln, and West. Good afternoon, I'm Campbell Lieber. I'm the executive officer of the state's Delta Conservancy. Delta Conservancy was created as part of the Delta Reform Act in 2009. We're primarily a funding entity. We can publish dollars to the business administration and the dollars. Hi, I'm Kelly Lieber. I'm the director of the Central Delta Water Agency, which is an agency created by Rebecca Sosser in the mid 70s. Uh, consists of about 125,000 acres of, of land on the Rabbit Islands and in the Delta, which supports the vibrant uh, agricultural, environmental, wildlife habitat, recreational, and some municipal uses. Hello, I'm Heidi Rollins. Sorry, I didn't know that. I'm the wholesale supplier for Santa Clara County, so that's over by Silicon Valley, San Jose, and there's some. Uh, have water as well, down um, like Sephora, about 2 million people. And uh, we both manage that water supply as well as drink water and sea stewardship in the area. And we're the only public water agency that both gets water through the state water product and the central. Hello, my name is Jeff Kane. I'm the Assistant General Manager at Weston's Water District. Uh, Weston's is the largest CBP agricultural water contractor. 
and it's uh, it's perhaps the largest agricultural district in the Western United States. We are entirely reliant on water supply from the Delta for our sustainability and our practices, and uh, we are um, we are also uh, among all of our users within the South of Delta. Uh, there's a priority structure, so we are towards the end of the line. So we are in the forefront of experience and shortages due to drought, climate, and uh, other, other changes in regulatory policies that affect water supply reliability. Hello, I'm Mr. Chandler, to my colleague, I'm Mr. Chandler, and I'm with Mr. Bob Contact for this um, year organization that I've been. Uh, 27 out of 29 public water agencies who so have contacts with the government of water resources directly to our public water supplies. Our members with the cost of uh, the capital costs or development costs and uh, the wrong thing and the repeat actions on the labor to save our profit uh, so that they can exercise the water needs. Uh, and uh, Obviously, our interest is obviously we are we are for the of the Obviously, and, and more importantly, we also uh, for uh, using the facilities next for the policy decisions uh, that affect our civil property. My name is Bill Farmer. Um, I'm here today representing the Coalition for Sustainable Delta. Um, the coalition was put together and funded by landowners in the southern San Joaquin Valley, where both the state water project and the CDP are significant sources of surface water. Um, and it was launched, the launch more than a day to test, a decade ago when the Came to the realization, at least in our view, the Delta was being severely mismanaged. And more about that later. Um, I have spent my life in production agriculture, a um, number of different crops, number of different services, including processing. And I am still chairman of the Water Bank, which is one of the largest um, underground water banks in the world is a significant environmental benefit to both the innovation technology. Yeah, thank you. Well, so we'll now move to the virtual world and Lewis, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. And I deeply regret that I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, actually, I'll mute it. It's, um... Can you hear me? You should be coming as well. Should be coming out of that box in front of the shawl. Ground zero. Having some technical difficulties, Lewis. Just sit tight. <laughs> The button on the box should be. Okay, could you try again, Lewis? Sorry about that. Yeah, can you guys? Am I coming through now? Am I coming through? No. Never in the past. Okay, now, now we should be good. Sorry, Lewis, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, Lewis Bear, I'm a uh, manager for Reclamation District 108. We're on the Sacramento River in the Sac Valley, and today I'm representing one of uh, 130 Sacramento River settlement contractors. We're essentially the water users on the Sacramento River in the Sac Valley um, that predate Shasta Reservoir. So we're sort of an obligation of uh, Shasta Reservoir um, since they now control the river. So look forward to the discussion today. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. So what we're going to do is perhaps we'll start at the end. Uh, Rick, if we could start with you, we'll go through all the panelists. So if the committee could hold their questions uh, and, until we've had that, and then we'll jump into a deep discussion. And hopefully there'll be an opportunity for uh, interaction between the panelists as well. 
So Rick, please go ahead. And if I could just ask everyone speaking to hold the microphone quite close to your mouth because people online are saying they cannot hear unless you have it right up under your mouth. I can do that. <laughs> I, I do have a slide deck. I don't know if we can oh, yes. pull that up. Actually, would you like to come up? You can. Um, sure. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's great. You want to go over right. the other way? So, I got it. Oh, there's a different mic up there. Are those on the drop box? Here's our mic. I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, really, really appreciate the, the opportunity. Uh, some of you folks might be familiar with this this slide or this comparison. Um, essentially, this is the uh, extent of the wetland footprint in the Central Valley. Um, uh, historically, you know, 130, 20 some years ago versus where we're currently at. Um, and so, some folks that aren't from California don't realize that at one point we had 4 million acres of wetland in the Central Valley um, and, and hosted uh, hundreds of millions of birds annually. Uh, and and uh, through lots of projects, diversions, you know, really important things that, that needed to take place, um, that resulted in, in less than 5% remaining. And that's really in the best of times, right? Those are when we're receiving, you know, adequate water, allocations, we're not in successive uh, critically dry years, but remarkably, we're still able to host um, about 10 million water birds uh, in the Central Valley annually. And a, a recent study uh, by Audubon came out, Pacific Flyway, which includes the Colorado River Basin, um, we're hosting about a billion birds annually that utilize the Pacific Flyway. So how, did we, how, do, how do we do such a, a remarkable thing um, a, a really important piece of legislation that was uh, enacted in, in the early 90s um, was the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. <clears throat> um, there's obviously, you're probably more familiar with the fisheries uh, implications of, of CVPIA, but uh, likewise, there was a refuge water supply component. Um, and, and really the, the, the impotence was you know, mitigation for the construction and operation of the Central Valley Project. Um, and it uh, established firm and reliable water supplies to 19 wildlife refuges throughout the Central Valley. We have a, a suite of them in the Sac Valley. We have a suite of them in the San Joaquin. Um, a little bit of uh, jargon. Uh, level two supply uh, is what we, we refer to as uh, the component of the refuge water supply that comes out of the Central Valley project yield um, and makes up about two thirds of, of the, the full need for these wildlife refuges. And then we have another color of water uh, called incremental level four that needs to be acquired on the open market um, from willing sellers. Uh, and that makes up a, a lot of a third. And so collectively, um, I, I pose the question to you all, what would you do with 555,000 acre feet annually um, in, in the best in, in ideal, idealistic situation? <clears throat> So these are the refuges uh, throughout the Central Valley. We've got Sac, Delavan, Calusa, Gray Lodge, Sutter in the, in the north, and then down south, we've got, this is the, the area that I am uh, oversee uh, and, and deliver water supply to um, in the grass and ecological area. And then we've got a couple down in the South Valley. Um, as you could imagine, we harbor more than just waterfowl. Right, There's, this is really the the last remnant habitat ecosystems, viable ecosystems that that remain in the in the San Joaquin and, and the Sac Valley, um, and we have a lot of TNE species, right, as well. So so we we need to ensure that we've got reliable water supply that's delivered throughout the calendar year, right? But you know these things need fresh drinking water every day, just like we do. Um, you know things like the tricolored blackbird. The, the giant garter snake, the western pond turtle, sandhill crane, they're, they're all very dependent on, on these landscapes. And so they're very important. Um, managed wetlands provide critical food for overwintering 
uh, birds, waterfowl, you know, the, the Pacific Flyway. And I, I, I was, you know, I, I caught a, a portion of the last session and bioenergetics is something that has been refined in these managed wetlands. Um, so, you know, the building blocks of life, chlorophyll, azo, plankton, uh, the, the whole suite of invertebrates, micro and macro, whole ecosystems exist. Um, and that is our charge. We, we manage these moist soil habitats to create as much energy. Because remember, we're dealing with 5% of the habitat. Yep, we've got you know, hundreds of millions of birds that, that are dependent on those systems. And so that's a, a, a critical component. Uh, and then also breeding habitat. Um, so everybody knows that you know, birds fly south for the winter. Well, the Central Valley is in many cases as far south as they fly. Um, and so many birds uh, also breed here. In, in the spring and summer months. Um, two thirds of the remaining wetlands in California are actually privately held, which is uh, a, you know, a surprise to most folks. Um, and these private wetlands are intensively managed at a great cost to those, those landowners. Um, and, and these are predominantly duck hunters that have preserved these landscapes uh, and, and perpetuated this conservation. Um, public refuges also provide uh, critical recreation for many of our disadvantaged communities in the Central Valley. Most, you know, many families don't have the resources to take their family to Monterey or Yosemite, um, but we do have wildlife refuges, open space, teeming with wildlife, teeming with birds, a great opportunity for the public to enjoy these landscapes. Um, and it's been hugely successful in, in a lot of regards. Um, this is kind of a time step. This is when uh, Central Valley Project Improvement Act was, was built in uh, in the early 90s, and you've seen an immediate response. Uh, so the left is of dabbling and diving ducks, 22 species. We, uh, we've uh, increased their, their population uh, by nearly 50%, and geese and swans are skyrocketing. I, I don't know that we can uh, you know, take credit for, for that. There's something else likely going on there, um, but the, the work is not done. So this is a, a cool uh, chart that out of the State of Birds report from 2022. Um, outside of geese, swans, dabbling and diving ducks, everything is spiraling towards extinction, unfortunately. Hate to bring that bummer to the table, but that is what's happening. Um, and uh, shorebirds are especially being impacted uh, in, in this era. Um, 26 of, tw uh, of the 28 Shorebird species are declining more than half have lost uh, more than 50% of their abundance and the rates of decline are accelerating. Um, uh, lots of other terrestrial birds are, are also experiencing these declines. Um, and so the work is not done. It isn't, it isn't perfect, but uh, we, we are seeing some successes uh, in certain yields. So uh, from this perspective, you know, what, what are the best science recommendations as it relates to uh, long-term operation of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project? Um, I, I can't emphasize the importance of maintaining the ecological backbone of the reliable level two water supply um, to these wildlife refuges because many, many terrestrial species uh, are completely dependent on it. And the, uh, the, the needs of the wildlife refuge are sort of staggered from say uh, commercial uh, agriculture, right? When, when most of the irrigation is, is happening in the spring and summer months, really the, the vast majority of the water supply that we need for wildlife refuges comes in the fall and winter. Um, uh, and so we, we don't think that it actually competes directly with the needs of fish, uh, salmonid, cold water temperature pools. This is a period where we need this water supply after the fact. Um, some recommendations would be to analyze the impacts to wetland dependent species and balance any perceived trade-offs between fish and terrestrial species. Um, uh, and I think this is probably the most important point that I'd like to deliver is investigate the current and potential benefits of managed wetlands in the Central Valley as it relates to anadromous fish restoration. So what is this guy talking about? So back to the point, ducks eat the same stuff as fish. Right, and the schedule at which we deliver what I call the bug soup back to the tributaries is on a time scale that is complementary in a lot of ways. We need to focus science to understand the implications of this. And maybe there are things that we should be doing together more collaboratively in terms of timing. Um, I, I don't know that this phrase has been coined yet, but the concept of managed floodplains. Everybody knows what a managed wetland is, but what about a managed floodplain? 
Um, so I, in my district, we're, we're partnering with some NGO partners and we're trying to push some of this bug soup out to some floodplain areas that um, historically would only see those floodwaters once a hydrologic cycle. Um, so let, let's, how about if we can do that two or three times the hydrologic cycle where it makes sense we have the water supply and the timing is, is all good. So that's that's my spiel. That's great. Well, thanks, Rick. Thank you. Again, to take all the questions at the end. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, Sean, if you would like to go next and then we'll go online, Lewis, we'll put you in after Sean. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we uh, welcome the opportunity to uh, have the committee here. It's been really nice to have you guys here going over all the things that are, um, we're working on. We'd like your thoughts on the uh, effectiveness of science and monitoring to inform decisions regarding these actions. Um, we'd like to know your thoughts on what was brought up earlier about Bollocks 2, some things to help us navigate through the uncertainties regarding that action, uh, in, and then incorporating proportional effects. It's important to understand the proportional effects so we understand what we can do to help uh, in a proportional way to improve that uh, or mitigate that effect. So in regards to the effectiveness of monitoring and science, we appreciate the, having the state and federal agencies include us in a lot of the discussion and development of the science. Uh, we really commend them on doing their uh, best to try to leverage what uh, research, what monitoring they have and to try to improve that using new technologies and uh, expanded uh, understanding of what's the best time scale or spatial scale for doing that monitoring. But we think there's a lot of potential for growth and maybe there's some ideas that you can bring to uh, your review on what are the strengths, because that's just as important as understanding what are the limitations. Because knowing the strengths, then we can have some idea of, okay, so we did that well, what are some things that we can do better that could be really helpful in understanding what we need to do? Because um, as we know, you know, just having long-term monitoring is not in itself a, uh, an intrinsic value. It's really how well it's used and how it's developed. And like, as I mentioned, like the command of state and federal agencies that includes the resource agencies and the fisheries agencies are trying to be adaptable on changing their monitoring. And that change requires some trade-offs. So if you can provide us your insights on how well we've done that, that would be extremely important. Um, now, in regards to our concerns about Pollux 2, now Pollux 2, as was mentioned earlier, was part of the uh, biological opinion 2008 2009. It had a variety of mechanisms embedded within it that it potentially could be doing, uh, some of which include moving delta smelt downstream or the, uh, the low salinity habitat downstream into more favorable habitat. That includes both the prey and the fish itself. But uh, lines of evidence has occurred. Since then, we've developed a lot more information, but unfortunately with more information, we don't have greater clarity. We still have a lot of different uh, understandings of how the, the lines of evidence uh, add up to support and, and not support the action. For example, uh, we do see a higher occupancy of delta smelt in low salinity habitat, but using more state of occupancy modeling, that didn't find out that X2 was a really good metric to do that. It was actually better to use salinity itself as opposed to the X2 metric. Uh, in, in regards to the dietary uh, benefits downstream, we see some benefits in the dietary uh, condition of the fish. We've been able to look at them internally. I've been part of those dissections. I've dissected many of these fish. I know them inside and out. A lot of their uh, biochemistry and metrics. Uh, and um, well, we also found a lot of other things, lesions in the gills and livers. So this suggests there are trade-offs when it deals with this kind of thing. What are the benefits and the trade-offs with these kind of actions? In addition, the life cycle models, as you heard, there are four different life cycle models. Uh, even one of the life cycle models has like two versions at least, and one is a little bit more, uh, a little older than the other, but they perhaps look at different things. One of them found that Bollix 2 is actually uh, very supportive for uh, related to recruitment of the species, while another iteration of that same life cycle model, as plus as well as some multivariate analyses done prior to this, found that Folix 2 was not as well supported as maybe in other metrics, such as OMR or turbidity. So it's things like this that are really clouding how we understand the action. And if there's a way for us to navigate through these lines of evidence, some thoughts on that would be really helpful to understand how to be the most effective at implementing the action. The uh, last thing I was hoping the committee can weigh in on was the proportionate effects. When it comes to proportionate effects, we know that for Delta smelt OMR management, 
has potential to affect the most, if not all the, uh, the population, given the, the low numbers that they have. We do have a freshwater residence, so maybe less of an effect on them. Um, that might be part of your briefing documents. You'll learn about the uh, freshwater residents. But longfin smelt is, spans the whole estuary. So is OMR, what is the actual proportion effect of OMR? And is the proportion of mitigating uh, actions uh, appropriate for that effect? If you look at the evaluation as well as the monitoring, are they helping you capture that proportion of effect to help you inform what kind of decisions that need to be made with that monitoring and synthesis? And then lastly, I'd like to say that uh, it was it was asked, what can we bring to the table? We've been working with the state and federal agencies as well as with academics, with our partners. We believe in collaborative co-production of science. We believe in transparency and innovation with management relevance. We've been working with uh, a number of different, all, the, all these different groups as partners to try to find solutions to our management needs. And we look forward to working with you and working as part of uh, partners. Please rely on us. We've been part of this process since uh, uh, species were listed in, uh, in, the, um, in the 90s. And then also prior to that, during the water quality control plan in the 70s. We are very interested in this. We have a unique set of scientists that's uh, somewhat unique among the uh, public water agencies, but a really wide bench. And uh, we've established relationships and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sean. So we're going to hop now to Lewis uh, virtually, but uh, I just noticed, Sean, of course, you got some very detailed notes there. And just on behalf of the committee, we will be got notes. Uh, even if they're in a rough form, uh, you, please don't hesitate to send them to, to sure. Laura uh, after this. It's sort of those focus questions are very helpful. So we'll, we'll go to uh, Lewis now online. Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, hopefully you can hear me this time. It's working still. We can hear you very well. All right. Thank you. So uh I introduced myself before, but uh, I'm a I'm actually an engineer by training college, but uh, really been working for about the last 20 years on salmon recovery um, in the Sacramento Valley, and I, I you know privileged to work for a group of landowners that want to take care of their valley and are interested in recovery, and uh, I think that's one of the primary things that I would ask of the committee. Um, I think we're, we do so much of our work on the fishery under section seven, under a project, a responsible, uh, you know, entity um, instead of in the recovery realm. I think that tends to lead us towards, you know, what that responsible agency can do. And uh, it sort of directs our energy and resources um, inappropriately to get us to a solution. And so, um, so I'd ask you not to limit yourself to the proposed action or what could be done by the responsible agency, but to instead look for recovery solutions that would be best for California, um, and then allow us to all figure out how to make sure those things get done, or at least include those things in your findings. Um, I also think that, uh, and I was really encouraged earlier by some of the questions about you know, the resource cost and the expectation that we we should have. And uh, I, I do think that uh, um, a lot of times we are making management decisions that are hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. And yet the information that's going into those um, or the data investment that's going into those doesn't reflect the magnitude of those decisions, nor does it, you know, imply or take into account the opportunity cost and the investment that should be made that could further improve the species um, because it's not part of the proposed project or something within the control of the responsible entity. And I, I think we need to change that framework and we need to be thinking about recovery um, and thinking about what we should do and everything being on the table. Another thing I think, and I, I've heard it again and again, I've been able to listen today and I really enjoyed the, the talks, but so often I think because we're thinking about water and the water operations, our questions are, you know, how can we do a pulse flow or how can we use water to manage salinity? Um, 
but really we need to be thinking about you know how can we expect or have a reasonable expectation to support native fish if we have a dramatically changed system and i i think most of the conversation can be explained by the fact that we've divorced our rivers from the landscapes um you know we you heard rick ortega talking about all of our wetlands that are no longer gone no longer here those are the same wetlands that used to provide residence time and food production and detritus for the you know for for food production system um and we're trying to now do things that are sort of artificial or in a small location to reproduce those things um but we're not going to be able to do that. Our, our modified system has shown us that it'll produce 95% of what we call non-native fish right now. And our natives are struggling because we have a different functioning ecosystem. Um, and uh, unless we change that, we're unlikely to be successful. And so what I'd like to share with you is what we're doing in the Sacramento Valley to change that. I mean, if we really are interested in supporting native fish, we need to do things that result in a system that actually supports native fish. And so uh, we have approached that with Northern California Water Agency and what we call our salmon recovery program. And it really is a comprehensive approach from spawning areas to upstream habitat, to floodplains, uh, to food production, um, bringing that back to the river and uh, you know trying to do all of that at scale. And so, um, you know, I, I think I'm supposed to be five to seven minutes, but uh, we have a science program. Um, you know, the settlement contractors bring unique access to landowners, those adjacent lands that uh, used to be connected to our rivers and can bring those back in. And so we've been able to do that. Um, the uh, we we have been working with the agencies on something called a winter run action plan related to LTO, and it's you know includes accelerating alternative spawning locations. So not just trying to spawn winter run in Redding, you know we need to get fish to locations where they'll be able to spawn with climate change. Um, we need to improve our data acquisition to better inform our management decisions, and so we'd be accelerating some of that. Uh, data acquisition and science work uh, with the agencies, uh, extensive habitat improvements that are also present in voluntary agreements. So these include significant investments and in landscape level changes uh, in those investments. And I'll talk about a couple of those later. Science within river survival, you know, you've heard folks talk about, uh, you know, predation and that sort of thing. Although we tend to believe that if you produce the right sort of riverine estuary you'll get a natural balance between predators and the native fish that you you uh you are trying to to rear in your 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 area and then i just wanted to mention that uh, the settlement contractors um spent two hundred thousand dollars last year on thiamine treatment for in-river spawners on the upper sacramento river and we are working with the agencies to see if we'll continue to do that again and i think that's you know, it's that sort of thing and responsiveness that the settlement contractors have been able to bring um, with voluntary agreements, which is a different program. Um, it's really a program about connecting our rivers to our landscape. Uh, we have a number of obligations under that program for spawning gravel and side channels. Um, but a minimum of 20,000 acres of fish food. This last year, we had 30,000 acres of fish food. So that's 30,000 acres in the Sacramento Valley that are flooding, raiding, raising the, uh, I don't know if Rick called it zoop soup, but uh, essentially phytoplankton, draining that back into our river. We've been doing that for seven or eight years now, and we're seeing growth, essentially improving growth rates within the main stem of the Sacramento River. And wherever we do that, we see that propagate downstream for miles. Um, so that's, I think, a critical thing that will help our, our native fisheries. And then the biggest investment really is a, a program called Floodplain Reimagined. And that's a program that's looking at half a million acres in the Sacramento Valley. We're very fortunate that we have a flood control system that has prevented development in our valley. And there's 500,000 acres of the original native floodplains in our valley. 
um, that our flood control system has separated and it's unnecessary in many locations and we can bring those back. Our commitment under the voluntary agreements would be to bring 20,000 of those acres back. Um, and that's really just a function of time, right? We only have eight years or 15 years under that program. Much more can be done there. And I think that that sort of functioning ecosystem is what would bring back um, our, our native fisheries, um, not necessarily some of the small experiments that we do at very high water costs. So um, I'd also like to mention that uh, we believe everybody needs to be a part of this, whether it's tribes or the fishing groups. Um, we actually have a partnership with the uh, commercial and recreational fishing industry where we're working with the state and federal agencies on uh, reconsidering their hatchery practices and uh, we're developing an approach or they're developing an approach and we're all looking forward to supporting that. So I guess with that, uh, it's quite a bit of information, but uh, I'll stop there and excited to listen to the other folks. Right. Well, thank you, Lewis. And moving right along the line, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, again, Bruce Blodge of the Delta Protection Commission. It's it's kind of an unusual thing, and I'm going to make a shameless plug. Uh, if you haven't had enough meetings today, 6 o'clock this evening, there's another one. If you'd like to tune in, go to delta.ca.gov and look at our national heritage area. There is one national heritage area in the state of California, and it's the Delta. So this place that we're talking about where water goes through for these projects is extremely important. It was so important. Congress recognized it. It was so important that the legislature wanted to protect it back in 1992 when they created our commission. Uh, urban encroachment was a real concern then. Uh, one county alone, Tom's familiar with this, uh, had five new town proposals at one point, uh, San Joaquin County, just five in one county. And some of those were close and into the Delta. So you looked at that, the legislature looked at that and said, this is a place we wanna protect. This is a place we wanna preserve. This is a place we need to protect for agriculture and to protect it moving forward. So that was very clear. If you read the authorizing legislation that passed and that created us, uh, agriculture was a real focal point of that. Um, I mentioned 15 commission members, urban encroachment. Um, so what's happened since then? We have a primary zone and a secondary zone at the Delta that was created by the state legislature. The secondary zone is does allow for some development consistent with general plan uses. Uh, there's a whole series of hoops they need to go through, but primary zone, there's been no urban development, no urban encroachment. There have been a couple projects proposed, but the legislature said we're committed and we're going to keep this for agriculture. That is also a commitment back to agriculture in the Delta to do what's best for them, because you can't have agriculture and then get rid of the farming. And that's one of the things that we want you to look at and think about as you're weighing decisions, especially decisions that could impact the land use of the Delta, agriculture is the base industry, the only real big industry. Recreation is extremely important, but a very distant second. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see that recreation component increase as well as agriculture increase in the future. So we are governed uh, by our economic sustainability plan, our land use and resource management plan. Be happy to share those documents with, with you. Uh, that talk about the policies and why it's important to protect this agricultural resource. This is the most efficient place in the world to grow crops, bar none. You grow almonds in the Delta, it takes a lot less water. You grow anything in the Delta. You have subsurface irrigation, the applied water amounts in the Delta pale in comparison to the rest of the state, pale in comparison. So telling, you know, when we see stories and we see different studies and the suggestion is, well, let's just get rid of a bunch of that farmland up there. That's the most important place we should be growing food in, in the state of California, planet for that matter. The water's there, the water's available. We should be growing food there. Found out last summer, actually through Campbell's group, um, was doing some, some research on, on drought policies and, and encouraging people to adopt different practices to save water. They found out the Delta didn't save that much water using those practices. Those things work really good outside the Delta, Inside the Delta, it's always growing something, always. If you're not growing crops, it's growing tulies. It's not growing tulies, it's growing some other invasive. It's growing something all the time. Uh, mention that. So yeah, role with the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project on a day-to-day -day basis. 
the Delta Protection Commission doesn't have to For recommendations that come forward to benefit those projects in impact land use in the Delta, that's when we take notice. That's when we'll take notice. And that's when our, our commission gets concerned. Best science to operations uh, was the second question we were asked to kind of relate to. I've heard a lot of discussions on best science, and I'm really optimistic and hopeful that this will be the best science, because we've seen a lot of political science when it's been coming to water decisions and water projects that impact the Delta. Far too much political science, not enough science. And that's one of the things we've been concerned of. There's some, the seismic risk, if you talk to people in the Delta, there's, my family was only there in the 1890s, not near as long as Tom's. Um, Talking about seismic risk, my family farmed there in the 1890s. We never had an earthquake result over the levee failure. But yet people are saying, it's seismic, it's seismic. We're, we're going to lose the whole delta. Not one earthquake has ever created a levee failure. Levee failures have not come in because of earthquakes. Never. Not one. Let's see. Touch that. One of the things I think we're going to take a great interest in and in looking at your panel members uh, and future ones, are you getting to the people like Tom Zuckerman in the reclamation districts, the engineers, the people that are in the Delta? So as you're doing things relative to the Delta, not specifically uh, maybe project operations, but if you're looking at different projects or looking at different ideas in the Delta, who are you talking to in the Delta? Uh, we've seen things on levees where people that outside the Delta are going to solve our problem on levees. They're not talking to the engineers of the Delta. They're not talking to the, the reclamation districts who manage those on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's getting to the right people. And I guess, what can we contribute? We can help you get to the right people. Um, we can work with the Tom Zuckermans of the world. We can work with the other people that are in the Delta that have been fighting this fight, farming these lands, recreating on these lands uh, for all these years from 1800s. And we can make sure that you're at least talking to the right people. That's our commitment. Okay, thank you, Bruce. See you down the table. Thank you. And I had a I had a short presentation. So do you want to come up here, Michelle? And oh, yeah, show sure. you. I, I will project. I don't want to be plugged with any hazardous. <laughs> This works, doesn't it? Have this. <laughs> might use the point that I have. Thank you. Just... It's a long thing to get it's everybody. <laughs> All right, I will do my best to project so people online can hear. Um, again, I'm Michelle Benonis with the Regional Water Authority. Um, so just really quick, I just wanted to kind of set the stage for sort of um, our region generally. Now, this doesn't include everything um, because, of course, I'm focused on the river here, but um, one of the things I did want to point out uh, mostly with this map is if you notice where Folsom Dam is and you notice where the Delta starts, um, kind of in this area, we're not that, uh, Folsom Dam is not that far away. So why, why does that matter? Well, Folsom Dam tends to be uh, the first line of defense um, for Delta requirements or exports. Um, the water gets there faster. Um, other reservoirs are tapped into, but because of the length uh, to the Delta, it takes a lot longer to get there, right? So why does that matter? Well, Folsom Reservoir is small. It's a little less than a million acre feet. doesn't have a ton of storage. And that becomes a huge issue because temperature for fish species in the Lower American River is the number one limiting factor. Um, and so small reservoir getting tapped into, not a lot of cold water pool built up. Um, and it can be released very quickly, you can lose that cold water pool and it can uh, create major issues um, in our tributary for Fall Run Chinook, but primarily for ESA uh, is, you know, you're all considering a uh, steelhead. Uh, so, I slide. Um, so I won't go into the role of the organization because I know we already kind of touched on that at the beginning. Um, I will say, uh, I, and I, I think it's really important to add that in our region, uh, the Regional Water Authority was actually born out of something called the Sacramento Water Forum. And it was an agreement um, signed in 2000. Um, essentially, the idea was that a, a huge group of stakeholders got together, water providers, NGOs, business leaders, the public, 
they came up with this agreement and essentially it plans to balance some objectives, mainly to balance water supply for the region, um, while also pre preserving the ecosystem and recreational values of the Lower American River. So that's really important to keep in mind. You know, Lewis mentioned voluntary agreements. We kind of see the water forum as like the original <laughs> voluntary agreement where everybody came to the table and they negotiated um, and it's served us really well. Um, I, you know, mentioned, um, I'm going to go to the right column here. Um, I, I mentioned temperature is the number one limiting factor. Um, I think one of the things we've really learned, um, and I think Sean mentioned this too, uh, related to adaptation, we've learned from the implementation of the 2019 biop. We also have something um, in the uh, Lower American River called the Modified Flow Management Standard, which is part of the biop. Um, but it's also uh, something we engage in with reclamation through a memorandum of understanding. Um, essentially what it does is it, it seeks to meet certain flow requirements, pulse requirements in certain times of the year. It maintains certain cold water pool storage targets at Folsom. Um, but we have noticed, um, you know, even despite that implementation, there are still major, major challenges with meeting temperature requirements downstream. Um, so I think the idea is that we need to learn from that. We've been collecting data over the implementation of this period, um, and we really need to adapt. We need to change our methodology. Um, we need to make tweaks around the edges to try to perfect it and uh, do what's best for the species. Um, the other thing um, I would just wanted to mention is use local regional resources. Um, we have some great resources uh, in the upper watershed of the American River, so up above Folsom. Um, we have Sacramento Municipal Utility District and Placer County Water Agency. They have uh, forecasting tools and modeling tools. Really need to integrate that into the overall um, operational analyses that are being done for the biops. Um, this is so important. Um, there are tools, for example, in some years where maybe uh, more traditional forecasts have been off, have been a lot more refined. Um, so we need to be able to share that information and make sure uh, that we're doing that efficiently. The other thing I would mention is the Water Forum. Um, they've got great fisheries and water quality data. They've been collecting it for over 20 years. Um, it's just such a valuable resource. We need to be able to utilize that and tap into that. The other thing I would just mention is community concerns and impacts. Well, what do I mean by that? I think if you talk to anybody that's a member of the Water Forum, whether it's an NGO, a water supplier, business uh, leader, they are all going to say that a healthy river equals a healthy water supply across the board. Um, so I think that just really needs to be taken into consideration that the health of our ecosystem is so valuable to the people in our region. Um, and we really need to understand that those things are inextricably intertwined. Um, the other thing I would just mention as kind of the last case here is I think we know that um, trade-offs are really difficult when you're, I mean, <laughs> you guys are learning, if, if you don't already know the CVP and SWP, which I know some of you do, um, but if you if you don't know it, it is complicated. And, you know, you pull on one string, things unravel somewhere else, right? It's, it's the way it is. But I think one thing we know on the American River is that temperature is directly related to fish health on the lower American River. There's a ton of data that backs this up multiple studies, multiple analyses. So I think it, what's really important is to consider that some things are quantifiable and not just hypothetical, and that we have to understand that there are certain trade-offs that yield more definitive and lasting results. So I think that's really important to take into consideration, and that should be weighted accord accordingly. And last slide, um, you know, you asked how the, or how can uh, you, contribute to the work, or, or how can we contribute to the work of the committee? We have a ton, of, again, folks with really great resources in our region. Um, I mentioned the upstream reservoir operators. There's more than that. We have a lot in our region. They have a ton of data. Um, we have downstream diversions um, that are downstream of Folsom. We should talk to them. The one thing I did not include in this list, and I, I apologize for that, we also have folks that divert off of Folsom directly. So San Juan Water District, for example, Roseville, uh, City of Folsom, they all uh, directly divert and they 
have a lot of data and a lot of experience with concerns over Folsom going to Deadpool as well in extreme drought scenarios. So uh, I think, you know, having that conversation would be good. We also have a lot of groundwater providers. Um, and I'm going to jump to the last part here about conjunctive use, but um, we've had really good success story in the Lower American River. Um, we have groundwater providers. We have been alternating um, using groundwater and surface water supplies. So, you know, folks pull off the river when the situation is such that there's a lot of water. Um, but then in, you know, then they're banking that water, they're putting that water in the ground um, and using it in critical and dry years and reducing diversions off the lower American river. So that's helping us from a water supply reliability perspective, but it's also helping the lower American river because in those critical and dry times, there's more flow showing up in the river. So we've just got a really good success story. And I will say in the lower American river, um, we are one of the only basins in the state that have actually improved our groundwater levels. And the Lower American River was actually uh, one of the models for Sigma when it was originally put forward as a proposed regulation. So really important to keep that in mind. Um, flood control entities. We have SAFCA, uh, the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency. Really great group. Um, definitely chat with them. There's a lot of interesting constraints on the Lower American River due to flood. Um, issues. So uh, I think they'd be a great resource. And Water Forum staff. I mentioned the Water Forum's data. They're fantastic. Um, they can point you in the right direction if you need any information. Um, and I, just finally, on a, a cool note, I just wanted to say that, you know, along with our 20 plus year success story, we uh, our restored sites on the river are now supporting 30 to 50 percent of our in-river spawning annually. So that's a huge, huge success story. Um, again, I think we have a lot to share. Um, we're open to contribute and collaborate and uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Being on the line, uh, Campbell, I know you have a presentation or if you're just going to talk to us. I'll just talk. Great. I'll be relatively quick. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are a state conservancy. We are created to serve the Delta as well as the Soon Marsh not quite as unique as Bruce's group uh, in, in sort of a majority of local involvement on our board, but we do have five county supervisors on our board. And the intention there is that everything that we do, everything that we fund is locally supported. We work, our applicants have to demonstrate local support and, and um, to, to be able to get funding for the Delta Conservancy. I'll talk a little bit about each of our programs and how they relate to the Center Valley Project, and then a little bit about science needs and um, how I think we can help provide information. So our first big program uh, was Proposition 1. It brought $50 million for ecosystem restoration in the Delta. That funded about 34 projects, um, provided some sort of ecological uplift on about 11,000 acres in the Delta for a wide variety of projects throughout. Um, some more notable, uh, we funded the bulk of the nutria eradication program. So that's looking at trying to stop the nutria from getting established in the Delta through control outside the Delta, although they seem to be showing up and some quite a few are in this soon marsh right now. Uh, looking at planning to reconnect Elk Slough, which would be an alternate pathway for salmonid migration, as well as improved floodplain um, habitat and flood protection in that area. Uh, provided some planning money for the Paradise Cut, looking at a Yola, uh, South Delta bypass that functions, that would function a lot like the Yellow Bypass. And then other projects, uh, wetland projects, riparian, uh, invasive species control, water quality, uh, and some fairly significant uh, tidal habitat restoration projects. The other half of our, our uh, mission is to do economic development. So we've funded a number of projects throughout the Delta, looking at increasing recreation and tourism opportunities, trail systems, historic preservation, uh, a couple of uh, visitor centers that will be in the Delta to help people understand how they can come in, understand the Delta, utilize the Delta, and then also just contribute to the overall economic condition in the Delta. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, we ran a drought response pilot program for the last two years of the drought. This was with a $22 million allotment for the Department of Water Resources. We worked with individual landowners. Uh, Jose Way was very helpful in that uh, project. Um, basically funded them to reduce their applied water through changing their agricultural practices, 
Um, it was a very successful program in terms of engaging with Delta agriculture. But as Bruce mentioned, you don't save a lot of water in the Delta because what you apply is, is if, if you stop applying, you get subsurface uh, irrigation because you're below sea level and uh, the nature of the peat soil. But still a, a wealth of information about how applied water is, is uh, moves through the system as evidence uh, use, using open ET to, to measure that. And then we have some longer term projects that are looking at using eddy covariance towers that are really looking at how water moves through uh, agricultural systems in the Delta. Um, the thing I'm most uh, engaged in personally in the Delta is really looking at nature-based solutions to address subsidence in the Delta. So I think you all are probably aware that there's an enormous hole in the Delta between 150 and 200,000 acres. That was all carbon that has volatilized into the atmosphere. Fully agree with what Tom's going to say and what Bruce says about we need to maintain the levees and agriculture is the driver. We also have to recognize that we continue to go the wrong direction and increase that, that subsidence every year. And we also put a tremendous amount of carbon in the atmosphere between 10 and 20. We've even seen 30 tons of carbon per acre per year going into the atmosphere, into the Delta. And again, that's you're 30 feet below sea level. That's all carbon that was in the, in the peat and is now volatilized into the atmosphere. We've done a tremendous amount of science through the years. We know the rates of subsidence. We know what causes it. We know how to stop it. We simply put water back on the landscape. So we had a $36 million allotment. We've uh, funded four projects, one of them with Metropolitan Water District to take all of Web Tract and put about 3,500 acres into managed wetland and about 1,500 acres into rice cultivation. The expectation, it's a whole island management scheme that's sort of a mosaic of these two practices stop subsidence, stops the carbon emissions, should still be economically viable with carbon market, but also with the rice cultivation. They're gonna be looking at whether or not those wetlands sort of a surrogate can provide fish food, the base of the food chain be pumped back over uh, into the surrounding waterways. And then again, sort of really trying to make the, the these islands stop subsiding, stop belching carbon and be economically viable into the future. Very exciting, we, we did get this money, we put it to projects very quickly. Sadly, that's the end of the funding. And so now we're really after federal funding to see if we can't keep that, keep that going. A couple other things that we do, um, we coordinate or co-facilitate the Delta Invasive, Delta Interagency Invasive Species Committee. Um, and that's their focus at this point really is looking at rapid detection response. There's not a lot of money for invasive species control in the Delta, but it's a critical issue. But working with all the agencies, trying to get them to focus on how do we identify quickly and respond as quickly as we can to do what we can as early as we can as invasives hit. We also uh, co-facilitate the Delta Restoration Network, which is a subcommittee of the Delta, uh, Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee. Uh, and essentially that is bringing all the practitioners together and with the Delta community as much as possible to really talk about restoration of the Delta, where it's happening, what's planned, and and you know what's what's kind of sharing best practices and information to just better facilitate restoration in the delta. Uh, I think we're you know we're 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 looking to to the group. A couple key issues, just you know, we, we, there's big targets out there. There's sixty to eighty thousand acres of restoration to be done in the delta, but obviously that's going to be long term. It's going to cost a lot of money to do that. Where do we best spend money now? Uh, when we've got money, where, where do we prioritize to put that for the greatest effect in the Delta is really important. And a lot of talk about how salinity in the system changes when you start to inundate uh, lands for um, tidal habitat restoration and how that affects water quality throughout the system. Clearly need a better understanding of that. Basically right now, people propose projects to us, we evaluate them against best available science, we make them show us the best available science and we say whether or not we should fund them. But those are bigger issues and really should be directing where we invest money more heavily. Um, and then I think the two areas where we can help hopefully provide you with information is, again, around the drought response and agricultural water movement through agricultural systems in the Delta, as well as just we've got a wealth of data and information about the whole subsidence and carbon issue in the Delta and, and everything that's gone on for 20 plus years to support our efforts to try to make those changes. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Campbell. Oh. Hi, I'm Tom Zuckerman. Um, I guess I'm the elder statesman here. I, 
been around a long time, uh, as as you've heard, and I my I I got involved in this uh, water issue and habitat stuff about fifty six years ago. So hmm. I've seen a lot. I have some fair, fairly strong opinions. I've been involved in a lot of different uh, aspects of this. I'm happy to be here with this distinguished group of scientists, which I am not a scientist, although I've been accused of being an osmotic scientist from the, <laughs> from the uh, amount of uh, involvement I've had in these issues over there. And it's, it's fun to see some familiar faces from the, from the Delta uh, Stewardship Council and, and uh, staff here today. Um, <clears throat> I, what I really want to do is pledge uh, cooperation with you going forward. Uh, you know, I, I could go on for several hours talking about the subjects that are that are gone here, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I will uh, make an observation that I think is important, and, and it's one that we've been making uh, uh, since about 2007 or before. It's embodied in a paper that we that I authored, but 25 members of the Blue Ribbon panel for the CalFed operation uh, uh, supported. I'm gonna pass this down to you and I hope you can make, make it available to the uh, to your, your panel here. It involves a, a water plan for the 21st century, which really talks about uh, trying to utilize the, the uh, reservoir that we've systematically created in the Sacramento Valley with a capacity of half a billion acre feet by uh, inadvertently overdrafting the groundwater resources of the area. And I think we can use existing facilities, reoperate them to try to fill that those uh, voids back up again during uh, uh, performing necessary flood control and these really whiplash uh, situations that we get, and we have an opportunity to reduce reliance on the Delta, which is going to be a key to any uh, uh, successful uh, reclamation of the re of the wildlife resources and the fish resources. We just we've overcommitted the resources of the Central Valley. We the same way we've overcommitted the resources of the Colorado River. We have to come to grips with that. It's not something that's caused by climate change, it's caused by deliberate decisions that were made uh, in the development of the CVP and the State Water Project, uh, over committing supplies that they never developed or, or didn't have or didn't understand what the needs for them were going to be in terms of fishery resources and so forth. So this is all uh, uh, well and good. I listened to the uh, presentations this morning and my my overwhelming uh, 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 response is one of sympathy to the people who work within the uh, Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, one of them uh, used the phrase, they have uh, uh, limited, uh, limited decision space. And I think that was a rather important uh, admission to make that when you're working for the organization that's committed itself to deliver water a water supply that they don't have, it's very difficult to to uh, to be very bold in terms of the suggestions that you're you're making. We need to be bold. We can't just sit back and conduct studies. They look more like autopsies than prescriptions <laughs> to me. You know, we're still trying to figure out where they went instead of trying to figure out how we can get them back. And that's that's the key point that I wanted to make. And I want to thank you for including me in this. And I look forward to, and my organization as well, to uh, providing you with additional information as we go forward and hopefully come to grips with some very serious, serious problems. All right, we're more than halfway through. Um, so Heidi Williams, Valley Water. And I wanted to highlight that at Valley Water, we're charged by the California legislator through the Santa Clara Valley Water District Act 
to enhance, protect, and restore streams, riparian corridors, and natural resources. So in our local system, we have steelhead and fall run Chinook salmon and some other vulnerable species. And uh, so we're tackling on a smaller scale, some similar challenges to what we've been hearing today. So we know how hard it is to balance all these beneficial uses and also how important it is to get it right. And so, you know, we're, we're attached to the Bay of the Bay Delta, we're at the South Bay and um, we do seek out a lot of diverse sources of water, uh, local supplies, a water recycling program that we're trying to double our source of supply from water recycling and conservation. But even with these things, we still find that imported water remains necessary for uh, various reasons, but we have different local constraints. And about 40% of our water currently does come from the Delta, and that percent is higher in drier years. Uh, so for example, our local water supply is strained right now because of some seismic safety restrictions on several of our local dams. And that includes our largest source of local water uh, the Anderson Reservoir, and that's been drained since 2020, and it's probably not going to come back online till about 2032. Um, and then we have other dams to retrofit as well after that. Um, so, but both intrinsically and to serve the beneficial uses of California water, uh, we do recognize that the health of the Delta is very paramount. We're engaged in a lot of these collaborative forums we've been hearing about, so the collab Collaborative Science and Adaptive Management Program, CSAMP, California Adaptive Management Team, CAMP, and then the State Water Contractors and the Central Valley Project Contractors Science Programs that are trying to focus on the management relevant science. And now I'll mention three recommendations to this committee uh, to accomplish, and then I'll have like a lightning round of framing questions at the end. <laughs> so uh, one is to help us move forward with dynamic triggers. I think through a lot of interagency collaboration and coordination, we are slowly moving away from some of the static triggers and going towards more dynamic triggers. Things that come to mind for me are the work on the juvenile production estimate and genetic run ID, and those are really good steps forward. And we need to get better at continuing towards that dynamic and linking our uh, actions with population level responses. The fish presence in the system can vary a lot from year to year. And in a really good fish year, it's possible to trigger those OMAR restrictions uh, at times simply because there's more fish. And then sometimes it takes a while to know uh, that did were these triggers brought about because uh, of fish that are really tied to the uh, ones that we're trying to protect through that action. There's possibilities like they, the fish might be from other genetic runs or they might be unmarked hatchery fish. And there's this lag time that we're experiencing to figure that out. And let's see. Uh, there's also the possibility that the set thresholds can be such a small amount of the cohort in that year. And so in those cases, sometimes the OMAR triggers might not be meaningful to the species. And so to all of you, please help to identify places in the regulations where we can continue to move in a dynamic and adaptive direction and where we can be managing based on the fluctuating conditions and the population levels that we're experiencing. And then to also to think about under what conditions could off ramps on OMR management work while still, of course, being protective. And then number two, I think you've been hearing about this a lot today, but using existing collaborative project products to help, as you've seen, it's a highly studied eco ecosystem. It has layers and layers of committees and coordination groups that exist. And, you know, all of in all of these, we're trying to earnestly to tackle these big questions. And so I just wanted to add my plus one to uh, take a look at all those resources, especially products from places like CSAMP Camp, Delta Independent Science Board, IEP, 
And some of you are very intimately familiar with these groups. And uh, you might add to that list, it could be useful to look at the Camped Salmon Scoping Team report, the SST report, as well as the ongoing Reorienting to Recovery project. And then number three, you're already doing this, but keep engaging with the public water agencies to understand our constraints. Uh, there's so much uncertainty uh, in the effectiveness of the actions and just taking a look at what is truly working and uh, you know, re requirements because of this uncertainty can sometimes be conservative in the interest of protecting the fish and covering bases. And the trade-off of course, is that then that can come at a very high water cost. And the more we can really hone in on reducing the uncertainty, the more targeted we can be at benefiting species. And then the, the less blanket higher cost water actions will likely need as a result, because we can start to pinpoint more and public water agencies, we can help with the details on how the amount and the timing of water uh, mm -hmm. deliveries as a result of OMR, Fall X2, Shasta releases, how they impact us. Uh, for example, bringing it back to Valley Water, our limited local supply that I mentioned, it means that dry years can sometimes hit very hard. And to supplement our supplies during these dry years, we use water transfers and out of county storage and during the last drought, a limitation we had is there's a lot of uncertainty on the timing of receiving these waters from transfers and out of county storage supplies. And uh, that uncertainty of delivery, that can start to lead to treated water storages. For us, 96% of our water in treatment plants comes from Delta supplies. And so when you start to have a risk of treated water shortages, it can lead to some of our retailers turning to groundwater pumping. And because of the size of our groundwater basin compared to the demand of our area, our groundwater levels are at risk of dropping quite rapidly in a single year and experiencing subsidence, which of course can have all kinds of other environmental consequences. So that's just one example to say that you should really keep in mind the importance of water supply reliability in the decisions as you're making your recommendations. And now's that lightning round I mentioned. These are just some framing questions that I came up with um, that a lot of others have touched on already, but um, I encourage you to think about what scientific areas are overstudied where we do have more to learn, but we could take more concrete actions in decision-making now. And then what scientific areas on the other side of things are understudied and need more attention? Uh, are there high cost tools we're currently using that don't yield enough benefits? And again, on the other side, are there underutilized tools that we could be implementing more? How can we integrate actions with population level effects? And finally, how do we be how do we best be proactive in addressing new challenges? How do we keep up with new climate realities? And uh, how do we understand what it means to have more culture delta smelt in our ecosystem? Those sort of uh, things that we need to be on the ball and proactive about. And that's it for me. Valley Water is uh, very happy to help contribute whatever you need. And we're available to, you know, have additional conversations on any of the topics that I briefly mentioned. Thanks. Hello, my name is Jeff. I'm the assistant general manager at Lessons Water District, and I'm reminded of a Danish idiom uh, being the raisin at the end of the, the sausage. It's it's supposed to be a good thing, uh, <laughs> sort of like waiting, waiting for the best for the last. But, and the uh, in the interest of keeping it succinct, I'm going to go a little bit off script here, and I can I can circle back and give more detail later, and I can provide some notes once they've gone through legal review. Um, <laughs> so I'll start with a little bit of framing about uh, what we hope to get out of this process. I'll I'll give you. Um, uh, some an answer to the last question, and then I'll go into what I've got is four things that we would be very interested in that we find great hope for for this committee, and three that we're not as enthusiastic about if they occur. Um, so with that, um, you know, I, so my uh, you may know me uh, from my 
recent staff at the Bureau of Reclamation, I was deputy regional director, and I don't speak for the Bureau of Reclamation in this moment, but uh, when I left a month ago, there was great excitement and enthusiasm for this panel and hope for this panel. And I can represent for Westlands Water District that that hope exists at Westlands as well. And um, some of the backdrop, I mean, we're here talking about science, we're talking about all the water supply and the issues and the woes, but what you're not seeing is all the things that we have to do if this doesn't work. If there's no slack in the water supply in the Delta for South of Delta delivery, if there's not some way to balance things differently, there are a lot of pursuits to balance that water supply and, and make ends meet for the communities, the cities, ecosystems throughout California that require additional investments, additional reservoirs, additional tunnels, and each of those costs at least a billion dollars. So that's what we're looking for here is science to help us understand really what, what is truly needed for the ecosystems, because I don't think there's any desire to see the ecosystem. I know there's no desire that I've heard to see ecosystems fail, that actually we'd relish the opportunity to say we're doing our part. Uh, but there's the suspicion or the fear or the concern that maybe more could be done with less. And so we're hopeful that this, this panel can help us find that path. Um, so it, um, for the last question, Westlands has for decades made tremendous investments in, in the name of advancing science and is very continues to be very supportive of those aims and goals. So to the extent that our staff time our consulting expertise, uh, our, um, our review or participation in anything can be of assistance to this panel. Just let us know, we'd be happy to provide that. Um, and with that, uh, the four things that we're interested in. Number one, a reliable method, call it a tool or call it whatever you want to, but uh, a reliable method to explain linkages between flow conditions and then stressors and then anticipated species outcomes. We would love to eventually hear the relationship between actions that are being proposed and the benefit of curing one issue on a, a given life stage on recurring adults and to be able to cross compare things uh, very stoically and, and easily. Uh, number two, reliable method to evaluate the effectiveness of actions taken for the species, particularly those with the highest cost of water supply. I don't have to dwell on this, uh, that were identified earlier in uh, Dr. Mooney's presentation. Number three, an assessment of critical path needs that are outside of the CVP and SWP actions. And uh, by critical path, I mean critical path for species recovery, survival. Um, uh, there are a lot of ongoing parallel efforts among the regulated community. You've heard a couple of them referenced here today uh, by all the speakers before me, the voluntary agreements and others. Uh, where uh, the, regu the regulated community, so to speak, the water users who are paying up with their water supply currently are looking for other things that could be done that could be more effective with less water supply. And to the extent that this panel can reveal things that need to be done that are not just CVP or SWP facilities or operations uh, specific, that would be of great interest to us because we're not just waiting for the regulations to come and to sit idly and to fight the regulations. We're actively out there trying to find solutions that are even perhaps outside of what we're, we're doing day to day. Uh, we're all in it for species survival. And I think that should be an echo of something you've heard uh, several times already. And number four, and this one's a, a sticky wicket, but um, advancing a shared vision for science applied to fisheries. And I don't know that that's something I can charge you with specifically. It's something that we all have to be in on. But the regulations are not necessarily in step with the science that we have. And it would be helpful to have uh, this process help to align that process. Uh, we'd like to have more participation with regulatory agencies that are affecting water supplies. ESA consultation has historically been legalized, divisive, and, and hidden in its uh, black box from inspection and 
uh, that opacity is not helpful and it's incongruent with the amount of transparency that's demanded of water users. Um, we've made great strides in reporting what we're doing, uh, how it's affecting the Delta is the best of our ability. We would like a reciprocal amount of transparency on what, what happens in an ESA consultation. So what are we, what can I say we're less interested in? Um, suggestions on water management investments. Um, ideas on groundwater banks, desal, uh, ground, uh, irrigation efficiency and conservation, low flush toilets, all of that can be figured out once we know what the water supply is and that we know that the water supply being used for fisheries being withheld from our contracts. We understand the contracts were written at a time where it wasn't factored in, but if the environment needs a certain amount of what would have been our contract supply and we have faith that that's going to be helpful and is working, then we'll figure out the rest. Suggest, and you've heard this, this one a lot today, suggestions that ignore our resource constraints. We don't have a lot of uh, time for non-strategic study or exploratory analysis without a foreseeable target. We need to focus on key constraints for the species and key knowledge gaps, and we're running out of time for the species. We've run out, I mean, we've run out of time for the Delta smell arguably already. Um, and as a parable to avoid when something ineffective is proposed in the past, you know, the first thing is the ag and M&I water users uh, suffer water supply hits. Next, we all burn up all of our energy on court processes. And the court, um, the thing that's not working, gets turned into a political football where preserving it is somehow a win despite its ineffectiveness for species who are, if you're not keeping score at home, not winning. And the last thing is a lack of context. This is sort of a double negative, but I'm gonna say it anyway, it's something we don't want. Uh, a lack of context for the effects on CVP and SWP operations. Um, know that while the biological opinions by statute are required to look at just the effects of CVP and SWP actions on the species and just talk about mitigating those effects specifically, it is just not helpful to only talk about that without looking at the entirety of the species stressors and the effects and what needs to be cured. There's, the CVP and SWP are large water supply projects. They've had a tremendous effect on the ecosystem, aquatic ecosystems of the state, but they're not the only thing. And I would hesitate, but I, I, well, I don't have any quantification for this, but I would imagine that there are things like land use changes and levies and agricultural practices and other things that may have a larger effect on the species that we just want the context for. And so it would be very helpful to know, you know, as a water user community, you certainly were, we're interested to know what our effects are. So we can say that, you know, here, here's our effect and we're gonna mitigate for our effect, but just know the water users are also out there collectively working to find solutions to meet the needs, the ambitious goals of restoration for these species, separate from just what is my fair share and uh, having that context is of dire importance. So uh, with that, I conclude. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Chandra. Thank you. Um, almost there. <laughs> Probably hearing very, um, a lot of recurrent themes here. Um, so I'll try to keep it short here. Um, again, um, my name is Chandra Shumakuri. I'm with State Water Contractors, and um, our, we have a clear interest in making sure that the um, Delta ecosystem is functioning and the species are recovering so that we have the resilience for state water project deliveries. Um, so let me jump into the what we, what we would expect from this committee. Uh, first of all, thank you. This is a, an insurmountable job uh, to untangle this thing. So thank you for volunteering. Um, so I would start off by saying to the best of your ability on all these requests, um, please provide recommendations that are actually implementable. Um, just, a, <laughs> just a small request. <laughs> See, uh, the biological opinions and incidental permit that State Water Project has, um, or the 
my career, I've been noticing that they've been continuously improving based on the best available science. Uh, the staff at the Department of Water Resources, um, Bureau of Reclamation and the fishery agencies, both state and federal, um, they have done a tremendous job in actually recognizing, you know, incorporating best available science as they improve the, uh, as these different iterations of this. Um, there may be already efforts uh, underway as it relates to what I'm going to specifically ask you to weigh in on. So this is nothing against the work that's already underway. So uh, with that said, uh, just a, you have heard from others about the biological opinions and the incidental take permits and what they are in support of the, and there are, if you simplify them, there are two things. One is they, they have um, constraints on water operations to minimize the effects on the species. And then there is a second component, which is whatever remaining effect you mitigate it without um, commensurately with the other actions. So um, the charge you have is mostly on the, uh, on the, like the OMR, for example, as the minimization measure, fall X2, for example, or summer fall act reduction, that's probably, you can consider that as a mitigation measure. Um, so uh, I, one of the things um, often, uh, especially the constraints, uh, they're often focused on individuals, uh, individual species, rather than trying to understand uh, whether that constraint has any meaningful population level effect. You have heard that a couple of times already. Um, I, I'll go into a uh, couple of examples. Uh, one is, for example, there is a different literature that suggests that the current monitoring programs don't actually fully um, capture the range of the long term smelt in the Bay Delta. Um, yet the export constraints for the long term smelt protection are often prescribed based on only taking into account the incomplete monitoring data. And as a result, it is unclear whether such, such OMR restrictions actually have any meaningful population level um, are providing meaningful population level protections. Um, similarly, it is unclear if the mitigation that is being assigned to the projects is commensurate to their level of effect, and we don't know the actual population. Um, so uh, I'd like you to weigh in on these, uh, you know, how do we formulate these constraints, take into account the full population or actions that would have meaningful uh, effect on the overall population. And then similarly for some, some honor species, you will hear this tomorrow morning on the OMR presentation. Um, most of the old and middle river restrictions are based on how many fish we catch at the uh, export facilities in the South Delta. Again, I think I covered it pretty well. Those are, and we have thresholds listed in those permits um, that are static. And there is obviously a movement in the right direction to make them more rec um, uh, recognize, uh, making them recognize the population on a given year. I think we need to continue to move there in that direction so that, again, taking um, an export cut um, based on how many fish we salvaged, which doesn't reflect how much the population actually is for that year is not um, very helpful. I think Lenny covered this morning, we currently are dealing with the steel head issue where we, I think, exceeded the threshold of salvage allowed. Um, they're doing everything they can to minimize that, but we don't even know what percent of steelhead they are, that we are in training um, because there is no estimate out there on the actual population size of the state. Um, the second topic I'd like you to weigh in on is the consideration of the scientific uncertainty in training these operational constraints. Based on how the uncertainty is accounted for, there can be huge trade-offs um, with especially the water supply for other species, for like the cold water species upstream, or for the water supply for the people and farms, of course. Um, several constraints that are in the uh, permit or current permits are based on statistical regressions with significant uncertainty without a clear understanding of mechanisms. So for example, um, I think this came up at the last meeting, Matt covered this a little bit, the spring, out, spring delta outflow requirement for long, long thin smelt. Um, 
it is based on a, a statistically significant regression between outflow and long principal dependence. However, it is unclear what is the process or mechanism. Is it hydrological? Is it physical? Is it biological? No one knows. Um, significant, uh, it has a significant water cost. Uh, and the question is, how certain are we that maintaining the delta outflow ensures the process or the function that is affecting the abundance? Um, similarly, how certain are we that, um, for example, releasing stored water from the upstream reservoirs for Pollux to requirement for delta smelt is actually providing any benefit? So these uncertainties, um, I think, require us to consider meaningful off ramps for these actions. You can wait on those off ramps. What sort of off ramps could be considered as part of these permit restrictions or mitigation requirements? That would be helpful. Um, last uh, item would be um, you have uh, you heard a lot from, uh, from the area, although it was very brief. <laughs> It's uh, this morning about the modeling and the, the usually the FX analysis framework that we use in the system. Um, one of the things is that we have developed a ton of tools on the isolating the effects of the projects or specifically um, understanding the effects of the projects, but we have very little understanding of what the other uh, factors, um, how, they, how, how do we design the effects of those factors on those species? For example, we can do everything we can uh, with, with the project scan, but are we sure that that, uh, that, that that's sufficient? When especially when we know there are water temperatures rising in the Delta, um, even in the wettest year, for example, in 2019, one of the hypotheses of Delta smell suffering is because of the water temperatures, and that is a fact. And so, if you're if you're um, focused exclusively on the Export constraints. Um, I don't. I don't know that we will get to the point where we need to. I mean, we, we are targeting the right actions. Um, so we need to. I would like you to weigh in on that. How do we discern those other factors, especially when they are rapidly changing, like water temperatures or changes in the hydrology or just food availability? I know it is a delicate balance to operate the water projects to go for Californians while protecting the species to the best of our ability. Finding this balance is even more difficult when other environmental conditions that water projects can control are changing simultaneously and rapidly. So I know we are doing our best, the projects, uh, the boat projects are doing their best, um, but we are asking how to improve it. So. I appreciate again your time and uh, thoughtfulness on this. Thank you. Sounds like me have lost in thought. Well, I think I really am lost in my in line, which means I'm keeping you all from the bar, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> relatively short. Um, I want to sort of come at this from a slightly different direction. We've been talking an awful lot about trees and groves of trees, but I just want to come back and leave you with some thoughts about the forest of the whole problem that we face here. Um, and I'm going to start with the fact that the Delta is supposed to be managed to meet co-equal goals, which I'm not sure is very good English, but that's the phrase they used, as identified in the Delta Reform Act of 2009. Um, the Act directed the resource agencies to achieve the two co-equal goals of providing a more reliable water supply for California and protecting, restoring, and enhancing the Delta ecosystem. An easy task. Um, and the, the latter has been interpreted as enhancing the Delta ecosystem to focus on, on conserving and recovering fish species listed under federal California law. So I, I don't think there's been much concern in this about restoring the whole ecosystem. It's been very focused, because you can define that in all sorts of different ways. There's been very focused on um, fish that have some sort of law, some law protection. But I think that, you know, if you look at that requirement, you have to come to the conclusion 
the Delta, the management of the Delta, or those managing the Delta, have achieved neither of those two goals. So we haven't got a moral supply, and we're not doing very well on, on these things. And I'm not just blaming the management of the Delta, because I think the political decisions that have been mentioned earlier have a lot to do with that. But it is true. I mean, if you start thinking about this, and those two goals aren't bad for us all to remember, even if we're sort of more biased towards fish than people. Because frankly, if LA is short of water, right? The Delta, who cares, right? That's where the population is, that's where the political power is, and we have to recognize that going in. We do have a growing population in California, some of the other sources of water that we have, for instance, from the Colorado, are dropping. So this is, you, we need to look at this sort of in a high level way. And if you look back again, the, the, the populations of listed fish and the Delta are undoubtedly declining precipitously, right? We've, lost, we've apparently lost the Delta smell to when it admits to it. Um, and everything is, and we've spent billions of dollars trying to preserve them um, through the federal agencies and everything. Billions of dollars, and we've had no success on that. <clears throat> and California's water supply has been severely curtailed at, again, staggering costs to agriculture and urban, which is the urban population, because so much of the water that was going to them has been diverted for these fish, for the listed fish or the fish protected by law. And at the same time, habitat restoration efforts, control efforts targeting invasive species, best practices for salmon, hatcheries and harvest management, plus other potential conservation actions that would be expected to help imperiled fish have been largely ignored because they're viewed to be politically unpalatable, hard to fund, and too challenging to execute. And just as a sort of follow-up thought process on that, it's much easier, it's been much easier for the regulators to take water from one group of people that's usually been urban in agriculture and give it to the environment because it doesn't cost them anything. If they're going to restore the e part of the ecosystem, they've got to come up with dollars. That's a to totally different process. So this has been a very sort of strange political deal. And I think sort of most striking in this for me is not the failure, but the failure to acknowledge that we are failing, right? In my experience, if you don't admit failure, you don't really come back and concentrate on changing what you're doing. You keep doing what you're doing. You've been successful. To admit failure means you have to change. And we are not admitting that we are failing. In fact, I'm probably the first person to say the word failure here, but I was in business and I've had a lot of failures. So I know what it's like. But they're usually a learning opportunity. They're usually sometimes unpleasant, sometimes more pleasant, but a learning opportunity. And I think we need to think the same way. Um, so the sort of basic thing about management that one needs, right, is sort of a clear management structure, right? There's some accountability, And this is the basic element. You know, if you're thinking even about your departments or something else, right, your organizations, you need some structure and you need some accountability and you probably need transparency, right? The thicket of institutional entities and their different prerogatives, right? U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does not have the same instructions as California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Right? They have slightly different instructions, which enables them to keep slightly different exhaustions and staffs slightly different organizations. And so even under the best of conditions, having a decent organization and decent structure is very tough. And I would just like to show you one picture. 
which is, I think, illustrates the difference that we have in this. And this is one of my favorite pictures ever. It comes from a state publication. I didn't make it up. It would be too difficult for me to do it. Wait for it. Now, some of you have seen this, right? But you can take this back to your universities, take it to your business or any organizational thing, and ask how you can control and staff and make something work where you have an organization chart that looks like this, right? And when you think about all the groups in this organization, they're all having regular meetings. They're having meetings to coordinate with other groups, right? In fact, sort of the hot air created by this is probably warming the Delta water. <laughs> I mean, you know, so what I'm really saying to you is, is that I think that one of the things that I, you should be thinking about as you go through this process is how do we get some sort of semblance of order to this, right? Um, and and some, there's every one of these organizations has their own silo. None of these organizations want to leave, lose any of their responsibility or people, right? None of them. And yet we're asking you to provide advice that can be properly and clearly executed when we're stuck with an organization like this. In fact, I was thinking of posting this on X or something and offering a small prize if anyone could do better. <laughs> so let me, um, so I mean, you know, it's a question, who's accountable, who's in charge? I don't know. I know there are a lot of people who are, and a lot of people who have things. I mean, so what is the solution to this? I mean, part of it is, do we have some very much sort of focused processes that they all go through? Do we try and get some quality control so that many of these agencies are forced to do good work, disciplined work? With the right thing. I'm not really sure, but I think that this is part of what you, this is background anyway to all the things that you're going to be thinking about. And I'm just going to add one other thing tonight that I think is, is important is that you know, I'm a decision maker, or I was a decision maker for all my life. And I never, I don't think I ever make a decision without thinking about the dollars, right? If I'm gonna buy a cup of coffee, whether I go to Starbucks or I take it from home, I'm thinking how much more Starbucks is gonna cost me. And maybe you're all different from that, but that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And yet on all these lots and lots of these discussions, there's no dollars, there's no cost benefit analysis. There's no analysis of what the action is costing. And I think that's extraordinary. And I don't see how that can go on. And so I think that that is something that really needs to be inserted into decision-making with the Delta. I'm not saying the dollars are the only thing, right? There's all sorts of other things that goes into it, but we gotta have some idea of the dollars. You know, when you take an action where 600,000 acre feet goes out to the sea and the value of that water, where, where there's very little monitoring, if any, the hypothesis behind it is questionable. This is the X2 thing, right? And it costs you nearly half a billion dollars in one year. I think you should have thought of the dollars before you took the action. So those are my somewhat gloomy thoughts to leave you with. <laughs> so thank you. We, we will, I will put my thoughts on paper and give you references so you can see publications that our group has put out and blogs they put out and anyone would be pleased to help you and their names and bios will be on the website from that. So thank you all very much for your patience. Thank you, William. And thanks for that. It's 
words of wisdom, and I certainly concur. We learn from our mistakes, and I've also had an excellent education. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what we'll do is we have reached five o'clock, and I know there'll be a lot of questions. So, what I'm going to suggest is we stop the formal part of the meeting now, and it will give the committee members an opportunity, perhaps, to catch the panelists on the on the way out. Uh, but I would like to thank all of you for coming and sharing your thoughts about how this effort of the National Academies can be most effective. And we really appreciate that. And we'll certainly appreciate any comments uh, for those of you who didn't leave us with the PowerPoint. So if we could give all of the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. So, so meeting adjourned. We'll start tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with uh, Old Middle River Management. Yeah. Are we meeting later? Yeah.